preface to saunterings in and about london this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by david wales saunterings in and about london by max slesinger translated by otto winkstern prefaces generally speaking are pleadings in which authors anticipating public censure and well knowing how richly they deserve it adduce sundry reasons why their books are not shorter or longer and altogether different from the volumes which then and there they bring into the market i need not make any such excuses for i did not write for an english public nor did i ever pretend to popularity in england the saunterings were intended for the profit and amusement of my german countrymen and i must say i was not a little pleased and surprised with the very flattering reception which my book experienced at the hands of the english critics their favourable opinion which they so emphatically and i am selfish enough to go the whole length of the word so ably expressed has probably caused the production of the book in an english dress the critics therefore must bear the responsibility if the general public should happen to condemn these saunterings as weary stale flat and unprofitable and shelve them accordingly max slesinger london october eighteen fifty three end of preface part one chapter one of saunterings in and about london by max schlesinger this librivox recording is in the public domain part one chapter one in which the reader is introduced to some of the author's friends the englishman's castle are you aware honourable and honoured sir john said dr keith as he moved his chair nearer to the fire are you aware that i am strongly tempted to hate this country of yours indeed replied sir john with a slight elongation of his good-humoured face really sir you are quick of feeling you have been exactly two hours in london wait compare and judge there are thousands of your countrymen in london and none of them ever think of going back to germany and for good reasons too muttered the doctor may i ask said sir john after a short pause what can have shocked you in england within two hours after your arrival look at this cigar sir it won't burn has a bad smell drops its ashes and costs four times as much as a decent cigar in my own country can you in the face of this villainous cigar muster the courage to talk to me of your government and your constitution this cigar sir proves that your boasted civilization is sheer barbarity that your cobden is a humbug and your free trade a monstrous sham does it indeed prove all that very well sir german replied sir john with a futile attempt to imitate the martial and inquisitorial bearing of an austrian gendarme come show me your passport did any one here ask for it did they send you to the guildhall for a carte de sureté have the police expelled you from london it's either one thing or the other it's either sterling liberty and cabbage-leaf cigars or real havanas and all the miseries of your police take your choice sir but i cannot take my choice sir cried dr keith they have hunted me as you would hunt a fox across all their fences of boundary lines to the shores of the ocean and into the very maw of that green-eyed monster sea-sickness which cast me forth vomiting on this barbarous island where men smoke lettuce and call it tobacco saying which the doctor flung his cigar into the grate and sung was ist des deutschen vaterland but the reader will most naturally ask who is this comical doctor and who is sir john to which i make reply they are two amiable and honest men who met on the continent years ago and who after a long separation met again in the heart of london in guildford street russell square dr keith is an austrian and a journalist there is good in all but none are all good dr keith makes no exception to the common rule 
he was so far prejudiced as to write a batch of very neat feuilletons in which he asserted that the croats did not altogether conduct themselves with grace at the sacking of vienna and that the bohemian czechs are not the original race which gave birth to all the nations of the earth he denied also that german literature and science have ever been fostered by the servians he alleged that goethe had done more for the advancement of science than the twenty first battalion of the royal and imperial grenadiers and he was abandoned enough to avow his opinion that a bad government is worse than a good one on account of these very objectionable prejudices the doctor was summoned forthwith to depart from leipzig in saxony where he lived and proceed to vienna there to vindicate his doctrines or submit to a paternal chastisement but the doctor objected to the fate of john huss perhaps his mind corrupted with german literature was unable to appreciate the charms of a military career in the ranks of the austrian army dr keif left leipzig with all possible secrecy nor could he be induced to return even by the taunts of the official vienna zeitung which justly accused him of cowardice since he preferred an ignominious flight to a contest with only six hundred thousand soldiers twelve fortresses half a million of police officers and the peinliche halsgerichtsordnung of the late empress maria theresa whether dr keif lacks courage or not and all other traits of his character will be sufficiently shown in the course of the wanderings through london which we propose to make in his company dr keif and the author live in the house of sir john a full-blown specimen of the old english gentleman and one worthy to be studied and chronicled as a prototype of his countrymen this house of ours is the centre of our rambles the point from which we start and to which we return with the experiences we gathered in our excursions and since an english fireside and an english home are utter strangers to the most ideal dreams of the german mind we propose commencing our wanderings through london with a voyage of discovery through all the rooms and garrets of our own house at the first step a german makes in one of the london streets he must understand that life in england is very different from life in germany not only are the walls of the houses black and smoky but the houses do not stand on a level with the pavement a london street is in a manner like a german high road which is skirted on either side with a deep ditch in the streets of london the houses on either side rise out of deep side areas these dry ditches are generally of the depth of from six to ten feet and that part of the house which with us would form the lower story is here from ten to twelve feet underground this moat is uncovered but it is railed in and the communication between the house door and the street is effected by a bridge neatly formed of masonry every english house has its fence its iron stockade and its doorway bridge to observe the additional fortifications which every englishman invents for the greater security of his house is quite amusing it is exactly as if louis napoleon was expected to effect a landing daily between luncheon and dinner while every individual englishman is prepared to defend his household gods to the last drop of porter you may see iron railings massive and high like unto the columns which crushed the philistines in their fall each bar has its spearhead and each spearhead is conscientiously kept in good and sharp condition the little bridge which leads to the house door is frequently shut up a little door with sharp spikes protruding from it is prepared to hook the hand of a bold invader and it is said that magazines of powder are placed under the bridge for the purpose of blowing up a too pertinacious assailant this latter rumour i give for what it is worth it is the assertion of a frenchman whom the cleanliness of london drove to despair and who in the malice of his heart got satirical a mature consideration of the london houses shows that the strength of the fortification is in exact proportion to the elegance and value of the house and its contents the poor are satisfied with a wooden stockade the rich are safe behind their iron chevaux de frise 
and in front of palaces clubhouses and other public buildings the railings are so high and strong as to engender the belief that the thieves of england go about their business of housebreaking with scaling ladders pickaxes guns and other formidable implements of destruction every englishman is a bit of a vauban not only does he barricade his house against two-legged animals of his own species but his mania for fortification extends to precautions against wretched dogs and cats to prevent these small cattle from making their way through the railings the englishman fills the interstices with patent wire network and the very roofs are frequently divided by means of similar contrivances vainly will cats slaves of the tender passion make prodigious efforts to squeeze themselves through those cruel cruel walls and vainly do they in accents touching but not harmonious pour their grief into the silent ear of night vainly i say for an englishman has little sympathy with love in a garret and as for love on the roof he scorns it utterly we now approach the street door and put the knocker in motion do not fancy that this is an easy process it is by far easier to learn the language of englishmen than to learn the language of the knocker and many strangers protest that a knocker is the most difficult of all musical instruments it requires a good ear and a skilful hand to make yourself understood and to escape remarks and ridicule every class of society announces itself at the gate of the fortress by means of the rhythm of the knocker the postman gives two loud raps in quick succession and for the visitor a gentle but peremptory tremulo is de rigueur the master of the house gives a tremulo crescendo and the servant who announces his master turns the knocker into a battering ram and plies it with such good will that the house shakes to its foundations tradesmen on the other hand butchers milkmen bakers and greengrocers are not allowed to touch the knockers they ring a bell which communicates with the kitchen all this is very easy in theory but very difficult in practice bold and otherwise inexperienced strangers believe that they assert their dignity if they move the knocker with conscious energy vain delusion they are mistaken for footmen modest people on the contrary are treated as mendicants the middle course in this as in other respects is most difficult two different motives are assigned for this custom those who dislike england on principle and according to whom the very fogs are an aristocratic abuse assert that the various ways of plying the knocker are most intimately connected with the prejudices of caste others again say that the arrangement is conducive to comfort since the inmates of the house know at once what sort of a visitor is desiring admittance as for me i believe that a great deal may be said on either side and i acknowledge the existence of the two motives but i ought to add that in new and elegant mansions the mediaeval knocker yields its place to the modern bell the same fate is perhaps reserved for the whole of the remainder of english old fogyism there are spots of decay in these much vaunted islands and now and then you hear the worm plainly as it gnaws its way i wish you the best of appetites honest weevil we cross the threshold of the house sacred silence surrounds us the silence of peace of domestic comfort doubly agreeable after a few hours walk with the giddy turmoil of street life and with peace there is cleanliness that passive virtue the first the stranger learns to love in the english people because it is the first which strikes his eye that the english are capital agriculturalists practical merchants gallant soldiers and honest friends is not written in their faces any more than the outward aspect of the germans betrays their straightforwardness fitful melancholy and poetic susceptibility but cleanliness as an english national virtue strikes in modest obtrusiveness the vision even of the most unobservant stranger the small space between the street door and the stairs 
hardly sufficient in length and breadth to deserve the pompous name of a hall is usually furnished with a couple of mahogany chairs or in wealthier houses with flower-pots statuettes and now and then a sixth or seventh-rate picture the floor is covered with oilcloth and this again is covered with a breadth of carpet a single glance tells us that after passing the threshold we have at once entered the temple of domestic life here are no moist ill-paved floors where horses and carts dispute with the passenger the right of way where you stumble about in some dark corner in search of still darker stairs where from the porter's lodge half a dozen curious eyes watch your unguided movements while your nostrils are invaded with the smell of onions as is the case in paris and also in prague and vienna nothing of the kind the english houses are like chimneys turned inside out on the outside all is soot and dirt in the inside everything is clean and bright from the hall we make our way to the parlour the refectory of the house the parlour is the common sitting-room of the family the centre point of the domestic state it is here that many eat their dinners and some say their prayers and in this room does the lady of the house arrange her household affairs and issue her commands in winter the parlour fire burns from early morn till late at night and it is into the parlour that the visitor is shown unless he happens to call on a reception day when the drawing-rooms are thrown open to the friends of the family large folding doors which occupy nearly the whole breadth of the back wall separate the front from the back parlour and when opened the two form one large room the number and the circumstances of the family devote this back parlour either to the purposes of a library for the master the son or the daughters of the house or convert it into a boudoir office or breakfast-room frequently it serves no purpose in particular and all in turn these two rooms occupy the whole depth of the house all the other apartments are above so that there are from two to four rooms in each story the chief difference in the domestic apartments in england and germany consists in this division in germany the members of a family occupy a number of apartments on the same floor or flat in england they live in a cumulative succession of rooms in germany the dwelling-houses are divided horizontally here the division is vertical hence it happens that houses with four rooms communicating with one another are very rare in london with the exception only of the houses in the very aristocratic quarters hence also each story has its peculiar destination in the family geographical dictionary in the first floor are the reception rooms in the second the bedrooms with their large four-posters and marble-topped washstands in the third story are the nurseries and servants rooms and in the fourth if a fourth there be you find a couple of low garrets for the occasional accommodation of some bachelor friend of the family the doors and windows of these garrets are not exactly air-tight the wind comes rumbling down the chimney the stairs are narrow and steep and the garrets are occasionally invaded by inquisitive cats and a vagrant rat but what of that a bachelor in england is worse off than a family cat according to english ideas the worst room in the house is too good for a bachelor they say oh he'll do very well what does a bachelor care for a three-legged chair a broken window a rickety table and a couple or so of sportive currents it is exactly as if a man took a special delight in rheumatism toothache hard beds smoking chimneys and the society of rats until he has entered the holy state of matrimony the promise of some tender being to love honour and obey would seem to change a bachelor's nature and make him susceptible of the amenities of domestic comfort the custom is not flattering to the fairer half of humanity it is exactly as if the comforts of one sleeping-room were to atone for the sorrows of matrimony and as if a bachelor from the mere fact of being unmarried were so happy and contented a being that no amount of earthly discomfort could ruffle the blissful tranquillity of his mind it was truly comical to see dr keif when the lady of the house first introduced him to his own room 
the politics and the police of germany had given the poor fellow so much trouble that he had never once thought of taking unto himself a wife as a natural consequence of this lamentable state of affairs his quarters were assigned him in the loftiest garret of the house dismal forebodings which he tried to smile away seized on his philosophical mind as he mounted stair after stairs each set steeper and narrower than the last at length on a mere excuse for a landing there is a narrow door and behind that door a mere corner of a garret the doctor had much experience in the topography of the garrets of german college towns but the english garret in guildford street russell square put all his experience to shame i trust you'll be comfortable here calls the lady after him with a malicious smile for to enter the bachelor's room would be a gross violation of the rules and regulations of british decency and before he can make up his mind to reply she has vanished down the steep stairs and the doctor with his hands meekly folded stands in the centre of his own room oh bulwer dickens and thackeray such are his thoughts and thou o oh punch who describest the garrets of the british bachelor here where i cease to understand the much vaunted english comfort here do i begin to understand your writings if i did not happen to be in london i should certainly like to be in spandau my own germany with thy romantic fortresses and dungeon keeps how cruelly hast thou been calumniated there is a knock at the door it is sir john who has come up for the express purpose of witnessing the doctor's admiration of his room he knows that the room will be admired for to his patriotic view there is beauty in all and everything that is english his patriotism revels in old established abuses and stands triumphant amidst every species of nuisance the question how do you like your room is uttered exactly with the degree of conscious pride which animated the king of prussia when looking down from the keep of stolzenfels castle he asked queen victoria how do you like the rhine and equally eager though perhaps not quite so sincere was the doctor's reply oh very much i am quite enchanted with it it is impossible to lose anything in this room and the losing things and groping about to find them was the plague of my life at home in the large german rooms a most excellent arrangement this everything is handy and within reach bookcase washstand and wardrobe i need not even get up to get what i want and as for this table and these chairs i presume that the occasional overturning of an inkstand will but serve to heighten the quaint appearance of this venerable furniture of course said sir john certainly this is liberty hall sir but mind you take care of the lamp and pray do not sit in the draught between the window and the door he does not exactly explain how it is possible to sit anywhere except in the draught for the limited space of the garret is entirely taken up with draughts perhaps it is a sore subject for with an uneasy shrug of the shoulders the worthy sir john adds but never mind comfortable isn't it and what do you say to the view ah eh? beautiful right away over all the roofs to hampstead he might as well have said to the peak of Tenerife, for the view is obstructed with countless chimney-pots looming in the distant future through perennial fog. Sir John is struck with this fact, as, measuring the whole length of the apartment in three strides, he approaches the window to enjoy the glorious view of Hampstead Hills. He shuts the window, and is evidently disappointed ah never mind very comfortable air pure and bracing very much so very different from the air in the lower rooms and i say mind this is the escape says sir john opening a very small door at the side of our friend's room if heaven preserve us there should be a fire in the house and you should not be able to get downstairs you may get up here and make your escape over the roofs that's what you will find in every english house isn't it practical eh huh? what do you say to that the doctor says nothing at all he calculates his chances of escape along that narrow ledge of wall and thinks really things are beginning to look awfully comfortable 
if there should happen to be a fire while i am in the house i hope and trust i shall have time to consider which is worse to be made a male settee of or to tumble down from the roof like an apoplectic sparrow we leave the doctor between the horns of this dilemma and descending a good many more stairs than we ascended we find our way to the haunts of those who in england live underground to the kitchen here too everything is different from what we are accustomed to in germany in the place of the carpets which cover the floors of the upper rooms we walk here on strong solid oilcloths which swept and washed looks like marble and gives a more comfortable aspect to an english kitchen than any german housewife ever succeeded in imparting to the scene of her culinary exercises add to this bright dish covers of gigantic dimensions fixed to the wall plated dishes and sundry other utensils of queer shapes and silvery aspect interspersed with copper saucepans and pots and china the windows neatly curtained with a couple of flower-pots on the sill and a branch of evergreens growing on the wall round them such is an english kitchen in its modest glory a large fire is always kept burning and its ruddy glow heightens the homeliness and comfort of the scene there is no killing of animals in these peaceful retreats all the animals which are destined for consumption such as fowls ducks pigeons and geese are sold killed and plucked in the london shops when they are brought to the kitchen they are in such a condition that nothing prevents their being put to the fire and then in front of that fire turned by a machine dangle large sections of sheep calves and oxen of so respectable a size that the very sight of them would suffice to awe a german housewife several doors in the kitchen open into sundry other subterraneous compartments there is a back kitchen whither the servants of the house retire for the most important part of their daily labours the talking of scandal apropos of the whole neighbourhood there is also a small room for the washing up of plates and dishes the cleaning of knives and forks of clothes and shoes other compartments are devoted to stores of provisions of coals and wine and beer need i add that all these are strictly separate all these various rooms and compartments from the kitchen up to dr keif's garret are in modern london houses lighted up with gas and pipes conducting fresh filtered and in many instances hot water ascend into all the stories and there is in all and everything so much of really domestic and unostentatious comfort that it would be very uncomfortable to give a detailed description of every item of a cause which contributes to the general and agreeable effect indeed such a description is simply impossible just let any one try to explain to an englishman the patriarchal physiognomy of a pot-bellied german stove or let him try to awake in the englishman's wife a feeling remotely akin to sympathy for the charming atmosphere of a german kneipe or make an american understand what the german bunt is and what it is good for to attempt this were a labour of sisyphus toil without a result nothing short of actual experience will enable a man to understand and value these national mysteries end of chapter one part one chapter two of saunterings in and about london by max slesinger this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two street life characteristics of the masses fashionable quarters how mr falcon said good-bye to his customers the crossing in holborn moses and son advertising vans the puffing mania its phases and causes from our house which is our starting point we have several large and small streets leading to the south and opening into holborn which is one of the great arteries of this gigantic town holborn extends to the east to the old prison of newgate where it joins the chief streets of the city in the west it merges into interminable oxford street which leads in a straight line to hyde park and farther on to kensington gardens and bayswater 
if to this large line of streets says dr keith you add the friedrichstrasse of berlin you get a line of houses which extend from this day monday to next week and perhaps a good bit farther but any one who attempts to walk to the farther end of oxford street i say who attempts for since the english prefer a constitutional monarchy to an absolute prince they are surely capable of any act of folly any one i say who performs that insane feat will find that the berlin friedrichstrasse commences at the very last house of oxford street for once dr keif is wrong where oxford street ends there you enter into a charming english landscape one green and hilly and altogether captivating but at the end of the berlin friedrichstrasse you enter nothing but the sandy deserts of the mark holborn is a business street it has a business character there is no mistaking it shops and plate-glass windows side by side on each hand costermongers and itinerant vendors all along the pavement the houses covered with signboards and inscriptions busy crowds on either side omnibuses rushing to and fro in the centre of the road and all around that indescribable bewildering noise of human voices carriage wheels and horses hoofs which pervades the leading streets of crowded cities not all the london streets have this business character they are divided into two classes into streets where the roast beef of life is earned and into the streets where the said roast beef is eaten no other town presents so strong a contrast between its various quarters but a few hundred yards from the leading thoroughfare where hunger or ambition hunt men on extend for many miles the quiet quarters of comfortable citizens of wealthy fund-holders and of landed proprietors who come to town for the season and who return to their parks and shooting-grounds as soon as her majesty has been graciously pleased to prorogue parliament and with parliament the season these fashionable quarters are as quiet as our own provincial towns they have no shops no omnibuses are allowed to pass through them and few costermongers or sellers of fruit onions oysters and fish find their way into these regions for the cheapness of their wares has no attractions for the inhabitants of these streets these streets too are macadamized expressly for the horses and carriages of the aristocracy such roads are more comfortable for all parties concerned that is to say for horses horsemen and drivers and the carriages are moreover too light to do much harm to the road in these streets too there are neither counting-houses nor public-houses to disturb the neighbourhood by their daily traffic and nightly revelries comfort reigns supreme in the streets and in the interior of the houses the roadway is lined with pavements of large white beautiful flagstones which skirt the area railings it is covered with gravel and carefully watered exactly as the broad paths of our public gardens to keep down the dust and deaden the rumblings of the carriages and the step of the horses the horses too are of a superior kind and as different from their poorer brethren the brewers coal merchants and omnibus horses as the part of the town in which they eat is different from the part in which the latter work in the vicinity of the parks or in the outskirts of the town or wheresoever else such quarters have space to extend you must admire their unrivalled magnificence from the velvety luscious green which receives a deeper shade from the dense dark foliage of the english beech trees there arise buildings like palaces with stone terraces and verandas more splendid more beautiful and more frequent than in any town on the continent an englishman is easily satisfied with the rough comforts of his place of business the counting-houses of the greatest bankers the establishments of the largest trading-houses in the city have a gloomy heavy and poverty-stricken appearance but far different is the case with respect to those places where an englishman proposes to live for himself and for his family a wealthy merchant who passes his days in a narrow city street in a dingy office on a wooden stool and at a plain desk would think it very ungenteel if he or his family were to live in a street in which there were shops 
and although it may appear incredible still it is true that in the better parts of the town there are many streets shut up with iron gates which gatekeepers open for the carriages and horses of the residents or their visitors these gates exclude anything like noise and intrusion grocers fishmongers bakers butchers and all other kitchen tradesmen occupy in the fashionable quarters the nearest lanes and side streets and many of them live in close vicinity to the mews for no house not even the largest has a carriage gate and that we in germany shelter under our roofs our horses grooms and all the odours of the stable appears to the english as strange and mysterious generally speaking as our mustachios and our liberalism in matters of religion we have endeavoured to draw the line of demarcation between the residential parts of the town and the business quarters this being done we return to holborn dr keif does not escape the common lot of every stranger in london streets his theories of walking on a crowded pavement are of the most confused description and the consequence is that he is being pushed about in a woeful manner but at each push he expresses his immoderate joy at having for once got into a crowded street where a man must labour hard if he would lounge and saunter about all of a sudden he stops in the middle of the pavement and adjusting his shirt-collar a recent purchase he takes off his hat and bows to somebody or something in the road a natural consequence of all this is that the passengers dig their elbows into the doctor's ribs as they hurry along to whom are you bowing with so much heroic devotion whom why to mr falcon on the other side of the street so you have found an acquaintance already that is a rare case many a man walks about for weeks without seeing a face he knows and you have scarcely left the house when but do you really think i know that mr falcon on the other side of the way saying which the mysterious doctor bows again and i taking my glass find out that there are a dozen mr falcons hoisted on high poles parading the opposite pavement twelve men out at elbows move in solemn procession along the line of road each carrying a heavy pole with a large table affixed to it and on the table there is a legend in large scarlet letters mr falcon removed it appears that mr falcon having thought proper to remove from one forty six holborn begs to inform the nobility the gentry and the public generally that he carries on his business at six argyle street the doctor crossing his arms on his chest gravely while the passengers are pushing him about says since mr falcon is kind enough to inform me of his removal i believe i ought to take off my hat to his advertisement but only think of those poor fellows groaning under mr falcon's gigantic cards he is an original mr falcon is and i would like to make his acquaintance again the doctor is wrong in fancying as he evidently does that mr falcon sends his card-bearers with the news of his removal through the whole of london why should he perhaps he sold cigars or buttons or yarns in holborn and it is there he is known while no one in other parts of the town cares a straw for mr falcon's celebrated and unrivalled cigars buttons or yarns his object is to inform the inhabitants of his own quarter of his removal and of his new address the twelve men with the poles and boards need not go far from early dawn till late at night they parade the site of mr falcon's old shop they walk deliberately and slowly to enable the passengers to read the inscription at their ease they walk in indian file to attract attention and because in any other manner they would block up the way but they walk continually silently without ever stopping for rest thus do they carry their poles for many days and even weeks until every child in the neighbourhood knows exactly where mr falcon is henceforward to be found for the moving column of large scarlet letter boards is too striking and no one can help looking at them and reading the inscription and this is a characteristic piece of what we germans call british industry there is no other town in the world where people advertise with so much persevering energy on so grand a scale at such enormous expense 
with such impertinent puffery and with such distinguished success we have just reached a point in holborn where a great many streets crossing leave a small irregular plot in the middle in the centre of this spot surrounded by a railing and raised in some masonry is a gigantic lamp-post and the whole forms what one might call an island of the streets every now and then the protection of this island is sought by groups of women and children who amidst the noise and the wheels of so many vehicles that dash along in every direction shrink from a bold rush across the whole breadth of the street as noah's dove thought itself lucky in having found an olive branch to alight on amidst the waters of the deluge so do tender women breathe more quietly and look around with greater composure after having reached this street island where they are safe from the ever-returning tide of street life leaning against the lamp-post we are at leisure to look around and see the moving beings things and objects which rush past on every side and for the nonce we will devote a special attention to the various advertising tricks the time night one of those clear fogless calm summer nights which are so few and far between in this large town the life-blood in the street veins runs all the fuller faster and merrier for the beauty of the night holborn is inundated with gaslight but the brightest glare bursts forth exactly opposite to us who in the name of all that is prudent can the people be who make such a shocking waste of gas they are moses and son the great tailors and outfitters who have lighted up the side fronts of their branch establishment all round the outer walls of the house which is filled with coats vests and trousers to the roof and which exhibits three separate side fronts towards three separate streets there are many thousands of gas flames forming branches foliage and arabesques and sending forth so dazzling a blaze that this fiery column of moses is visible to jews and gentiles at the distance of half a mile lighting up the haze which not even the clearest evening can wholly banish from the london sky among the fiery flowers burns the inevitable royal crown surmounting the equally unavoidable letters v r to the right of these letters we have moses and son blessing the queen in flaming characters of hydrocarbon to the left they bless the people god save the queen and god bless the people are the legends of these mosaic illuminations what do they make this illumination for this is not a royal birthday nor is it the anniversary of a great national victory all things considered this ought to be a day of mourning and fasting for measures moses and son for the commons of england have this very afternoon decided that alderman solomons shall not take his seat in the house motives of loyalty politics or religion have nothing whatever to do with the grand illuminations executed by messrs moses and son the air is calm there is not even a breath of wind it's a hundred to one that oxford street and holborn will be thronged with passengers this is our time to attract the idlers up boys and adam light the lamps a heavy expense this burning all that gas for ever so many hours but it pays somehow boldness carries the prize and faint heart never won fair customers and if it were not for that blank police and the insurance companies by jingo it were the best advertisement to burn the house and shop at least twice a year that would puff us up and make people stare and go the round of all the newspapers capital advertisement that eh being strollers in the streets we delight in this extempore illumination it is our object to see and observe and messrs moses and son convert night into day for our especial accommodation a whole legion of lesser planets bask in the region of this great sun crowds of subordinate advertising monsters have been attracted to this part of the street and move about in various shapes to the right and to the left walking rolling on wheels and riding on horseback behold rolling down from oxford street three immense wooden pyramids their outsides are painted all over with hieroglyphics and with monumental letters in the english language 
these pyramids display faithful portraits of isis and osiris of cats storks and of the apis and amidst these old curiosity shop gods any englishman may read an inscription printed in letters not much longer than a yard from which it appears that there is now on view a panorama of egypt one more beautiful interesting and instructive than was ever exhibited in london for this panorama we are still following the inscription shows the flux and reflux of the nile with its hippopotamuses and crocodiles and a section of the red sea as mentioned in holy writ and part of the last overland mail and also the railway from cairo to alexandria exactly as laid out in mr stevenson's head and all this for only one shilling with a full lucid and interesting lecture into the bargain the pyramids advance within three yards from where we stand and for a short time they take their ease in the very midst of all the lights courting attention but the policeman on duty respects not the monuments of the pharaohs he moves his hand and the drivers of the pyramids though hidden in their colossal structures see and understand the sign they move on but here is another monstrous shape a mosque with its cupola blue and white surmounted by the crescent the driver is a light-haired boy with a white turban and a sooty face there is no mistaking that fellow for an arab and nevertheless the turban and the soot make a profound impression we are being invaded by the east says dr keif they are going to give a panoramic explanation of the oriental question if i were lord palmerston i'd put a stop to that sort of thing it's a high crime and misdemeanor against diplomacy pray call for the police but dr keif is wrong again on the back of the mosque there is an advertisement which is as much a stranger to the oriental question as the german diplomats are that advertisement tells us that dr derm is proprietor of a most marvellous arabian medicine warranted to cure the bite of mad dogs and venomous reptiles generally even so that a person so bitten if he but takes dr derm's medicine shall feel no more inconvenience than he would feel from a very savage leader in the morning herald the mosque the blue crescent the gaudy colours and the juvenile arab from the banks of the thames have merely been got up to attract attention there need be no very intimate connection between the things puffed and the street symbolics which puff them heterogeneous ideas are as much an aid to puffing as homogeneous ideas if ever you should happen to go to grand cairo rely on it every cupola of a mosque peeping out from palm groves and aloe hedges will remind you of dr derm and his arabian medicine as advertised in holborn in europe allah is great and the cunning of english speculators is as deep as the sea where it is deepest hark a peal of trumpets another advertising machine rushes out of the gloom of museum street in this instance the orient is not put in requisition the turnout is thoroughly english two splendid cream-coloured horses richly harnessed a dark green chariot of fantastic make in shape like a half-opened shell and tastefully ornamented with gilding and pictures on the box a coachman in red and gold looking respectable and almost aristocratic with his long whip on his knee and behind him the trumpeters seated in the chariot and proclaiming its advent in this manner have the people of london of late months been invited to vauxhall to that same vauxhall which under the regency attracted all the wealth beauty and fashion in england which to this very day still attracts hundreds of thousands whose good and ill fame has crossed the ocean even vauxhall the old and famous makes no exception to the common lot it is compelled to have its posters its newspaper advertisements and its advertising vans in no other town would such tricks be necessary conditions of existence but here where everything is grand and bulky in this town of miraculous extent where generations live and die in the east end without ever having beheld the wonders of the west end among this population which is reckoned by millions instead of by hundreds of thousands 
here where all press and rush on to make money or to spend it here where every one must distinguish himself in some way or other or be lost and perish in the crowd where every hour has its novelty here in london even the most solid undertakings must assume the crying colour of charlatanism the panorama of the nile the overland route the Colosseum, madame tussaud's exhibition of waxworks and other sights are indeed wonder-works of human industry skill and invention and in every respect are they superior to the usual productions of the same kind but for all that they must send their advertising vans into the streets necessity compels them to strike the gong and blow the trumpet choice there is none they must either advertise or perish the same may be said of great institutions of a different kind of fire and life insurance companies of railways and steamers and of theatres from punch's theatre in the strand upwards to the royal italian opera which ransacks europe for musical celebrities and which nevertheless must condescend to magnify its own glory on gigantic many-coloured posters though it has managed up to the present day to do without the vans trumpets and sham nubians it is either advertising or being ruined we have said it before many of our readers will think this is a bold and unwarranted assertion it is neither the one nor the other for it is founded on the experience of many men of business of many examples we quote but one mr bennett keeps a large shop of clocks and watches in cheapside his watches and clocks are among the best in london they have an old-fashioned reputation and they deserve it but their reputation is not owing to their excellency alone it required many years of advertising years of continual and expensive advertising to inculcate this great fact on the obtuse bewildered and deluded londoners thanks to mr bennett's perseverance they were at length convinced and when a few years ago the reputation of the firm had spread throughout the length and breadth of the land it struck mr bennett that now was the time to put a stop to this expensive process of advertising in future said that gentleman i mean to take the full interest from my capital instead of paying part of it to the printers and he set at once about it in the year in which mr bennett took this bold resolution the firm spent a few thousand pounds less than usual in advertisements but the consequences made themselves felt and as month followed month they became still more disagreeably perceptible mr bennett understood that in london virtue is its own reward provided it keeps a trumpeter and as mr bennett was not an obstinate theorist he had again recourse to the printing press he advertises to this very day and to a greater extent if possible than formerly in proof whereof we quote his advertisement in the catalogue of the great exhibition on which occasion he paid nine hundred pounds say nine hundred pounds sterling for the insertion of his advertisement on the back of the wrapper mr bennett's business is as prosperous as ever of course his watches were quite as good during the period he did not advertise but the public was about to forget him advertising is an indispensable item in the expenditure of a london trader while we were talking of mr bennett's shop in cheapside the little lamp-post square in holborn has become more quiet two coal wagons each with four elephantine thick-necked broad-footed horses have suddenly emerged from the darkness of one of the side streets the half-circle which these clumsy horses must make in order to obtain a locus standi in the street of holborn causes a general stoppage among the vehicles which up to the present have been proceeding in regular order at an all but uniform pace for a few moments we are relieved from the clanking of chains the rattling of wheels and the dull rumbling of wooden pyramids and vans now is the time for the lesser sprites of the advertising mysteries a boy on our right puts printed papers into our hands 
on the left the same process is attempted by an elderly man of respectable appearance who jerks his arm with what he believes to be a graceful indifference while everybody else would mistake the same jerk for a convulsive gesture of despondency just before us we have a man with a pole and board recommending some choice blacking and on the opposite pavement there is a hindu dressed in white flannel with a turban on his head and with all the sorrow of a ruined nation in his handsome brown face and chiselled features at his side is a little girl dressed in filthy rags the hindu has a bundle of printed papers in his hand sabbatarian temperance and other tracts inestimable treasures which he offers to the public at the very low price of one penny each that poor fellow got those tracts from some sacred society as a consideration for allowing them to convert him to christianity but his sad face is a sorry recommendation of the treasures of comfort he proposes to dispose of better for him to stand in primitive nudity among his native palm forests adoring the miracles of nature in the sun and in brahma than to shiver here in the cold wet pavement cursing the torments of want in the image of the sacred saviour on the banks of the ganges that man prayed to god here among strangers he learns to hate mankind but then he was a pagan on the banks of the ganges on the banks of the thames he has the name of a christian whether or no the christian is really more religious than the pagan was is a question which seems to give little trouble to the pious missionaries the bible society has done its duty our worthy friend dr keif was it seems also struck with the melancholy aspect of the hindu he made a bold rush across the street put some pence into the tiny brown hand of the little girl and took in return a tract on true devotion which he did not read but crushing it into a paper ball angrily threw it into the gutter he had taken the tract out of consideration for the poor man's feelings it's begging under the pretense of selling said the worthy doctor in a great rage but since the delusion is a comfort to him i would not for the world offer him money without taking one of his papers it was very naughty in the doctor to fling that tract away as he did as a punishment we were immediately assailed by a set of imps who mistook us for easy victims on the altars of speculation men with cocoa-nuts and dates and women with oranges surrounded us with their carts one man recommended his dog collars of all sizes which he had formed on a chain around his neck another person offered to mark our linen a third produced his magic strops others held out notebooks cutlery prints caricatures exhibition medals all 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 for one penny it seemed as if the world were on sale at a penny a bit and amidst all this turmoil the men with advertising boards walked to and fro and the boys distributed advertising bills by the hundred with smiles of deep bliss whenever they met a charitable soul who took them the coal wagons are gone and the street noise is as loud as ever are we to remain here and pursue our studies of the natural history of advertising vans it is not likely we shall see them all for their numbers are incalculable they generate according to abnormal laws each day and each event produces another form the advertisement is omnipresent it is in the skies and on the ground it swells as the flag in the breeze and it sets its seal on the pavement it is on the water on the steamboat wharf and under the water in the thames tunnel it roosts on the highest chimneys it sparkles in coloured letters on street lamps it forms the prologue of all the newspapers and the epilogue of all the books it breaks in upon us with the sound of trumpets and it awes us in the silent sorrow of the hindu there is no escaping from the advertisement for it travels with you in the omnibuses in the railway carriages and on the paddle-boxes of the steamers the arches of the great bridges over the thames were at one time free from advertisements the masonry was submerged by the periodical returns of the tide and the bills would not stick but at length the advertisement invaded even these the last asylums of non-publicity 
since bills could not be pasted on the walls the advertisement was painted on them at this hour there is not an arch in a london bridge but has its advertisement painted on it but for whom for the thousands who every day pass under the bridge in steamers for the thames too is one of the london streets and by no means the least important one End of chapter two part one chapter three of saunterings in and about london by max slesinger this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three the squares lincoln's inn a man may be familiar with london streets he may for years have gone his weary way amidst these endless rows of bare narrow irregular houses which are black with fog and smoke without ever suspecting that gardens sparkling in idyllic beauty are hidden behind those masses of sooty masonry this is one of the chief distinctions between london and paris and other continental capitals paris has much outside glitter much startling show its boulevards its place de la concorde place vendome rue de la paix rue rivoli and sundry others of its streets and public places are unrivalled london cannot vie with them in architectural prodigies but the brilliant points of paris of which frenchmen are in the habit of boasting attract our attention only to divert it from the narrow crooked lanes and the filth of the other parts of their town paris sports a clean shirt front merely to hide the uncleanliness of its general nature the french are adepts in the art of draping the english on the contrary know nothing whatever of that noble art the cut of their clothes is inelegant but the cloth is the best of its kind their dwelling-houses have the appearance of old chimneys but the inside is replete with comfort and unpretending wealth their language is rough and without melody but it is energetic flexible and expressive their metropolis too conceals its real beauties it requires some investigation some instinct and discernment to discover and enjoy them in the broadest part of holborn there are on either side certain suspicious-looking lanes in which pawnbrokers and cobblers hang out and where a roaring though not a very fragrant trade is driven in greens meat and fish the lanes on the north side communicate with gray's inn on the south they form an intricate labyrinth which we enter on our way to lincoln's inn fields travellers proceeding from london to dover pass through a series of monstrous tunnels which have been bored through those mountains of chalk the bulwarks of the british islands as they emerge from the darkness of the last tunnel they feel happy and grateful for the fresh sea-breeze which plays around and the vast boundless view which opens before them in a like manner do we breathe more freely as we emerge from the last of these narrow and by no means sweetly smelling lanes a broad square filled with trees flowers and garden ground opens before us this is one of the many squares of which you o oh my beloved countrymen entertain such crude and indistinct notions squares are wide open spots surrounded by houses exactly like our own plezza but instead of the monuments of saints whom the anglican church ignores instead of the pestilence columns which englishmen object to though london like every other respectable old town had its plagues in olden times and instead of our beautiful market fountains the poesy of which is a sealed book to the english mind their plezza have been converted into gardens with broad commodious streets all around the railings these gardens are not by any means so small as the germans generally believe indeed in the larger squares they are of considerable extent the curiosity of the passers-by is repelled by trees shrubs and carefully trimmed hedges and the shady walks and the grass plots in the centre are strictly private of these squares lincoln inn fields is the largest it covers an area of twelve acres the joint extent of all the london squares is one thousand two hundred acres with the exception of smithfield and trafalgar square all the london squares have gardens 
and the trees and shrubs which grow in them improve the air of all the neighbouring streets such gardens are found in all quarters of the town and in many cases they are hidden among the narrowest alleys and gloomiest courts where the wanderer least expects to find them they are the most beautiful spots in london for they present specimens of nature's paradise blooming in concealment and all the more lovely are they for that very reason let us return to lincoln's inn fields we stand on classic soil three sides of this large square are surrounded with buildings whose open doors show at once that they are not mere ordinary dwelling-houses one of them attracts our special attention it is so black and its columns are so many and so high it is the royal college of surgeons where the medical students pass their examination in surgery this house too shelters the famous anatomical museum which john hunter bequeathed to the college of surgeons all the other buildings are owned by the guild of the lawyers in the heart of the city the houses from the cellars to the garrets are let out as offices and storerooms the houses in lincoln's inn fields too are devoted to the special accommodation of lawyers a walk up and down and a look at the doorposts which are black with the names of advocates suffice to convince us of the lamentable condition of english law we have said that this is classic soil sir thomas more shaftesbury the statesman and lord mansfield studied in the precincts of lincoln's inn and oliver cromwell passed two years of his eventful life in the same locality the square has its sad reminiscences too in the centre of the gardens where flowers blow and birds sing there stood at one time a scaffold and on that scaffold died one of the noblest patriots of england lord russell an ancestor of finality john and son to william earl of bedford the crown of england rested in those days on the head of the second charles at his side was his brother the duke of york the evil genius of charles and of england charles and james his brother listened to the counsels of france and of rome for they wanted money and the whigs would only consent to vote the people's money in exchange for some crumbs of liberty for the people thus it came to pass that england's honour was sold to france and the rebellious parliament was dissolved and the press put down the liberties of the city were curtailed venal men were placed on the bench and venal witnesses thronged the courts the best men of england were put into jail and arraigned on charges of high treason among the best and bravest was william russell they accused him of having conspired against the king's life and sent him to the tower witnesses were bribed to appear against him they were men of proverbial villainy among them was lord howard of whom the king himself had said he would not hang the worst cur in his kennel on the evidence of that man but that man's evidence sufficed to bring the best man in all england to the block it is the old story a tail-wagging cur is more considered at court than a thinking man lord russell's head fell in the centre of this very square vainly did his wife implore the king's mercy lord russell's head fell in the immediate vicinity of his estates and the londoners of those days saw him pass through holborn on his way to the scaffold many wept many abused him others jeered at him the people of that time had even less respect for its heroes and martyrs than the present generation in our days even the vilest of the vile are awed into silence when the princes of this earth deliver their political adversaries to the hangman's rope or the mercy of a platoon of rifles but even in these our own days there is a party in england there are englishmen citizens writers and members of parliament and most of them truly honourable men who while they declare that the british whigs of those times were patriots and martyrs do not hesitate rashly to condemn the rebellious parliament and political parties of the continent no englishman not the most conservative would dare to deny to lord russell one single ray of that glorious crown of martyrdom which the english people and its historians have placed upon his bleeding head it cannot be denied they say that lord william russell conspired against an illegal government but to conspire against such a government was his duty he was justified in so doing 
but if the russells of those days were justified in vindicating the people's rights against the king how then can you so smoothly and glibly apply the word rebels to the continental russells of our own days if armed opposition is treasonable was it less treasonable in days gone by do the rights of mankind dwindle away as century follows century or has the great nation of england so small a mind that it cannot distinguish between the merits of a cause and its success the russells of the last century shed their blood for this generation england is free happy undisturbed mighty strong tranquil and reasonable she develops a brighter future from the benefits she at present enjoys the english know it and in this knowledge is the secret of their pride the sanguinary conflicts of the continent which have hitherto had no results provoke in englishmen a smile of mingled pity and derision those people don't know what they are driving at some say if they would be happy they ought to imitate england and others say they want freedom but they are not practical enough they do not turn their revolution to advantage as our ancestors did and as we would do in their place but i say it is easy to find fault with others and a happy man has all the wisdom of solomon these english sages do not consider how much easier it was to their ancestors to bring the contest with the power of the crown to a successful issue the english patriots were not opposed by large standing armies the contest lay between them and a single family and its factions and this is a point which has never been sufficiently dwelt upon they had no reason to fear a foreign intervention for england as the greatest living author says never fought as france did for the freedom of the world but for its own freedom hence the continental powers paid little attention to the battles of the puritans and the contests between charles and cromwell clarendon indeed considered their non-intervention a great grievance but this non-intervention of spain or france was the greatest blessing for royalty in england if those countries had interfered the contest for the principles of constitutionalism might have been prolonged to this very day or perhaps royalty would have been killed outright on the english battlefields the history of england says macaulay is a history of progress who would gainsay it at the commencement of the twelfth century a small and semi-barbarous nation subject to a handful of foreigners without a trace of civilization large masses enslaved the saxons still distinct from the normans superstition and brutality everywhere and the law of the strong hand the supreme law of the land such was england seven hundred years ago then came the bloody civil wars brain scorching land spoiling man consuming sectarian wars contests abroad and contests at home a series of vile hypocritical dissolute and narrow-minded monarchs and at intervals bright epochs of great times in history and politics and day was changed into night and night into day until england attained its present position among the nations of the earth from one decade to another there may have been periodical retrogressions but each century gave clear and irrefragable evidence of the progress of england if therefore in the next years france should happen again to attain those giddy heights of freedom which she gained three times already and which three times have vanished beneath her feet then let not france as she is wont to do wax proud in the scanty shade of her newly planted trees of liberty and let her not look down contemptuously on the cold thick-blooded clumsy tree of liberty in england at the end of the century the two nations may compare their charters it will then be seen which of them has really and truly had the greatest gains the blood of france has manured the mental soil of all the world england should be the last to forget what her liberty has gained by the ideal conquests of france france on the other hand might make the most useful study in considering the consistent carrying out of great political maxims on the british soil when two nations express their opinions of one another and reproach each other with their faults they are in the habit of paying too little attention to the circumstances which promote or obstruct the advance of freedom 
in this respect the peculiarities of the countries and their geographical position cannot be too highly estimated who can tell what would be the condition of germany if our country were secure from foreign intervention and if as is the case with england the sea protected it from the violence of its enemies or the insidious advances of its political friends End of chapter three chapter one part four of saunterings in and about london by max slesinger this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four up the thames vauxhall the riverside views of the river the tides the bridge the temple and somerset house entrance to vauxhall british decorative genius somebody runs away with dr keif magic nelson and wellington the circus the burning of moscow an episode at the tea-table if you leave king william street just at the foot of london bridge and turn to the right you will find your way into a set of narrow and steep streets few only of which admit of carriage and horse traffic the lower stories of the houses are let out as offices and the upper as warehouse floors the pavement is narrow and the road as bad as broken stones and long neglect can make it dirty boys in sailors jackets play at leapfrog over the street posts legions of wheelbarrows encumber the broader parts of these thoroughfares packing cases stand at the doors of houses and cranes and levers peep out from the upper stories such are the streets which lead down to the banks of the thames it is altogether a dusty filthy uncanny quarter a few steps through a black cornery nondescript structure of sooty brick and mortar covered all over with immense shipping advertisements in all colours and we stand on the bank of the river an entirely new scene is opened before our eyes close to our left the mighty grey arches of london bridge rise up from the river we look under them downwards where the last ocean ships are crowded together on their moorings where the distant masts are lost in the haze and where ocean life finds its limits because the bridge prevents those large ships from passing up the river we look in an opposite direction along the broad expanse of water with busy little steamers rushing frantically in every conceivable direction we look up to the parapet of london bridge where high as it is we see the heads of the passengers and the crowded roofs of the omnibuses we look over to the other bank where a thousand high chimneys vomit forth their smoke and we behold southwark the amiable appendix to the metropolis which at this day has its six hundred thousand inhabitants and lastly we look straight down before our feet where half a dozen steamers closely packed together dance up and down on the waves where steam rushes forth noisily from narrow pipes where hundreds of men women and children run about in inextricable confusion pushing their way to the shore to one of the boats or from one boat to another where the paddles beat the water and the boys start the machinery by shrill screams while the mooring barges creak as the ropes are drawn tight we look and behold this is the thames this is the great living fabulous watery high road in the heart of the british metropolis they have abused thee sadly thou grey thames for the filth of thy waters and the fogs which arise from thee but most unjustly hast thou been abused at lechlade where the four rivulets from the cotswolds join into a river thy waters are as pure and pellucid as the alpine streams which spring forth from the glacier at lechlade there are no fogs obscuring the surface there the air is pure there art thou romantic and idyllic innocent alike of the temptations of the world and the vice and filth of the greatest town for many many miles further down to kew and richmond thou art beautiful to behold flowing through the emerald green of the meadows and the deep luscious green of the bush a mirror for the lordly villas and charming cottages which stud thy banks but most rapidly dost thou rush forward to thy metamorphosis most quickly dost thou expand into a broad grey elderly man of business 
he who saw thee at richmond will not know thee again at westminster and the travelling stranger who only beheld thee between the bridges of the metropolis has not the faintest idea of thy beauties at richmond the grey business atmosphere of london has cast its gloom upon thee as well as on the stones the houses and the human beings that inhabit them but whatever the thames may lose in romance it gains in the grandeur and importance of its appearance its breadth increases with every step navigable to the length of a hundred and eighty english miles with a tidal rise to the extent of seventy miles the thames takes the largest merchantmen to the immediate vicinity of london bridge and as the tide is going out it takes them back without the help of oars sails or steam tugs nature has made the thames the grandest of all trading rivers it gave it a larger share of the ocean tides than it ever bestowed on any other river in europe at the land's end the tides from the atlantic are divided into two distinct streams one rushes up the channel and round the north foreland into the mouth of the thames the other beats against the western coasts of england and of scotland and taking a southerly direction down the eastern coast this tide too enters the basin of the thames hence the tides in the thames are formed of two different ocean tides they are equal by day and by night and so powerful is the rush of the tide from the north foreland to the metropolis that it flows at the rate of five miles an hour but here is the boat smoking away right at our feet there is a rush of persons from the shore and a rush of persons to the shore we pay two pence scramble down a variety of steps and stairs and jump on board just as they are casting off there is no whistling or ringing of a bell no noise whatever we are already steaming it up to the far west the bank on our left offers no interesting points on which the eye might dwell with pleasure manufactories breweries and gasworks dispute every inch of ground with the ugliest storehouses imaginable the sight strikes one as that of a large city in ruins but on our right we see st paul's rising from an ocean of roofs the sun still visible on the horizon shines on the roof of the cathedral and shows the gigantic cupola in the most charming light st paul's ought to be seen from the river by those who would fully understand its grandeur we pass through the arches of blackfriars bridge and proceed in a line with fleet street before us the stream is spanned by a number of bridges so that it seems as if their pillars crossed one another and as if the nearest bridge bore the next following on its arched back so strange and astonishing is this sight that we are tempted to mistake it for a fata morgana and expect to see it dissolve into thin air seven enormous bridges have been built across the river at very short intervals and unite the more animated parts of the borough and lambeth with london proper among these bridges is an iron suspension bridge with a bold double arch another bridge is composed of iron and stone and the rest are simply built of massive stones it is true that only three of these seven bridges are freely open to the public and that the four others exact a toll but for how many years past have the germans talked of a stone bridge across the rhine at cologne and another stone bridge across the danube at vienna and as yet neither cologne nor vienna have mustered the funds for such undertakings and in london there are seven bridges within a river length of a few miles a little higher up moreover is battersea bridge and lower down the river there is the tunnel and already have they commenced making a new bridge at chelsea the english have a right to pride themselves on the grandeur of the british spirit of enterprise but the german who comes into this country and beholds its marvels makes comparisons which sorely vex and trouble his spirit we pass the temple the chinese junk somerset house and the new houses of parliament and westminster abbey but we cannot stop to describe them for we purpose to reserve them for a special visit on another occasion besides our attention is engaged by the general aspect of the river and its banks darkness has set in steamers with red and green eyes of fire rush past us 
little boats cross in all directions under the very bows of the steamers fishing boats with dark brown sails go with the tide in solemn silence the lights on the bridges and in the streets are reflected in the water this is the hour at which matter-of-fact london dons her poetical night-dress we pass lambeth palace and its ruin-like watch-tower the boat stops at vauxhall bridge we get off and walk through some of the streets of lambeth we pass through a railway bridge and stand in front of vauxhall the season is over everybody has gone out of town etc write the correspondents of provincial and continental newspapers everybody that is to say everybody with the exception of two millions of men who make rather a considerable noise in the northern southern and eastern towns of london but of course they are nobodies they are merely merchants tradesmen manufacturers clerks agents public functionaries judges physicians barristers teachers journalists publishers printers musicians actors clergymen labourers beggars thieves foreigners and other members of the vile rabble everybody else left the metropolis immediately after the parliament was prorogued by the queen and the royal italian opera was prorogued by signora grisi the west end is now a city of the dead the deserted streets and the shuttered windows proclaim that all who are not exactly nobodies are shooting in scotland or gaping on the rhine that they suffer from the blues in italy or that the trout suffer from them in sweden but vauxhall is still open partly because the weather is so uncommonly mild for the season partly because there are a good many foreigners in london but chiefly because vauxhall has come to be vulgar and very vulgar too a haunt of milliners and democrats by birth and education vauxhall was born in the regency in one of the wicked nights of dissolute prince george a wealthy speculator was its father a prince was its godfather and all the fashion and beauty of england stood round its cradle in those days vauxhall was very exclusive and expensive at present it is open to all ranks and classes and half a guinea will frank a fourth-rate milliner and sweetheart through the whole evening a londoner wants a great deal for his money or he wants little take it which way you please the programme of vauxhall is an immense carte for the eye and ear music singing horsemanship illuminations dancing rope dancing acting comic songs hermits gypsies and fireworks on the most stunning scale it is easier to read the kölner zeitung than the playbill of vauxhall with respects to the quantity of sights it is most difficult to satisfy an english public they have a capacious swallow for sights and require them in large masses as they do the meat which graces their tables as to quality that is a minor consideration and to give the english public its due it is the most grateful of all publics the entrance to vauxhall is dismally dark and prison-like dr keif objects to the place it's a trap says he the real road to ruin i am sure the chevalier bunsen and that fellow buol schauenstein lie in ambush in some of those dark holes they will pounce upon me and seize me and take me back to germany where they have no brown stout and where i must needs get famous or die with ennui la siate ognie speranza voi ce entrada just at that moment a german refugee goes by he bids us good evening and is lost in the darkness ah says the doctor that boy has been sentenced to be shot in the grand duchy of baden i believe they shot him in effigy he's an imp of fame and if he dares go in why shouldn't i dare let us go in the dismal aspect of the entrance is the result of artistic speculation it is a piece of theatrical claptrap for all of a sudden we emerge from the darkness of the passage into a dazzling sea of light which almost blinds one all the arbours avenues grottoes and galleries of the gardens are covered with lamps the trees are lighted to the very tops each leaf has its coloured ladybird of a gaslight where the deuce did those people ever get those lamps and how did they ever get them lighted 
it must be confessed that the manager has done his duty if you can show him a single leaf without its lamp he will surely jump into the thames or hang himself on the branch which was thus shamefully neglected dr keif who is disposed to find fault with everything and who just now protested that the entrance to vauxhall was a trap expressly constructed for the apprehension of political refugees asserts that the illumination is enough to spoil the temper of any one look at those english madcaps says he in other parts of the town i walk for hours before i find a human being smoking a cigar and offering an opportunity to light my own weed and here i stand as the donkey in the midst of three hundred thousand bundles of hay which of these lamps shall i select for the lighting of my cigar this way sir look down there where the queen is burning in gas says an englishman with a cigar in his mouth who has overheard the doctor's lament and he added light your weed at the flames of victoria and implore her gracious majesty that she might be pleased to abolish the duty on tobacco from that moment is dr keif lost to the rest of our party an englishman who spurning all old established customs and traditions dares to address a stranger and to address him too on the subject which has nothing whatever in common with the state of the weather such an englishman is a rara avis and nothing could induce dr keif to forego his acquaintance already has he engaged him in conversation utterly oblivious of the friends who came with him and of all the world besides we must try to get on without the doctor the gardens are crowded dense masses are congregated around a sort of open temple which in vauxhall stands in lieu of a music-room the first part of the performance is just over and a lady whose voice is rather the worse for wear and who defies the cool of the evening with bare shoulders and arms is in the act of being encored she is delighted and so are the audience many years ago this spot witnessed the performances of grisi rubini lablach and other first-rate musical celebrities the crowd promenade these gardens in all directions in the background is a gloomy avenue of trees where loving couples walk and where the night air is tinged with the hue of romance even the bubbling of a fountain may be heard in the distance we go in search of the sound but alas we witness nothing save the triumph of the insane activity of the illuminator a tiny rivulet forces its way through the grass it is not deep enough to drown a herring yet it is wide enough and babbling enough to impart an idyllic character to the scene but how has this interesting little watercourse fared under the hands of the illuminator the wretch has studded its banks with rows of long arrow-headed gas-lights not satisfied with lighting up the trees and walls and dining saloons he must needs meddle with this lilliputian piece of water also that is english taste which delights in quantities no frenchman would ever have done such a thing following the rivulet we reach the bank of a gas-lit pond with a gigantic neptune and eight white sea-horses to the left of the god opens another gloomy avenue which leads us straightway to fate to the hermit and the temple of pythia who in the guise of a gipsy reclining on straw under a straw-roofed shed with a stable lantern at her side is in the habit of reading the most brilliant future on the palm of your hand for the ridiculously low price of sixpence only this is specially english no house without its fortifications no open-air amusements without gypsies the prophetess of vauxhall is by no means a person of repulsive appearance you admire in her a comely brown daughter of israel with black hair and dark eyes it is very agreeable to listen to her expounding your fate she is good-tempered and agreeable and has a californian prophecy for all comers she predicts faithful wives length of days a grave in a free soil to every one even to the german the dwelling of the sage hermit is much less primitive nor are believers permitted to enter it they must stand on the threshold from whence they may admire a weird and awful scenery 
mountains precipices and valleys and the genius loci a large cat with fiery eyes all charmingly worked in canvas and pasteboard with a strict and satisfactory regard for the laws of perspective the old man with his beard so white and his staff so strong comes up from the mysterious depth of a pasteboard ravine he asks a few questions and disappears again and in a few minutes the believer receives his or her future carefully copied out on cream-coloured paper and in verse too with his or her name as an anagram of course these papers are all ready written and prepared by the dozen and as one lady of our party had the name of hedwig by no means a common name in england she had to wait a good long while before she was favoured with a sight of her fate this of course strengthened her belief in the hermit and the fidelity of her husband we the pilgrims of vauxhall leave the hermit's cell our eyes have become accustomed to the twilight and as we proceed we behold in the background the tower and battlements of a large and fantastically built tower can this be westminster abbey or is it a mere optical delusion let us see hark a gun is fired in the shrubbery the promenaders who are familiar with the place turn round and all rush in one direction sweeping us along with them before we can collect ourselves we have been pushed forward to a panoramic stage on which nelson in plaster is in the act of expiring while wellington in pasteboard rides over the battlefield of waterloo these two figures are the worst of their kind still the public cheer the two national heroes no house without its fortifications no open-air amusements without gypsies and no play without the old admiral and the old general wellington has scarcely triumphed over napoleon and silenced the french batteries when the cannonade recommences in the shrubbery one two guns it is the signal for the arena unless you purchase a seat in the boxes or in the galleries you have no chance of seeing the exhibition of the circus for the pit which is gratis is crowded to suffocation englishmen care more for live horses than they do for pasteboard chargers fraught though they be with national reminiscences the productions of horsemanship at vauxhall are exactly on a par with similar exhibitions on the other side of the channel britons are more at home on horseback or on board a ship than on the strings of the fiddle or on the ivory keys of the pianoforte and thus then do the men and women dance on unsaddled horses play with balls and knives and jump through paper and over boards half a dozen of old and young clowns distort their joints a lady dances on a rope a la marionette and miss a who was idolized at berlin and whom seven officers of the horse guards presented with a bracelet on which their seven heroic faces were displayed condescends to produce her precious bracelet and her precious person in this third-rate circus and an american guzikow makes music on wood straw and leather and the horses are neighing and the whips smacking and the sand is being thrown up and the boarding trembles with the tramp of the horses and there is no end of cheering and a miss a reappears and curtsies with the seven gentlemen of the horse guards on her arm and another gun is fired and the public leaving the circus rush madly into the gardens to the fireworks they are the most brilliant exhibition of the evening the gardens are bathed in a bluish light and the many thousand lamps look all pale and ominous the gigantic and fantastic city which before loomed through the twilight of the distant future burns now in bengal fire it is moscow it is the kremlin and they are burning it sounds of music voices of lamentation issue from the flames guns are firing rockets shoot up and burst with an awful noise the walls give way they fall and from the general destruction issues a young girl with very thin clothing and very little of it who makes her escape over a rope at a dizzy height the exhibition is more awful than agreeable but the public cheer this as they do any other neck or nothing feat if the girl were to carry a baby on her perilous way the cheering would be still greater 
it is past midnight the wind is cold and fresh guests are crowding in to join the ball which is kept up to the break of day but we have not the least inclination to watch the ungraceful movements of english men who dance with english women or of english women who dance with english men we hail a cab and hasten home at the door we fall in with the doctor whom we had lost in the early part of the evening he is greatly excited for he has walked the whole way from vauxhall to guildford street in the parlour we find sir john and his most faithful wife seated at the round table with the tea-things before them waiting tea for us as we enter sir john puts down the times in which he has been gloating over a damaging letter against the chancellor of the exchequer and the lady of the house welcomes us with a friendly nod and a look of anxious inquiry that look means have you caught a cold you or any of you or is it a sore throat or a cough surely you cannot have been out all night without some slight illness which will justify me in opening my medicine chest and she looks at the things to see if they are all in good order and then the tea is poured out with the utmost precision a cup of tea is delicious after that long ride from vauxhall and there is much comfort and snugness in an english parlour the cup which cheers but not inebriates loosens dr keif's tongue the tea is very refreshing madam is a remark which the doctor makes twice every day in fine and foul weather and in making this remark he always holds out his empty cup that it may be filled again but most loyal sir john continues the doctor refreshed by the tea it's a mighty difficult task to get through an english evening's pleasure in a single night to think of all the things i have seen this evening and for half a crown too why one half of them would suffice to entertain the inhabitants of a german capital for a period of six calendar months that is what i always say interposed bella the daughter of the house with a look of triumph london is the cheapest town in the whole world so it is says dr keif awfully cheap i had some cold beef at vauxhall some cheese and a cruet of wine and i paid only nine shillings on my honour nothing but nine shillings the bread was not included the waiter gave me a piece after i had asked him long enough but i had scarcely put it on my plate and i was lost in its contemplation when it was carried off by a sparrow now that will give you an idea how very large it must have been but what could induce you to drink wine or ask for bread at vauxhall said bella and where have you been all the evening what did you do with your friend oh i had a delightful conversation with him and let me tell you he is a clever fellow still he is not free from english prejudice though a great deal of it has been rubbed off on his travels of germany he saw only the south having been compelled as he told me to return to england to look after some property which a whimsical old uncle had left him under conditions which made residence in this country a matter of necessity it's a pity there is a great deal of good in him and i have no doubt he would be a great genius if he could but pass a couple of winters in berlin indeed what was his english prejudice asked sir john with great disgust it is not easy to answer that question national prejudice is like a pigtail you can't see it in front another cup of tea if you please it's only my fourth and it's scandalous how they teach history in your schools this new friend of mine is a well-bred man but he had never heard of blucher we looked at the duke of wellington's ride over the field of waterloo and i said couldn't you find a place for our blucher blucher said he who is blucher he knew nothing whatever of blucher and the prussian army and when i told him that but for the prussians wellington would have been made mincemeat of at waterloo he actually laughed in my face now tell me most respectable sir john how do they teach history in your schools the french i know cook history and make matters pleasant for the young idea sir john was silent the article he had read in the times had made him magnanimous and our friend keif remained uncontradicted i told my companion continued the doctor after a pause that the dancing was a disgraceful exhibition 
he said so it was he had seen the dancing abroad if he had never been out of england i am sure he would have been delighted with the performance of his countrywomen and as most englishmen do in such a case he would have shrugged his shoulders and set me down as a fool for the unfavourable opinion i pronounced but he had left part of his prejudice on the other side of the channel and he himself pointed out to me how ridiculous those people looked and how the couples clung to one another like woolsacks which cannot stand alone and how they pushed one another and marked the time by kicking one another's toes don't believe said he that there is better dancing in the saloons of our aristocracy we know nothing of the noble art and for that very reason do we practise it with so much devotion such like unnatural leanings are common with all nations they are most zealous in what they least understand the russians build a fleet the austrians affect finances the germans make revolutions the french will have a republic and the english dance but surely doctor said bella neither you nor your new friend can deny that better dancing is going on in london than in any other town this very season we had taglioni rosati and ferraris all on the same stage the old argument said the doctor because you have got money and because you can afford to pay for a good ballet you pretend that the most graceful dancers are hatched in england you subsidized the german armies against napoleon and now you believe that your redcoats alone vanquished the french port and sherry are your english wines and because you succeed at an enormous expense to rare hothouse peaches grapes and apples you will have it that england produces better fruit than any other country but it's all nonsense it's money and money and again money and with that money you buy up the world and well after all old england forever then another cup of tea for me did you see that gaslit rivulet at vauxhall says i for i like to hear the doctor find fault with england he does it in such a good-natured amiable manner and with a spice of roguishness which is all the more interesting since in germany dr keif is generally disliked for his anglomania what asked i do you say to the romantic style of decoration which prevails in england of course i saw that rivulet and had a splendid adventure on its banks dr keif is literally overwhelmed with adventures he cannot go to the next street without a remarkable incident of some sort or other i had lost my companion said dr keif leaning back in his chair i had lost him in the crowd i saw a dark avenue in the distance and i longed for rest you know sir john we germans cannot for any length of time go on without peace and tranquillity although the times will have it that we are the most restless and disturbance loving nation in europe well under the trees near the rivulet i espied a loving couple they walk up and down and stand still of course they are happy to be alone and unobserved but anxious to understand the character of the english i resolved to overhear their conversation i passed them several times but they were silent right thought i affection makes them mute their souls stand entranced on the giddy pinnacle of passion but they could not be silent all night especially since it was so dark they could not speak with their eyes i laid myself in ambush they approached my heart beat quick with thrilling anticipation they were talking but can you fancy what they were talking about of morrison's pills and the mode and manner of their effect in bilious complaints of course there was no resisting this i jumped out of the thicket leaped across the rivulet and came home at once we all laughed at the doctor's adventure and sir john too laughed dr keif had met with half a dozen adventures on his way home for instance he had fallen in with a sailor who told him long stories about spain he not the sailor had found a drunken woman in a gutter and dragged her out and bella declared that the woman must have been irish and two vestals had taken hold of his arms and he had a deal of trouble before he could induce them to leave him alone in short there was no end of the doctor's adventures End of chapter four
Part One, Chapter Five of Saunterings in and About London by Max Schlesinger. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five: The Police. The London Police journey from paris to london the politics of the force its mode of action illustrated difference between the police in england and on the continent detectives rookeries the policeman as citizen in a town such as london is at the present day where thousands of honest men follow their daily avocations at the side and mixed up with thousands of dishonest men the government has but one alternative with respect to the police regulations it must either resign the idea of organizing a surveillance by means of the police or that surveillance must be carried on according to a highly practical principle with the police and other political institutions it is exactly the same as with our clothes they would seem to grow with us but the fact is as we grow in height and breadth we take care that our coats have greater length and breadth in the same manner is the police allowed to grow in proportion to the growth of a town and none but thieves or fools in politics can object to the process provided always that the police is for the protection and not for the torment of the peaceful citizen scarcely a hundred years ago no one could dare to walk from kensington to the city after nightfall at hyde park corner not far from the place where the crystal palace stood there was a bell which was rung at seven and at nine o'clock those who had to go to the city assembled at the call and proceeded in a body by which means they were comparatively safe from the attacks of highwaymen small bodies of men were frequently stopped by the robbers it happened now and then that the passengers were attacked and sorely molested by a roistering band of wild young fellows who were fresh from the public-house but all this romance came to an end when george the second was stopped and plundered one fine night on his return from hunting the very next morning a troop of armed horsemen was established to watch over the security of the public streets and though these were not the rudiments of the london police there were already some watchmen and river guards yet we consider them as a fraction of the police embryo which has since grown up to such respectable dimensions the guild of the london police on the continent they are but too frequently confounded with the older constables was founded and trained by sir robert peel they are consequently a product of our own times and that this product is not a luxury and that it is more useful than many other creations of our own times is clearly shown by the great london journals which daily acknowledge the institution in their police reports but this institution is very little understood in germany and even strangers who pass a short time in england are not likely to understand it let us watch the steps of a german for instance on his journey across the channel he leaves cologne with an express train and reaches calais at midnight bewildered with sleep he leaves the carriage the first object which strikes his view is a large hand painted on the wall he follows the outstretched index of that hand and finds his way not to the refreshment rooms whither he wants to go but to the bureau de police where he never thought of going he is cruelly disappointed but he is an honest man and not even a political refugee and he has therefore no reason to avoid communication with the french police they ask for his passport and if the traveller can produce some document of the kind they are content the passport may indeed be a forgery its possessor may have stolen it napoleon the great found his way back from elba without a passport and louis philippe also without a passport found his way out of france but no matter the french require the production of passports doubtlessly for some hidden good for the alcun bene of dante on his arrival in folkestone or dover many an honest german has from the mere force of habit put his hand in his pocket and produced his passport ready for inspection of course the methodical foreigner was laughed at for his pains 
the emperor of france and his satellites may possibly have an interest in knowing all particulars about those who turn their backs upon them but constitutional england is not in the habit of asking her guests whence they come why they come and whither they go after a short interview with the custom-house officers and these too though functionaries are dressed like all other honest men the stranger is free of the country and if his trade be an honest one he is not interfered with indeed he is almost neglected by the public authorities on his arrival in london he takes apartments in an hotel or in a boarding-house or he takes furnished lodgings or a house or a street no matter the police do not interfere with him and to all appearance they pay no attention whatever to his proceedings this apparently unguarded liberty is the secret of the real grandeur of the preventive service but that this is possible is partly owing to the good will of a liberal government and partly to the peculiarities of english life and manners this is a point which we shall on a future occasion treat at greater length the circumstance that a stranger may walk to and fro between the isle of wight and the orkneys without being questioned protocoled and stopped has caused many a foreigner to doubt the safety of life in england generally a certain berlin professor i am told got quite angry on the subject a man said he goes about in england exactly as if he were disowned by society and removed from within the pale of it the very dogs of berlin are more respected at least they have their numbers taken and are entered into the dog book Hundebuch. at the police office while in england none but thieves can feel comfortable since thieves alone are in a manner noticed by the police in treating of the functions of the london police we ought at once to say that the police in england is essentially a force of safety whose functions are limited to the prevention of crime and the apprehension of criminals all its departments of river street and railway police are instituted for the same purpose there has not hitherto been a political department in scotland yard the police as at present organized deals only with the vulgar sins of larceny robbery murder and forgery it superintends the cleaning of the streets it prevents the interruption of the street traffic and it takes care of drunkards and of children that have strayed from their homes but political opinions however atrocious if they have not ripened into criminal action are altogether without the sphere of the english police the policemen as the free citizen of a free country are perfectly at liberty to have political opinions of their own they need not modify or conceal their sentiments when they take the blue coat and the glazed hat they are required to catch thieves as cats do mice some of them are ultra royalists others are ultra radicals generally speaking they are not by any means conservatives the majority of them belong to the poorer and less educated classes they take their political opinions from the radical weekly newspapers they club together as sailors cabmen and labourers do and take in their weekly paper which they read and discuss all the week through they quote their paper whenever they talk politics and this they do frequently for your london policeman is as zealous a dabbler in politics as any alehouse keeper in swabia adam smith founds his financial theories on the division of labor the division of labor is also the firm basis of the efficiency of the english police since they have not to perform all the functions which weigh on the shoulders of their helmeted and sabred brethren on the continent since they need not devote their attention to political conversations and movements in the case of individuals or of communities since they need not keep watch over and give an account of the movements and opinions of strangers and natives and since they have nothing whatever to do with the secrets of families the leaders of the daily papers nor with the unsealing and sealing of post-office letters they are at liberty to devote all their energy and ingenuity to the efficient discharge of those functions which are properly assigned to them 
it is not a fable nor a piece of english braggadocio when it is said that the thieves are more thoroughly hunted down in this immense city of london than they are in the smaller german capitals a foreigner who studies the police reports of the great london journals will find there ample matter for admiration and reflection we quote but one example to show the manner in which the various parts of the police machine work together the anecdote may possibly contain some useful hints for the guardians of constitutional towns a printer sends one of his men to the stationer to take in stock for the printing office it was late on a saturday afternoon and the manufacturer promised to have the paper in readiness early on monday the man to whom the message was entrusted and who brought back the answer was for some reason or other dismissed in the course of that very evening on the monday another messenger was sent for the paper he came back without it the paper had been taken away a few hours before he arrived at the stationer's no paper however had come to the printing office the greatest embarrassment prevailed a couple of hours passed and yet the paper does not arrive suspicion is at length directed to the man who had been discharged inquiries are made at the stationer's and the description of the person who came for the paper corresponds with the appearance of the suspected person upon this the printer proceeds to the police station to report the case what with waiting and sending about the better part of the day was gone mr m then makes his appearance in the inspector's office and proceeds to state his case but scarcely has he given his name when the inspector puts a stop to all further explanations you have been robbed mr m we know all about it the thief is in custody and the goods must by this time have been delivered at your office one ream of number two and two reams of number five are wanting but we know where to find them they shall be sent to you to-morrow good-bye sir mr m who like every englishman of the same stamp is in no wise to be surprised with anything that may happen between heaven and earth is nevertheless inclined to think this a strange case a very strange one indeed he pushes his hat back strikes his umbrella on the floor and turning on his heel he makes the best of his way home where he finds all right while all the devils are frantic with joy that the paper has been recovered and that toby who carried matters with such a high hand is after all nothing but a thief and sure to be transported the state of the case was simply this the man assisted by a friend had called for the paper put it into a cart and gone off the worthy pair sold a small quantity in a place where they had on similar occasions done a stroke of business and after this little matter had been settled to their entire satisfaction they drove off to a public-house at the distance of about five miles from the scene of their crime this public-house was situated in a very quiet street the cart and horse were left at the door while the two associates snugly ensconced in the parlour commenced enjoying the fruits of their robbery they had not been there very long before the policeman on duty became struck with the cart and its freight of paper he had been on that beat for many months past and knew that no printer bookbinder or stationer lived in the street the horse and cart were strangers to him so were the two men whom he saw in the parlour as he passed the window the whole thing had an ugly appearance he meets with one of the detectives and communicates his suspicions to that sagacious individual the two fellows utterly unconscious of the watch set on the movements produce more money than they could have earned in the course of a week they are taken into custody and brought up before the magistrate they cannot account for the possession of the paper and make a confession in full the policeman however must have been very sure of his case when he arrested them for in doing so he incurred a heavy responsibility if his suspicion had turned out to be unfounded he would have been mulcted in a heavy fine and possibly he might have lost his place now let us change the venue and suppose this affair had happened in paris vienna or berlin 
not only have the police of those capitals duties of greater importance than the mere catching of a couple of wretched thieves but it is also altogether absurd to believe that a policeman or sisterheitsmann should pay any attention to the fact of a cart and horse being stationed at the door of a pot-house such a thing is utterly impossible the policemen of vienna and berlin change their beats as soldiers do their posts possibly they know the street and the outsides of the houses they may also have some slight knowledge of the most disreputable dens and of those who habitually frequent them and in some instances they are au courant of the politics of a few honest tradesmen or citizens who are too harmless to make a secret of such matters the london policeman on the other hand knows every nook and corner every house man woman and child on his beat he knows their occupations habits and circumstances this knowledge he derives from his constantly being employed in the same quarter and the same street and too and surely a mind on duty bent may take great liberties with the conventional moralities that platonic and friendly intercourse which he carries on with the female servants of the establishments which it is his vocation to protect an english maid-servant is a pleasant girl to chat with when half shrouded by the mystic fog of the evening and with her smart little cap coquettishly placed on her head she issues from the sally-port of the kitchen and advances stealthily to the row of palisades which protect the house and the handsome policeman too with his blue coat and clean white gloves is held in high regard and esteem by the cooks and housemaids of england his position on his beat is analogous to that of a porter of a very large house it is a point of honour with him that nothing shall escape his observation this police honour constitutes the essential difference between the english and the continental police even the most liberal of politicians not a visionary must admit that it is impossible for a large town and still more impossible for a large state to exist without a well-organized protective force it matters little whether the force which ensures the citizens against theft and robbery as other associations ensure them against fire and hailstorms is kept up and directed by the state or whether it is maintained by private associations as has been proposed it is enough to refer to the fact that philanthropists of the cobden and burett stamp have found reasons as plenty as blackberries against standing armies of soldiers but they have never yet dared to deny the necessity of a standing army of policemen the police whenever and wherever it answers its original purpose is a most beneficent institution its unpopularity in all the states of the continent is chargeable not to the principles of the institution but to their perversion it is the perversion of the protective force into an instrument of oppression and aggression which the german hates at home but he has no aversion to the police as such even the maddest of the democratic refugees confess to great love and admiration for the police in england a man may like his cigar without entertaining a preposterous passion for nicotine the policeman no matter whether in a uniform or in plain clothes is a soldier of peace a sentinel on a neutral post and as such he is as much entitled to respect as the soldier who takes the field against a foreign invader this is the case in england the policeman is always ready to give his assistance and friendly advice the citizen is never brought into an embarrassing and disagreeable contact with the police and the natural consequence of this state of things is that the most friendly feelings exist between the policeman and the honest part of the population whenever the police have to interfere and want assistance the inhabitants are ready to support them for they know that the police never act without good reasons the detective police who act in secret do not stand on such an intimate footing with the public as the preventive part of the force but whenever they are in want of immediate assistance for the arrest of an offender the detective has but to proclaim his functions and no man not even the greatest man in the land would refuse to lend him assistance 
in germany and in france no one will associate with an agent of the secret police a mouchard or by whatever other name those persons may be called every one has an instinctive aversion to coming in contact with this species of animal for they are traitorous venomous and bloodthirsty and that such is the case is another proof of the vast superiority of the british institutions over those of the continent that london has not in the fullness of time come to be a vast den of thieves and murderers is mainly due to the action of the detective force here where the worst men of the european and american continents congregate the functions of a detective are not only laborious but also dangerous the semi-romantic ferocity of an italian bandit is sheer good nature if compared to the savage hardness and villainy of a london burglar the bandit plies his lawless trade in the merry greenwood and mossy dell he confesses to his priest and receives absolution for any peccadilloes in the way of stabbing he may have happened to commit on moonlit nights his head rests on the knees of the girl that loves him in spite of his cruel trade he is not altogether lost to the gentler feelings of humanity and in a great measure he wants the confounding hardening consciousness of having by his actions disgraced himself and his species but the london robber like a venomous reptile has his home in dark holes underground in hidden back rooms of dirty houses and on the gloomy banks of the thames he breaks into the houses as a wolf into a sheepfold and kills those who resist him and in many instances even those who offer no resistance there is no sun or forest green for him no priest gives him absolution the female that herds with him is in most cases even more ferocious and abandoned than himself and if he be father to a child he casts it at an early age into the muddy whirlpool of the town there to beg to steal and to perish the streets which skirt the banks of the thames are most horrible there the policeman does not saunter along on his beat with that easy and comfortable air which distinguishes him in the western parts of the town indeed in many instances they walk by twos and twos with dirks under their coats and rattles to call in the aid of their comrades many policemen and detectives who hunting on the track of some crime have ventured into these dens of infamy have disappeared and no trace has been left of them they fell as victims to the vengeance of some desperate criminal whom perhaps on a former occasion they had brought to justice and it would almost appear to be part of the haute politique of the london robbers that some policeman must be killed from time to time as a warning to his comrades the guild of assassins too have their theory of terrorism another remarkable fact is that the london policemen though their duty brings them constantly in contact with the very scum of the earth contract none of their habits of rudeness which appear to be an essential portion of the stock in trade of the continental police one should say that the force in england is recruited from a most meritorious class of society one in which patience gentleness and politeness are hereditary look there a fine strapping fellow crossing the street with a child in his arms the girl is trembling as an aspen leaf for she was just on the point of getting under a wheel that fine fellow has taken her up and now you see he crosses again and fetches the little girl's mother who stands bewildered with the danger and whom he conducts in safety to the opposite pavement who and what is that man his dress is decent and citizen-like and yet peculiar it differs from the dress of ordinary men coat and trousers of blue cloth a number and a letter embroidered on his collar a striped band and buckle on his arm a hat with oilskin top and white gloves rather a rarity in the dirty atmosphere of london that man is a policeman a well got up and improved edition of our own german politzideener those scarecrows with sticks sabres and other military accoutrements standing at the street corners of german capitals and spoiling the temper of honest men as well as of thieves 
it is however a mistake to believe as some persons on the continent actually do that the london police are altogether unarmed and at the mercy of every drunkard not only have they in many instances and quarters a dirk hidden under their greatcoats but they have also at all times a short club-like staff in their pockets this staff is produced on solemn occasions for instance on the occasion of public processions when every policeman holds his staff in his hand the staves have of late years been manufactured of gutta percha and made from this material they are lighter and more durable than wooden staves in the name of all that is smashing what a rich full sound does not such a gutta percha club produce when in quick succession it comes down on a human shoulder the sound is frequently heard by those who on saturday or monday night perambulate the poorer or more desolate quarters of the town when all respect for the constable's staff has been drowned in a deluge of gin matters on such occasions proceed frequently to the extremity of a duel the policeman like any civilian fights for his skin he gets a drubbing and returns it with interest but since his weapon does not give him so manifest an advantage as a sword would the public consider the fracas a fair fight and after all the combatants must appear before a magistrate in the police court they are on equal terms and witnesses are heard on either side there is no prejudice in favour of the policeman but stop look at the crowd in the street two policemen are busy with a poor ragged creature of a woman whom they carry to a doorway an accident perhaps nothing of the kind the woman is drunk and fell down in the road the policemen are taking her to a station where she may sleep till she is sober but it was a strange spectacle to see those two men in smart blue coats and white gloves rescuing the ragged woman from the mire of the street let us go on at temple bar there is a gordian knot of vehicles of every description three drays are jammed into one another one of the horses has slipped and fallen the traffic is stopped for a few minutes and this is a matter of importance at temple bar just look down fleet street the stoppage extends to ludgate hill but half a dozen policemen appear as if by enchantment one of them ranges the vehicles that proceed to the city in a line on the left side of the road a second lends a hand in unravelling the knot of horses a third takes his position in the next street and stops the carriages and cabs which if allowed to proceed would but contribute their quota to the confusion two policemen are busy with a horse which lies kicking in the road they unhook chains and unbuckle straps get the horse on its legs and assist the driver in putting him to rights again they have got dirty all over and they must moreover submit to hear from mr evans who stands on the pavement dignified with a broad-rimmed quaker hat that they are awkward fellows and know nothing whatever about the treatment of horses in another minute the whole street traffic is in full force the crowd vanishes as quickly and silently as it came the two policemen betake themselves to the next stop where the apprentice is called upon to brush their clothes the continental policeman is the torment of the stranger the london policeman is the stranger's friend if you are in search of an acquaintance and only know the street where he lives apply to the policeman on duty in that street and he will show you the house or at least assist you in your search if you lose your way turn to the first policeman you meet he will take charge of you and direct you if you would ride in an omnibus without being familiar with the goings and comings of these four-wheeled planets speak to a policeman and he will keep you by his side until the bus you want comes within hailing distance if you should happen to have an amicable dispute with a cabman and what stranger can escape that infliction you may confidently appeal to the arbitration of a policeman if in the course of your peregrinations you come to a steamboat wharf or a railway station or a theatre or some public institution and if you are at a loss how to proceed pray pour your sorrows into the sympathetic ear of the policeman he will direct yourself and baggage 
in a theatre he will assist you in the purchase of a ticket or at least tell you where to apply and how to proceed the london policeman is almost always kind and serviceable at night indeed as some say he is rather more rough-spoken than in the daytime and when you meet and address him in some solitary street he is reserved and treats you with something akin to suspicion whether or not this remark applies to the force generally we will not undertake to decide but it is quite natural that they should not be altogether at their ease in solitary or disreputable quarters and that their temper gets soured thereby a glass of brandy now and then may also contribute to produce the above effect but the english climate is damp the fog makes its home in the folds of the constable's greatcoat the rain runs from the oilskin cape which stands the policeman in the stead of an umbrella the wind is cold and bleak and we leave the policeman on his beat with the stranger's thanks and the stranger's gratitude End of chapter five part one chapter six of saunterings in and about london by max slesinger this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six newgate and its neighbourhood rivers underground division of labour executions the people's festivals predilection for criminal cases statistics of newgate paternoster row smithfield self-government its bright and dark sides london has besides the thames a great many smaller rivers the majority of which have for many years past been appropriated by the commissioners of sewers and the antiquarians in the olden days men went out of the way of rivers in our own time the rivers are compelled to give way to mankind they are vaulted and bridged over and houses have been built on the vaults or streets have been constructed over them and the grocer in the corner shop yonder has not the least suspicion of his house standing on a river and he never thinks of the lamentable condition of his goods in case the vault were to give way under him one of these rivers was the fleet river after it the street is named even at the present day the site of its bed is still marked by a broad valley street with considerable hills all built over on either side the hills are so steep that heavy drays and omnibuses cannot come down without locking this operation though insignificant furnishes an opportune illustration of the extent to which the principle of the division of labour has been carried in london just look at that lumbering omnibus thundering along at a sharp trot it has reached the brink when the horses are stopped for a second and at that very moment a fellow makes a rush at the omnibus bending his body almost under the wheels and moving forward with the vehicle which still proceeds he unhooks the drag and puts it to one of the hind wheels this done he calls out all right the horses sagacious creatures understand the meaning of that sentence as well as the driver they fall again into a sharp trot down the hill at the bottom there is another human creature making a neck or nothing rush at the wheels taking the drag off and hooking it on again all right the horses stamp the pavement to the flying about of sparks the driver makes a noise which is half a whistle and half a hiss and the omnibus rushes up the opposite bank of the quondam fleet river time is money is an english proverb and one whose validity is so strongly acknowledged that in many instances money is freely spent in order to effect a saving of time these two men save the omnibuses exactly one minute in each tour down holborn hill for one minute each of them would lose if they were to stop to put on the drag but one minute's loss to the many thousands who daily pass this way represents a considerable capital of time if the two men are remunerated at the rate of only one halfpenny per omnibus their incomes will be found to be larger than the salary of many a public functionary in germany this then is another specimen of industry and economy peculiar to london streets 
but let us say that it is possible only by means of the enormous traffic which crowds the streets of london we have meanwhile walked down the steep descent we have crossed the hidden stream walked up the hill on the other side and now we stand on a broad plateau where two large streets cross at right angles this conformation produces a considerable amount of space between the pavements a sort of irregular open square and one which from time to time presents a melancholy spectacle one of the street corners is taken up by the old newgate prison and the open place in front serves for the execution of felons who have been sentenced to death at the sessions and who in the first instance had been committed to newgate it is a shocking custom though it springs from the humane desire to shorten the agony which the criminal must suffer on his road from the prison to the scaffold our popular festivals said a lady who had been emancipated by a lengthened residence on the continent you wish to know where the people's merry-makings are held go to newgate on a hanging day or to horsemonger lane or to any other open space in front of a prison there you will find shouting and joking and junketing from early dawn until the hangman has made his appearance and performed his office the windows are let out stands are erected eating and drinking booths surround the scaffold there is an enormous consumption of beer and brandy they come on foot on horseback and in carriages from a distance of many miles to see a spectacle which is a disgrace to humanity and foremost are the women my countrywomen not only the females of low degree but also ladies by birth and education it is a shame but nevertheless it is true and our newspapers are afterwards compelled to chronicle the last death struggles of the wretched criminal there is no exaggeration in this a criminal process robbery and murder a case of poisoning these suffice to keep the families of england in breathless suspense for weeks at a time the daily and weekly papers cannot find space enough for all the details of the inquest the proceedings of the police the trial and the execution and woe to the paper that dared to curtail these interesting reports it would at once lose its supporters rather let such a paper take no notice of an insurrection in germany but neglect a criminal trial a scene on the scaffold never let us look into that room the father of the family his wife the old grandmother with her hands demurely folded and the daughter and little children are all crowded round the table the father reads the newspaper the family listens to him the tea is getting cold the fire is going out the curtains are still undrawn and the blinds are up the very passengers in the street oh tell it not in gath can see what is going on in the parlour but the listeners pay no attention to all this for the paper contains a full report of the trial of mrs manning or some other popular she assassin did she do the deed is she innocent did she make a confession and what about her husband and how is it done and when and where it is truly marvellous these good gentle people who would not willingly hurt or pain any living creature actually warm to the scenes of horror reported in that paper it is altogether incomprehensible how and to what extent this passion for the horrible has seized hold of the hearts of english men and women they languish after strong emotions they yearn for something which will make their flesh creep a similar phenomenon may occasionally be observed on the other side of the channel but there it forms the exception while here it is the rule and on the continent too we find this horror-mongering only in the provinces where people wearied with the monotony of their long winter evenings hunger and thirst after anything like a public scandal or spectacle but we do not find this sort of thing in large towns where people have a variety of objects and incidents to attract their attention but the english on the continent make long journeys to be present at an execution their passion accompanies them even across the channel surely we do not envy their feelings in this respect 
newgate is a gloomy-looking ancient building it is the beau ideal of prison architecture with hardly any windows with here and there an empty niche or some dilapidated carvings all besides is gloomy stony and cold newgate has gone down in the world in its early years it was devoted to the reception of persons of high rank it has since submitted to the principle of legal equality and rich and poor high and low pass through its gates to freedom or the scaffold about three thousand prisoners are annually confined within its walls the prison can accommodate five hundred at a time and this number is usually found there immediately before the commencement of the sessions but the sessions of the central criminal court once over newgate is almost empty for some of its inmates have been discharged from custody while the majority of them have received their sentence and taken their departure for sundry houses of detention and correction the prisoners in newgate are at liberty to communicate with one another they are not compelled to work we pass through newgate street and turn to the right into paternoster row a narrow street from times immemorial the manufactory of learning where the publishing trade is carried on in dingy houses and where it runs its anarchical career without the benefit of a censor from times immemorial that is a hasty expression there was a time when paternoster row harboured the grocery trade of the city while the upper stories were taken by marchand de mode and visited by all the beauty and elegance of old london but gaiety had to give way to religion and the marchand de mode taking flight to more modern streets were followed by the rosary girls under henry the eighth luther's translation of the bible was publicly burnt in this neighbourhood and soon after warrants were issued against those who had burnt it so varied have been the applications of this narrow dusky lane in which to this day the traveller may read an inscription on a stone tablet announcing that paternoster row is the highest point of ancient london in our own days this street is to london what leipzig is to germany the departments of the publishing trade are however kept more strictly separate the publishers of bibles who send forth the scriptures in volumes of all sizes from the smallest to the largest and who do business in all the civilized and barbarous languages on the face of the earth exclude all vain and secular literature such as tales novels plays poems and works of history while the publishers of such like works in their turn generally fight shy of tourists and travellers whose works belong to departments of another class of publishing firms juvenile books form a very important department of the publishing trade and this department like the infant schools is entirely devoted to the instruction and amusement of the rising generation so strenuous are the exertions of those publishers to entice the babies and infants of england into the treacherous corners of the a b c and of the higher sciences that their solicitude in this respect appears almost touching to those who fancy that all this trouble is taken and all this ingenuity expended purely and simply for the interest of philanthropy and of good sound education we ought not to stop too long in paternoster row our presence is required elsewhere but still we must for the benefit of german mothers and publishers state the fact that of late years the publishers of paternoster row have hit upon the plan of printing the rudiments of all human science on strong white canvas english children in the dawn of their young existence are as essentially practical as german children they have an instinctive aversion to all printed matter the a b c is to them the first fruit from the tree of knowledge the key to the mysteries and woes of life therefore do the children of england detest the primers they soil them tear them roll the leaves in short treat them with as much scorn and contumely as though the annihilation of a single copy would lead to the extinction of the whole species the practical spirit of english speculation meets this prejudice on its own ground the primers or a b c books as they are called in germany are printed on canvas and each leaf is moreover hemmed for all the world like a respectable domestic pocket-handkerchief 
for children are sagacious and but for the hemming the rudiments of science would under their hands be converted into lint as it is even the most obstreperous of little boys is powerless in the presence of such a canvas book and supposing he be uncommonly obstinate and that after great exertion he succeeds in running his finger through one of the leaves even then he is foiled for his mother darns it as she would an old stocking and the monster book appears again as clean and immaculate as a diplomatic note and the upshot of the affair is that poor little boy must go without the usual allowance of sunday pudding london is the greatest market for books in the world not only does it supply england but also asia africa australia and those island colonies of the great ocean in which english daring and english enterprise have established the anglo-saxon race and with it the english language about fifteen thousand persons are employed in the printing binding and in the sale of books their mechanical aids and machinery have been brought to an astounding height of perfection and an edition of a thousand copies in octavo requires but ten or twelve hours for the binding but when you consider those bony broad-shouldered firm-looking englishmen you understand at once that such men could not live on literature alone paternoster row the centre of the book trade carries on its existence in modest retirement amidst a conglomeration of large and small streets but to the north there is the provoking broad impertinent extent of old smithfield the notorious cattle market of london the greatest cattle market in the world the dirtiest of all the dirty spots which disgrace the fair face of the capital of england this immense open space or more properly speaking this immense conglomeration of a great many small open spaces with its broad open street market is covered all over with wooden compartments and pens such as are usual on the sheep farms of the continent each of these pens is large enough to accommodate a moderate sized statue each of them must on mondays and fridays accommodate an ox and a certain number of cattle pigs or sheep if by a miracle all these wretched animals were converted into marble or bronze surely after thousands of years the nations of the earth would journey to smithfield to study the character of this our time in that vast field of monuments but since such a poetical transformation has not taken place the appearance of that quarter of the town is curious but not agreeable surrounded by dirty streets lanes courts and alleys the haunts of poverty and crime smithfield is infested not only with fierce and savage cattle but also with the still fiercer and more savage tribes of drivers and butchers on market days the passengers are in danger of being run over trampled down or tossed up by the drivers or beasts at night rapine and murder prowl in the lanes and alleys in the vicinity and the police have more trouble with this part of town than with the whole of brompton kensington and bayswater the crowding of cattle in the centre of the town is an inexhaustible source of accidents men are run down women are tossed children are trampled to death but these men women and children belong to the lower classes persons of rank or wealth do not generally come to smithfield early in the morning if indeed they ever come there at all the child is buried on the following sunday when its parents are free from work the man is taken to the apothecary's shop close by where the needful is done to his wound the woman applies to some female quack for a plaister and if she is in good luck she gets another plaister in the shape of a glass of gin from the owner of the cattle the press takes notice of the accidents people read the paragraph and are shocked and the whole affair is forgotten even before the next market day for years smithfield has been denounced by the press and in parliament the tories came in and went out so did the whigs but neither of the two great political parties could be induced to set their faces against the nuisance the autonomy of the city moreover deprecated anything like government intervention for smithfield is a rich source of revenue the market dues the public-house rents and the traffic generally represent a heavy sum 
in the last year only the lords and commons of england have pronounced the doom of smithfield the cattle market is to be abolished but when that is the question for its protectors are sure to come forward with claims of indemnity and other means of temporization and the choice of a fitting locality on the outskirts of the town will most likely take some years for we ought not to forget that in england everything moves slowly with the exception of machinery and steam smithfield and its history are instances of the many dark sides of self-government for self-government has its dark sides commendable though it be as the basis of free institutions it is to the self-government of every community of every parish and of every association that england is indebted for her justly envied industrial political and commercial greatness but self-government is the cause of many great and useful undertakings proceeding but slowly and in many instances succumbing to the assaults of hostile and vested interests the government indeed attempts to combat all nuisances by mooting and fostering a variety of agitations in germany it wants but a line from a minister to eradicate small evils or introduce signal improvements in england the same matters must be dealt with in a tender and cautious manner it takes a score or so of years of agitation until parliament yielding to public opinion passes its vote for the improvement or against the nuisance great joy there would be in london if smithfield as sodom of old were consumed with fire but the whole of london would have been urged to resistance if the government had presumed on its own responsibility to interfere with smithfield is this prejudice or political wisdom on which side is the greater good and on which the worse evil the present happy condition of england has long since answered the question in favour of self-government if ever there was a question on this point it has long been settled in the hearts and minds of all continental nations if they were to act according to their inclinations i am positive they would go and do so likewise End of chapter 6one chapter seven of saunterings in and about london by max slesinger this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven street life the post office london and the ocean how you may attack the reputation of either the metropolis en negligé the post office the modern letter writer money orders penny stamps their use and abuse john bull and the chancellor of the exchequer how mr bull imposes upon that respectable functionary what is a newspaper the great hall of the post office at six p m did you ever see the ocean said i some time ago to a vienna friend as by accident we met in cheapside not far from the spot where from newgate street the passenger turns off to the bank there is a crossing of some of the most crowded streets we stood on the pavement waiting for an opportunity or a stoppage among the vehicles to make a rush to the opposite side well said i did you ever see the ocean in a way replied my countryman producing a cigar and in a moment a match seller was by his side offering his inflammable wares in a manner repeated my countryman as he lit his cigar of course i did not come by land from st stephen's place in old vienna i did cross a piece of salt water as far as i can remember but that confounded seasickness got hold of my stomach and made me blind to the marvels of the ocean and between you and me i can't say i was much taken with what i could see i've read a deal about the sea the wide and open sea and all its glories but it's all humbug that's what it is or if you would rather it's poetic fancy water after all is but water and as for the sharks you can't see em there wasn't even such a thing as a storm the lakes of ischel are quite as green as the channel and perhaps a shade greener and last year when i was on the platten lake on my honour i could not see to the opposite shore 
water after all is but water and a few miles more or less make no difference that i can see besides you only see a certain portion that's my opinion oh good and honest viennese i stopped my countryman who was just taking a desperate leap into the road no doubt he would have reached the opposite pavement in safety but i stopped him for i wanted a pretence for shaking hands with him a berlin man would never have deigned to declare that the ocean is a humbug even though he had never gone beyond the bridge of the spray or hobble river in potsdam humbug has no existence for the real berlin man who has been reared in the superlative and besides how can a berliner with all his contempt for authority ever plead guilty to considering an important phenomenon one which has been established ever since the days of the great elector with less poesy than henry heine and with less interest than alexander von humboldt a berliner would certainly have held forth on the absolute idea or the relative nothing or the subjective view of space even though he never felt anything like the meaning of those hard words and even if within his secret heart he had thought exactly as the viennese did before he got seasick there are things which a berliner would rather die than say in public but my readers are justly entitled to ask what could induce me to connect cheapside with the first impression which a continental mind receives of the sea the association of the two ideas is not by any means so absurd as some very sapient germans may think the first impressions which london makes on the stranger's mind are similar to his first impressions of the sea they are not overwhelming a town after all is but a town that's what my viennese friend would say there are as fine houses in vienna and berlin and some are more imposing brewers drays foot passengers cabs omnibuses and policemen we have them all a town after all is but a town a few miles more or less make no difference you can't see it all at once but it so happens that my countryman thanks to the intervention of some friends gets a place as engineer at folkestone between ourselves he is a refugee but what german of our days is not a refugee or likely to be one the germans are a nation of traitors just now therefore no offence now my friend passes his leisure hours on the beach he looks at the dark waters and the white spray and the waves which break at his feet the waves come and go and keep coming and going alternately large and small fast and slow at one point they shoot smoothly over the yellow sand at another they break with a thundering motion against the granite blocks of the jetty flinging their spray over the stone parapet and where my friend sits the waves wash up shells and curious stones and strange seaweed and withered leaves of submarine plants and shrubs and the tides turn coming in and going out and the demon of the storm disports itself in the blackened air the sea is dark and seething and the fishing boats with their masts creaking and groaning hasten up and down the waves to the gates of the harbour the water in the very harbour is moved to and fro in violent convulsions monster clouds fringed with lightish grey are driven landwards day and night are confounded in the gloomy tints of the ocean which groans and raves and engulfs its victims until its strength is exhausted and the moon breaks through the clouds preaching peace with her pallid demure face and the waves are converted by the sentimental saint and again rush playfully along the sand of the beach and again they wash shells and curious stones and strange seaweed and withered leaves of submarine plants to the feet of my friend who overwhelmed with the spectacle sits staring on vacancy but you are quite wet and really you look very sentimental my dear countryman from the banks of the danube water after all is but water i hope you haven't seen a shark the lakes of ischel are just as green as the sea and perhaps a shade greener a few miles more or less what does it matter a good deal of humbug about it isn't there you are malicious doctor on my honour very malicious one ought to look at that pool for a year or so to know what it really is p 
pilgrim from the land of passports when you come to this giant town in which traffic built its living dikes in every street then do not in the name of all that is candid be ashamed to appear for three days at least as an unfeeling callous creature make no secret of your thoughts a few houses more or less cannot make an impression on a truly reasonable man but friend stranger stand for an hour or two leaning against the iron gate of bow church cheapside or take up your position on the steps of the royal exchange do as my countryman does in lonely folkestone let the waves of the great city rush past you now murmuringly now thunderingly now fast now slow as crowds press on crowds and vehicles on vehicles as the streams of traffic break against every street corner and spread through the arterial system of the lanes and alleys as the knot of men horses and vehicles get entangled almost at every point where the large streets join and cross to move and heave and spin round and get disentangled again and again entangled after such a review only can you realize the idea of the greatness of london it is said of a stranger who came to london for the first time and took his quarters in one of the most crowded city streets that he remained standing at the door the whole of the first day of his london existence because he waited until the crowd had gone a man who would do that ought to rise and go to bed with the owl it is this which after a prolonged stay in london so moves our admiration that there is no stop no rest no pause in the street life throughout the busy day in smaller towns too there are occasions or times when the streets are crowded in the extreme the trottoirs of the parish boulevards are charming places and on a beautiful evening they are as crowded and even more so than the pavements of the london streets but the crowding on the paris trottoirs lasts a few hours only during the usual promenade time london street life is not bound to time it is not confined within the narrow limits of a few hours indeed there is not a single hour in the four-and-twenty in which any one of the principal london streets can be said to be deserted for when the denizens of the far west retire to rest at that very hour does the street life dawn in the business quarters of the east early in the morning before the chimneys of the houses and factories of the railway engines and steamers have had time to fill the air with smoke london presents a peculiar spectacle it looks clean the houses have a pleasing appearance the morning sun gilds the muddy pool of the thames the arches and pillars of the bridges look lighter and less awkward than in the daytime and the public in the street too are very different from the passengers that crowd them at a later hour slowly and with a hollow rumbling sound do the sweeping machines travel down the street in files of twos and threes to take off every article of dust and offal the market gardeners carts and wagons come next they proceed at a brisk trot to arrive in time for the early purchasers after them the coal wagons and brewers drays which only at certain hours are permitted to unload in the principal streets of the city at the same time the light two-wheeled carts of the butchers fishmongers and hotel keepers rattle along at a slapping pace for their owners sharp men of business would be the first in the market to choose the best and purchase at a low price here and there a trap is opened in the pavement and dirty men ascend from the regions below they are workmen to whose care is committed the city underground which they build repair and keep in good order damaged gas and water pipes too are being repaired and the workmen make all possible haste to replace the paving stones and leave the road in a passable condition for the sun mounts in the sky and their time is up they return to their lairs and go to sleep just as the rest of the town awakens to the labours of the day besides these there are a great many other classes whose avocations compel them to take to the street by break of day at a very early hour they appear singly or in small knots with long white clay pipes in their mouths as the day advances they come in troops marching to their work in docks and warehouses 
ill-tempered looking sleepy-faced barmen take down the shutters of the gin shops cabs loaded with portmanteaus and bandboxes hasten to deposit their occupants at the various railway stations horsemen gallop along eager for an early country ride from minute to minute there is an increase of life and activity at length the shops the windows and the doors of houses are opened omnibuses come in from the suburbs and land their living freight in the heart of the city the pavements are crowded with busy people and the road is literally crowded with vehicles of every description it is day and the hour is ten a m long before this hundreds of high chimney towers have belched forth their volumes of thick black smoke and that smoke obscures the horizon with long streaks of black smut and mixes and becomes more dense as the millions of chimneys on the housetops contribute their quota until a dusky atmosphere is formed which intercepts the rays of the sun such is london by day that is the enormous city with her deep grey robe of smoke and fog which she spins afresh every morning and silently unravels during the hours of the night that she may as penelope of old keep idlers and courtiers away from her gates we are still at the point where newgate street opens into cheapside it would almost seem as if the whirlpool of human beings that turn about in that locality had made us giddy for our thoughts take their wayward flight across the thames up to the clouds and through the gully holes into the recesses of the city underground we ought now to proceed on terra firma and with this laudable resolution we turn to the left and stop in front of the post office at st martin's le grand the existing arrangements of the english post office and the penny postage which in eighteen forty was introduced by rowland hill have proved so excellent in their results that the majority of continental states have been induced to approximate their institutions to mr hill's principle men of business and post office clerks are not yet satisfied they desire a system of cheap international postage and it is devoutly to be hoped that those pious wishes will in the end be gratified but the majority of the continental governments hesitate before they commit themselves to an experiment which in the most favourable case only promises a future increase of revenue while in every case it is certain to entail losses on the present in england however the experiment has been made and the system works well and pays and the arrangements of the post office have been brought to a degree of perfection unknown even to the wildest dreams of the boldest political economist of the last century with the general penny postage for england scotland ireland and the channel islands with a regular rapid and frequent transmission of the mails from and to the provinces there is moreover an admirable system adopted for the distribution of letters throughout the metropolis london is divided into two postal districts one of them embraces the area within three miles from the chief office at st martin's le grand the second district includes those parts of the town which lie beyond the three miles circle the postage of course is the same for either district but the difference lies in the number of deliveries in the inner circle there are not less than ten deliveries a day the construction of the houses contributes much to the efficiency of the system the postman's functions are here much easier than those of his continental colleague he is not required to go up and down stairs he gives his double knock and as the majority of letters are inland letters and as such prepaid no time is lost with paying and giving change the frequency of letter-boxes at the house doors tends still more to simplify the proceeding at the time of the great exhibition these letter-boxes gave occasion to many a comical mistake many of our continental friends entrusted their correspondence to the keeping of private boxes under the erroneous presumption that every door slit with letters over it stood in some mysterious connection with the general post office but when once properly understood the practical advantages of these private letter-boxes were so apparent that they moved all our stranger friends to the most joyful admiration the system however is nothing without the prepayment of letters without the english style of buildings 
and the english domestic arrangements according to which each family inhabits its own house the south german system of crowding many families into one large house and dividing even flats into separate lodgings places insuperable difficulties in the way of such arrangement even if the germans generally could be induced to prepay their letters and the paris fashion of delivering all the letters at the porter's lodge is disagreeable even for those who are not engaged in treasonable correspondence and who have no reason or desire to elude the vigilance of the police after all roland hill's system of cheap postage is one of the best practical jokes that was ever perpetrated by an englishman this famous cheapness is nothing but a snare for the unwary for the especial gratification of the postmaster-general and the chancellor of the exchequer in no other country is there so much money expended on postage as in england a letter is only one penny and what is a penny the infinitesimal fraction of that power which men call capital that miraculous nothing out of which the world was made and out of which some very odd fellows managed to make large fortunes as it may be well and truly read in juvenile books of first-class morality but what londoner can condescend to establish his household arrangements on the decimal system or on the theory of miracles consequently he writes short letters to his cousins and nieces across the way and to all his near and dear relations in yorkshire and in the shetland islands it is an incontestable fact that englishmen spend more money in postage than the citizens of any other country and how cleverly does the post office contrive to facilitate the means of correspondence besides the large branch offices there are above five hundred receiving houses in london all of them established in small shops to induce you to enter and that you may have no trouble in finding them a small board with a hand and the words post office is affixed to the nearest lamp post so that you need only look at the lamp bang bang so that you need only look at the lamp posts to find the place for the reception of your letters how simple and how practical but there is more behind many a man thinks it is too great a tax upon his time and patience to put the penny stamp on the envelope the postmaster-general steps in and saves him the trouble he manufactures envelopes with the queen's head printed on them and he sells them a penny apiece so that you have the envelope gratis they are gummed too and do not want sealing you have nothing to do but to write your letter put it into the envelope and post it at the receiving house over the way or round the corner these are some of the sly tricks on which the post office thrives so that with its expenditure exceeding one million sterling it manages to hand over a large sum of surplus receipts to the chancellor of the exchequer nor ought it to be supposed that having attained so high a degree of perfection the english postal administration reclines on its laurels no it strains every nerve to effect further improvements and it has to deal with a public fully competent to understand its merits and disposed to value them the greatest praise of a public institution is to be found not in the eulogies of the press but in the readiness of the public to avail themselves of the advantages that institution offers and the improvement and facilities it effects and the english do this readily and joyfully whenever their practical common sense becomes alive to the usefulness of the innovation in this respect and in many others the english government is in a more favourable position than the continental governments its dealings are with a great and generous nation great ideas find a great public in england that is the reason why the continental estimates of men and affairs appear so small compared to the one which the english are in the habit of applying particularly with respect to creating facilities to traffic the government may venture on almost any experiment the public support every scheme of the kind and the public support makes it pay take for instance the system of money orders which was introduced a few years back small sums under five pounds are to be sent 
and in spite of the enormous difficulties and expenses which the scheme had to encounter in its commencement it is more firmly establishing from day to day its popularity is on the increase and above eight million pounds was in the year eighteen fifty one transmitted in this manner let us now see how the post office deals with books pamphlets and newspapers political papers which publish news says the act for that purpose made and provided political journals according to the continental mode of expression pass from province to province free of postage with only a small sum for transmission to the colonies that is to say to the cape and the antipodes the penny stamp which each copy of a political journal is required to have franks it throughout the whole of great britain and ireland not once but several times a letter stamp is blackened over at the post office to prevent its being used again but the newspaper stamp has nothing to fear from the postmaster's blacking apparatus i read my copy of the times in the morning and am at liberty to send it to a friend say to greenwich that friend sends the same copy to another friend say at glasgow edinburgh or dublin and the same copy after various peregrinations through country post offices and out-of-the-way villages finds its way back to london to the shop of a dealer in waste paper no charge is made by the post office for these manifold transmissions and thus it happens that friends conspire together to defraud the post office and that information finds its way from one end of the kingdom to another without any advantage to the public purse i will quote an example of a trick which is still popular with many english families suppose a husband and father has reason to expect an addition to his family circle his friends and relations are desirous to be informed of the event as soon as it shall have come off but letters however short take time to write and after all it's a pity to pay so many pence for postage and children too are very expensive creatures the matter has been arranged beforehand an old copy of the times is sent if the little stranger turns out a boy if a girl the father sends a copy of the herald the child is born and the papers are posted letters of congratulation follow in due time her majesty has gained another subject but the exchequer has lost a few pence this method has not much political morality to recommend it but it weighs very lightly on an englishman's conscience since the proceeding after all is not downright illegal the chancellor of the exchequer and i says john bull are on the best terms he cheats me whenever he can he makes me pay in every conceivable manner he taxes my wine my tea the sunlight my horse my land and my carriage he is always at it and he squeezes me as i would an orange that's his right and that's why he is chancellor of the exchequer how else could he manage to pay the interest on the national debt and the army and navy estimates and all the sundries we the nation are the state and that's why we ought to pay but in return the right honourable gentleman must give us leave to cheat him whenever as it will happen with the sharpest of financiers his financial laws want a clause or two and thus favour the operation horses above a certain size are taxed to such and such an extent says he very well say i but i move heaven and earth to produce horses under that size and avoid paying the tax carriages with wheels above twenty-one inches in diameter are taxed very well i get a small carriage made one which suits the size of my pony newspaper advertisements pay a duty of eighteen pence well and good i advertise the birth of my child by means of an old copy of the times that's fair dealing which none can find fault with the chancellor of the exchequer and i know what we are about we are a couple of sly ones john bull after all pays for everything but he fights for his money to the best of his abilities of course thus reasons the englishman whom the germans love to consider as an adorer of the law the difference between the english adoration and the german contempt of the law may be found in the fact that an englishman takes a delight in outwitting the law if it can be done in a loyal and honest manner 
the german believes he is justified in ignoring the law since it was imposed upon him without his consent in other words the subject of an absolute government does not think the laws except the laws of nature and morality to be binding because such laws were imposed by superior force the citizen of a free country respects every law because it presupposes an agreement to which he has either indirectly or directly assented but let us return to the post office though the newspaper stamp franks the journals throughout england still it has not been thought advisable to extend the privilege to the postal district within three miles from st martin's le grand all journals posted within that circle must have an additional penny stamp my copy of the times goes free to dublin but if i address it to a friend in the next street it pays the postage but for this salutary regulation all the news vendors would post their papers and the post office would want the means of conveyance and delivery for the loads of printed matter which in such a case would find their way into the chief office the advantages of the newspaper stamp are however large enough to induce its being solicited by papers that are not by law compelled to take it punch for instance is not considered a political paper to find out the reason why is a task i leave to the principal secretaries of state of her britannic majesty the whole of england is agreed on the point that there is much more sound policy in the old fellow's humped back than can be found in the heads of the privy council and many an agitator in search of an ally would prefer toby to the iron duke punch then consults his own convenience and takes or refuses the stamp according to circumstances and as punch does so do many other papers whom the law considers as unpolitical we turn again to the general post office it is a grand and majestic structure with colossal columns in the pure greek style and with an air of classic antiquity derived from the london atmosphere of fog and smoke it is easy to raise antique structures in london for the rain and the coals assist the architect hence those imposing tents how happy would the berliners be if messrs fox and henderson instead of constructing waterworks could undertake to blacken the town and give it an antique old established instead of its parvenu and stuck-up appearance they are sadly in want of london smoke and of some other english institutions which i cannot for the sake of my own safety venture to specify those who are not awed by the architectural beauties of the london post office should enter and take a stroll down those roomy high walls where on either side there are numbers of office windows and little tablets how small are in the presence of those tablets all the ideas which continentals form of a large central post office they are so many signposts and direct you to all the quarters of the world to the east and west indies to australia china the canary islands the cape canada etc every part of the globe has its own letter-box and the stranger who about six o'clock p m enters these halls or takes up his post of observation near the great city branch office in lombard street would almost deem that all the nations of the world were rushing in through the gates and as if this were the last day for the reception and transmission of letters breathless come the bankers clerks rushing in just before the closing hour they open their parcels and drop their letters into the various compartments there are messengers groaning under the weight of heavy sacks which they empty into a vast gulf in the flooring they come from the offices of the great journals and the papers themselves are sorted by the post office clerks here and there among this crowd of business people you are struck with the half comfortable half nervous bearing of a citizen just now an old gentleman with steel spectacles hurries by casting an anxious look at the clock lest he be too late probably he wishes to post a paternal epistle to his son who is on a fishing excursion in switzerland and the letter is important for in it the son is adjured not by any means to discontinue wearing a flannel under jacket or an old lady has to post a letter to her granddaughter at school in the country about the apple pudding for which the granddaughter sent her the recipe 
and what a capital pudding it was and that the school must be a first-rate school to be sure and lo just as the clock strikes a fair-haired and chaste englishwoman with a thick blue veil makes her way to one of the compartments and drops a letter thank goodness she is in time heaven knows how sorry the poor lad would have been if that letter had not reached him in due course for an english lover they say is often in a hanging mood especially in november when the fogs are densest now the wooden doors are closed the hall is empty as if by magic and the tall columns throw their lengthened shadows on the stone flooring this is the most arduous period of the day for the clerks within all that heap of letters and newspapers which has accumulated in the course of the day is to be sorted stamped and packed in time for the various mail trains clerks servants sorters and messengers hurry to and fro in the subterraneous passage between the two wings of the building clerks suspended by ropes mount up to the ceiling and take down the parcels which in the course of the day were deposited on high shelves and the large red carts come rattling in receive their load of bags and rattle off to the various stations the rooms are getting empty the clerks have got through their work the gas is put out and silence and darkness reign supreme here and there only in some little room a clerk may be seen busy with accounts and long lists of places and figures when he retires to rest the work of the day has already commenced in the other offices in this building business is going on at all hours of the day and night the loss of a minute would be felt by thousands at a distance of thousands of miles hence does it happen that at no time is there a want of complaints about the post-office clerks and postmasters while the officials in their turn complain of the carelessness and negligence of the public the public's grievances find their way into the journals in a letter to the editor the sorrows of the post-office clerks obtain a less amount of publicity but they may be observed on the walls of the great hall where daily there is a list of misdirected letters which have cost the postman a deal of trouble directions such as to mr robinson in america or to miss henrietta hobson just by the church in london however rich some may think these are not by any means rare and such small mistakes i dare say will happen in other countries besides england wherever there are simple-minded people who put their trust in providence and the royal post office in germany where every man woman and child is registered by the police the postman may as a last resort apply to that omniscient institution but in england where the chief commissioner of the police is so abandoned as to be actually ignorant of the whereabouts of honest and decent citizens the post office is deprived even of this last resource the case would be pitiable in the extreme but for the comfortable reflection that in england the police do not interfere with the post the convenience on the other hand is by far greater than the inconvenience on the other End of chapter 7part one chapter eight of saunterings in and about london by max slesinger this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight sunlight moonlight gaslight the sun and the londoners mysteries of the fog harvest moons gas how the climate works flannels english dinners and french theatricals current phrases fashionable novelists no matter whether their productions end with marriage or suicide devote their first chapters to geographical and ethnographical accounts of the country or province in which they lay their plots scientific travellers devote the first pages of their heavy and immortal works to the respective telluria and astronomic peculiarities of the country they propose to describe to my sincere regret i have not in my unsystematic wanderings through london been able to follow so laudable an example 
for it requires a long residence and a good deal of careful observation to understand the whims of the london celestial bodies their goings and comings and their influence on vegetable and animal life on the strata of the atmosphere and of mankind since lot's wife was turned into a pillar of salt and lola montez into a countess of lansfeld there has not as far as i know been any female being so much abused as the london sun footnote the sun Dizona, is feminine in german End note. but the reasons of such abuse are diametrically opposed the two first-named ladies were found fault with because they saw too much of the world while the london sun is justly charged with a want of curiosity it turns its back upon the wealthiest city in christendom and in the presence of the most splendid capital of europe it insists on remaining veiled in steam fog and smoke the london sun like unto german liberty exists in the minds of the people who have faith in either and believe that either might be bright dazzling and glorious were it not for the intervention of a dark ugly fog between the upper and nether regions it happens just now that we have not seen the sun for the last three weeks but for the aid of astronomy which tells us that the sun is still in its old place we might be tempted to believe that it had gone out of town for the long vacation or that it had been adjourned by some continental constitutional government or that it was being kept in a german capital waiting for the birthday of the reigning prince when it must come out in a blaze for this i understand has been the sun's duty from time immemorial a three weeks absence of the sun would make a great stir in any other town the catholics would trace its cause to the infidelity of the age the protestants would demonstrate that the sun had been scared away by certain late acts of papal aggression and the jews would lament and ask how is it possible the sun can shine when the bank raises its rate of discount but the londoners care as little for a month of chiaro obscuro as the laplanders do they are used to it twice in the course of the last week for an essayist on astronomical matters ought to be conscientious twice did the sun appear for a few minutes it was late in the afternoon and it looked out from the west just above regent's park where the largest menagerie in the world may be seen for one shilling and on mondays for sixpence all the animals from the hippopotamus down to the beaver left their huts where they were at vespers and stared at the sun and wished it good morning it was a solemn moment an impertinent monkey alone shaded his eyes with his hands and asked the sun where it came from and whether there was not some mistake somewhere and the sun blushed and hid its face behind a big cloud the monkey laughed and jeered and the tigers roared and the turtle doves said such conduct was shocking and altogether ungentlemanly the owl alone was happy and said it was for it had been almost blind during the last five minutes and that as he said was a thing it had not been used to in london but whatever ill-natured remarks we and others may make on the london sun they apply only to the winter months may and september shame us into silence in those months the sun in london is as lovely genial and i must go through the length of a trope sunny as elsewhere in germany with this difference only that it is not so glowing not so consistent in the country too it comes out in full broad and traditional glory its favourite spots are in the south of england bristol bath hastings and the isle of wight in those favoured regions the mild breeze of summer blows even late in the year the hedges and trees stand resplendent with the freshness of their foliage the meadows are green and lovely to behold the butterflies hover over the blossoms of the honeysuckle the cedar from lebanon grows there and thrives and myrtles and fuchsias hortensias and roses and passion flowers surround the charming villas on the seashore village churches are covered with ivy up to the very roof 
gigantic fern moves in the sea breeze the birds sing in the branches of the wild laurel tree cattle and sheep graze on the downs and grown-up persons and children bathe in the open sea while the german rivers are sending down their first shoals of ice and dense fogs welter in the streets of london here is one of the vulgar errors and popular delusions of the continent people confound the climate of london with the climate of england they talk of the isles of mist in the west of europe a very poetical idea that but as untrue as poetical many parts of these islands are as clear and sunny as any of the inland countries of the continent the winter fogs of london are indeed awful they surpass all imagining he who never saw them can form no idea of what they are he who knows how powerfully they affect the minds and tempers of men can understand the prevalence of that national disease the spleen in a fog the air is hardly fit for breathing it is grey-yellow of a deep orange and even black at the same time it is moist thick full of bad smells and choking the fog appears now and then slowly like a melodramatic ghost and sometimes it sweeps over the town as the simoom over the desert at times it is spread with equal density over the whole of that ocean of houses on other occasions it meets with some invisible obstacle and rolls itself into intensely dense masses from which the passengers come forth in the manner of the student who came out of the cloud to astonish dr faust it is hardly necessary to mention that the fog is worst in those parts of the town which are near the thames when the sun has set in london the curious in this respect will do well to consult the almanac and when the weather is tolerably clear the moon appears to govern the night the moon is a more regular guest in london than the sun and the example of these celestial bodies is followed by the great journals the issue of the evening papers being much more regular than that of the morning papers the london moon is after all not very different from the moon in germany it is quite as pale and romantic it is the confidant of lovesick maidens and adventurous pickpockets traveller from the continent enjoy the london moon with method and reason if heaven favoured you by sending you into the street on a beautiful splendid transparent moonlit night in which the shades of ossian and mignon sit by the rivers or under the lime trees while all the poetry you smuggled from your native land awakes in your heart traveller if such good fortune is yours why then the best thing you can do is to go to the italian opera for the moonlit nights of this country are as treacherous as its politics they seem all calm and peaceful but they are rife with colds and ague they are most beautiful but also most dangerous every englishman will tell you as much and advise you to increase your stock of flannel in proportion to the beauty of the night most regular and reliable is a third medium for the lighting up of london the gas the sun and moon may be behind their time but the gas is always at its post and in winter it happens sometimes that it does service all day long its only drawback is that it cannot be had gratis like the light from the sun moon and stars but the same inconveniences attend the gas on the continent and after all it is cheaper in england than anywhere else the germans are mere tyros in the consumption of gas the stairs of every decent london house have generally quite as much light as a german shop and the london shops are more strongly lighted up than the german theatres butchers and such like tradesmen especially in the smaller streets burn the gas from one-inch tubes that john bull in purchasing his piece of mutton or beef may see each vein each sinew and each lump of fat the smaller streets and the markets are literally inundated with gaslight especially on saturday evenings no city on the continent offers such a sight in the apothecary shops the light is placed at the back of gigantic glass bottles filled with coloured liquid so that from a distance you see it in the most magnificent colour 
the arrangement is convenient for those who are in search of such a shop and it gives the long and broad streets of london a strange and picturesque appearance we have said so much of the climate that it is high time to add a few words about its results what then are the effects of the london winters of the gloomy foggy days the cold rainy nights and of the changeable english weather the continent knows those results partly from hearsay they manifest themselves in the character in the ways the dress and the social arrangement of the english the british isles rear a strong healthy race of men and women beyond any other country in europe the lower classes have muscles and sinews which enable them to rival their cattle in feats of strength the women are stately and tall the children full of rosy health the middle classes live better though on an average less luxuriously than the corresponding classes on the continent their food is strong and nourishing it is at once converted into flesh and blood the british farmers are specimens of human mammoths however grievously they may complain of their distress since the abolition of the duty on corn the nobility and gentry pass a considerable part of the year at their country seats they hunt fish and shoot to the manifest advantage of their health the very children mounted on shaggy ponies take long rides and so do the women who even now and then follow the hounds they go out in yachts on the stormy channel and extend their excursion to the coasts of italy and the west indian islands but in despite of this mode of life which is conducive to health they pay their tribute to the moist atmosphere of their island and they all men women and children submit to pass their lives in flannel wrappers we want says sir john to be independent of the changes of the weather and we isolate our bodies by means of suitable articles of dress we wear flannel cottons india rubber and gutta percha we drink cognac port stout we eat strong meats with strong spices we never pretend that the climate is to suit us we suit ourselves to the climate the continentals act on a different principle and say they like the result we like the result of our own principle and that's the reason why we stick to it flannels in summer and in winter in glasgow and in jamaica this is one of the ten commandments which few englishmen care to transgress but their conservative tendencies which cause them to cling to the habits in which they were reared lead them into the absurdity of adhering to an english mode of life even when fate or trade have flung them to the furthermost corners of the earth i understand that english drawing-rooms in gibraltar are as carefully carpeted as the drawing-rooms of london and edinburgh the british drink their port and sherry under the torrid zone their porter and stout follow them to the foot of the himalaya and they do all of this not because they cannot be comfortable without their old habits but because they protest and devoutly believe that in all the various climates the english mode of living is most conducive to health the proper cultivation of the body is a matter of great importance in england a french labourer is happy with the most frugal dinner if in the evening he can but afford to take a place and laugh or weep at a vaudeville theatre the englishman wants meat good meat and plenty of it the lower classes care little or nothing for the feast of the soul john bull laughs at the starvelings the french frog-eaters he has no idea that the french ouvrier is after all a more civilized creature than he is exactly because to the frenchman his sunday dinner is not as is the case with the lower classes of the english the most important part of sunday these material tendencies are of course fostered by education and society originally they result from the climate the frugality of the paris ouvrier could not for any length of time resist the stomach inspiriting effect of a fresh sea breeze a beautiful morning sir a splendid day sir such like phrases are stereotyped formulas for the proper commencement of an acquaintanceship the english are so accustomed to these meteorological remarks and these remarks appear so important 
because everybody and everything here depends upon the weather that they rarely if ever neglect making them very pleasant weather sir or very wet to-day mutters the cabman as he shuts the door upon you the same remarks greet you from the lips of the omnibus driver as you take your seat at his side or from those of the shopwoman as a preliminary to that awful any other article sir and the words are always pronounced in that grave monotonous business tone which is peculiar to the english even in treating of the most important subjects it may be sunshine or rain the tone is always the same and it has been surmised that the english residents on the continent are such egregious bores and bears only because the greater constancy of the weather deprives them of those magic formulas without which they cannot open their minds how indeed is it possible to make the acquaintance of any one unless there is rain storm fog and sunshine at least twice in the course of the four and twenty hours End of chapter eight part one chapter nine of saunterings in and about london by max slesinger this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine the city capital the lord mayor's retreat the ninth of november city processions the times and the city the stock exchange a piece of self-government lloyd's return to sir john and some of the opinions of that worthy our road to-day lies to the east seated on the roof of an omnibus we ride down the strand through temple bar and fleet street and pass st paul's the road and the pavements are crowded in the extreme the din is deafening but the shrill voices of the costermongers in the side streets are heard even above the thunders of the city we stop for one moment at the foot of ludgate hill and we look back we see part of fleet street and as far as our eyes can reach there is nothing but a dark confused quickly moving mass of men horses and vehicles not a yard of the pavement is to be seen nothing but heads along the rows of houses and in the road too an ocean of heads the property of gentlemen on the roofs of omnibuses which crowd the city more than any other part of town these are the streets whose excess of traffic makes the strongest impression upon the stranger and this part of london is moreover specially dear to the historian we too propose to take our time with it and to walk through it leisurely but to-day we are bound farther eastward we shall leave the omnibus at the further end of cheapside in the heart of the city less than half a mile from the thames and london bridge various streets meeting form an irregular open space this irregular space is one of the most remarkable spots in london for no other place except that of westminster can vie with this in the importance of its buildings and the crowding of its streets though many may surpass it in extent beauty and architectural regularity it is the capitoline forum of british rome it holds its temples the mansion house the exchange and the bank in the centre the equestrian statue of the saviour of the capital the duke of wellington all around are islands of pavements as in other parts of the town for the foot passengers to retire to from the maelstrom of vehicles at our right just as we come out of cheapside is a house supported by columns and surrounded with strong massive railings two flights of stone steps lead to the upper story massive stone pillars surrounded by gas lamps stand in a row in front of it but neither the gas nor the clearest noonday sun suffices to bring out the allegorical carvings which ornament the roof this is the mansion house the official residence of the lord mayor who here holds his court as if his was one of the crowned heads here he lives here are the halls in which the most luxurious dinners of modern times are given here are his offices and courts of justice according to the ancient rights and privileges of the city of london 
every year the lord mayor elect enters upon the functions of his office on the ninth of november the city crowns its king with medieval ceremonies the shops are shut at an early hour and many do not open at all for masters and servants must see the show for many hours the city is closed against all vehicles flags and streamers are hung about from the houses the pavement is covered with gravel holiday faces everywhere amiable street boys at every corner bearing flags brass bands and confusion and endless cheers such is the grave demure and busy city on that remarkable day while the streets are every moment becoming more crowded and noisy the new lord mayor takes the customary oaths in the presence of the court of aldermen and signs a security to the amount of four thousand pounds for the city plate which according to a moderate computation has a value of at least twenty thousand pounds this done he is lord and king of the city and sets out upon his coronation procession surrounded by his lieges and accompanied by the ex-mayor the aldermen sheriffs the dignitaries of his guild the city heralds trumpeters men in brass armour and other thrones principalities and powers the road which the lord mayor is to take is not prescribed by law but according to an old custom the procession must pass through that particular ward in which the king of the city acted as alderman the ward participates in the triumph of the day and the cheers in that particular locality are if possible louder than anywhere else the procession turns next to the banks of the thames the lord mayor according to time-honoured custom must take a trip in a gondola from one of the city bridges to westminster fair weather or foul take the water he must and the broad river presents a spectacle on such occasions as is never seen in any town of europe since the venetian doges and their nuptials with the adriatic have become matter for history splendid gondolas richly gilt glass-covered and bedecked with a variety of flags and streamers bear the lord mayor and his suite previous to starting a supply of water is taken on board thus hath custom willed it the lord mayor's gondola is either rowed by his own bargeman or it is taken in tow by a steam-tug and round the gondolas there are boats innumerable with brass bands and the bridges and the river banks are covered with spectators and the river is more full of life gladness and colour than on any other day of the year the trip to westminster is short it is however long enough for the company to take a copious dejeuner a la fourchette in the saloon of the city barge this breakfast is a kind of introduction to the grand world-famed dinner with which the lord mayor inaugurates his advent to power the dinner is the most important part of the business as indeed the giving and eating of dinners forms one of the chief functions of the city corporations so at least says punch and so says the times the lord mayor and his suite land at westminster bridge in westminster he repairs to the court of exchequer where he is introduced to the judges he takes another oath and to clinch that oath and show that he means to be worthy of his office and of the city of london he commissions the recorder to invite the judges to dinner this invitation is delivered in quite as solemn a tone as the oath and the oath is taken in the same business-like manner in which the invitation is given a foreigner would be at a loss to know which of the two is the most solemn and important these ceremonies over the procession returns the way it came and lands at blackfriars bridge thenceforward it increases in splendour and magnificence the fairer portion of humanity join it in their state coaches the lady mayoress the aldermen's and sheriff's wives and after them come royal princes ministers of state the judges of the land and the foreign ambassadors the procession over they all sit down to dinner what they eat how they eat it and how much they eat is on the following morning duly chronicled in the journals the number and quality of the courses will at once enable an experienced city man to come to a pretty correct conclusion as to the lord mayor's virtues or vices 
meats rich and rare count as so many merits but a couple of low and vulgar dishes would at once turn public opinion in the city against the city's chosen prince the lord mayor's reputation emanates from the kitchen and the larder exactly as a great diplomatist's renown may frequently be traced to the desk of some private secretary the lady mayoress shares all the honours which are showered upon her worthy husband she is a genuine lady for a whole twelve month and perhaps for life if her husband has the good luck to be honoured with a visit from the queen on which occasion it is customary for the lord mayor to be made a baronet while a couple of aldermen at least come in for the honours of knighthood but if the queen does not visit the city the lord mayor descends at the end of the year to his former position for three hundred and sixty-five days he is a lord and his wife is a lady he goes to court and is on terms of good fellowship with royal princes gartered dukes and belted earls and he has the high honour and privilege of feasting the corporation his year of office over he quits the mansion-house returns to his shop and apron and is the same quiet and humble citizen he was before of course the shop and apron we have mentioned in jest only a man who can aspire to the dignity of the mayorality has long ceased to be a tradesman he is a merchant prince a banker a millionaire how else could he afford the luxury of that expensive dignity especially since he cannot but neglect his business whilst he is in office the lord mayor's pay from the city amounts to eight thousand pounds but his expenses are enormous woe to him if he be careful of his money if his dinners are few and far between or his horses and carriages less splendid than those of his predecessors such enormities expose him to the contempt of the grandees of the city the common councilmen shrug their shoulders and the aldermen declare that they were mistaken in him the outraged feelings of the city pursue him even after his return to private life he is in duty bound to spend the eight thousand pounds he receives from the city it is highly meritorious in him if he spends more bright is his place in the annals of the city if he feasts its sons at the expense of double the amount of his official income there is much aristocratic pride and civic haughtiness in this city royalty it rests on a broad historical basis and it was the strongest with regard to royalty at whitehall whenever the latter had to apply to the wealthy city corporations for relief in its financial troubles but it was also a firm bulwark against the encroachment of the kings of england of former days supported as they were by venal judges and parliaments and it deserves the respect of the english as an historical relic its merits lie in the past for at present english liberty needs not the protection of a city king the prerogatives of the city of london have of late years become the subject of a violent agitation that agitation was commenced by the times on the occasion of the great exhibition the times holds that it is unreasonable that the city at the present day a mere function of london should continue to play the part of the sovereign that the lord mayor speaking in the name of london should invite the queen that conducting himself as representative of the metropolis he should be feasted by the prefect of the seine and kissed by monsieur cartier what right has the city to such honours now that london has long since engulfed it where are the merits of the city what does the lord mayor what do the aldermen nothing unless it be that they eat turtle soup and pate de foie gras is obesity a title to honours thus says the times with great justice but with very little tenderness no englishman who knows anything of the history of his country will deny that in evil days the city became a champion of liberty against the kings at whitehall that the lord mayors protected the press and sheltered the printers from the violence of the government that on such occasions the city had many a hot contest with the parliaments and that to this day the city members belong to the liberal party 
but liberal principles might be adhered to even without the lord mayor and his lucullian dinners and as for the city's former services it ought to be remembered that there is a vast difference between living institutions and stone monuments old towers and castles which at one time did good service against a foreign enemy have so to say a vested right to the place in which they stand it were wrong to pull them down merely because they are now useless but far different is the case with living institutions that jar with the tendencies of the century to wait for their gradual decay were a suicidal act in a nation a great many of the institutions of the city ought to be consigned to medieval curiosity shops they were certainly very useful in their day when they had a purpose and a meaning but so was the old german herban so were the gills and so was superstition it were mere madness to spare them in consideration of past services they must fall sooner or later and the sculptors and historians of england will take good care that the former merits of the city shall not be lost in oblivion up to the present time the agitation against the arrogance of the city corporations has been confined to the press to the times belongs the merit of having commenced that agitation the londoners have as yet taken no active part in it and this is another proof of the conservative tendencies which are incarnate in the great mass of the english nation there is in this conservatism a narrow-mindedness which is the more striking as in the affairs of practical life the anglo-british race can least of all be accused of a want of common sense in despite of this innate conservatism the masses are gradually awaking to political consciousness formerly it was considered a matter of course that wealthy persons only were elected to serve in parliament or that rich traders only would aspire to the mayoralty or the dignity of an alderman reforms are impending what will come of them depends partly on the leaders of the movement on the degree of resistance which the government of the day may oppose to them and partly though the english are loath to admit it on the course of events on the continent of europe perhaps we shall resume the question on another occasion just now we are in the capitoline market of the city we leave the mansion house and turn to the other temples which grace the spot opposite to the mansion house is the royal exchange a vast detached building of an imposing aspect the english are not generally famous for their style of architecture the antique columns though great favourites puzzle them sorely they put them exactly where they are not wanted and in many of their public buildings the columns instead of supporting the structure are themselves supported by some architectural contrivance the modern buildings suffer moreover from a striking uniformity they have all the same columned fronts which we see at the mansion house the exchange and several of the theatres it is always the same pattern exactly as if those buildings had come out of some birmingham factory this monotony in the style of public buildings would be altogether unbearable but for the climate the smoky and foggy atmosphere of london indemnifies us for the want of original ideas in the architects it gives the london buildings a venerable antique colouring the exchange for instance has the appearance of having weathered the storms of a hundred years while in fact it is quite a new building still it is quite as black and sooty as westminster abbey or somerset house and yet it is not even nine years old the old exchange was burnt down in eighteen thirty eight it required six years to complete the new building which was opened in october eighteen forty four with much solemnity up to the reign of elizabeth the london merchants had no exchange building they transacted business in the open air in lombard street in st paul's churchyard and sometimes even in st paul's for this cathedral was at the time we speak of the great centre of business fashion and prostitution sir thomas gresham who had frequently acted as the queen's agent on the continent offered to construct an exchange building provided the city would grant him the ground to build it on his proposal was accepted 
a piece of ground was bought for three thousand seven hundred and thirty seven pounds six pence and the first stone was laid on the seventh june fifteen sixty five at the end of the following year the building was completed and to judge from the sketches which still remain it was designed in imitation of the antwerp exchange the virgin queen expressed her high satisfaction with the undertaking most royally by dining with sir thomas gresham and bestowing on the building the title of royal exchange when sir thomas at a later period was compelled to depart this world he bequeathed his exchange to the city and founded the gresham college of which at the present day nothing remains but the gresham lectures which are generally and justly classed among the city jobs whose name is legion gresham's exchange with its profuse display of grasshoppers the founder's crest fell a sacrifice to the great fire in sixteen sixty six so attached had the city merchants become to their new temple of plutus that they restored it in preference even to their churches and two years after the great fire the new exchange was completed and solemnly opened by charles the second gresham's bust which had been saved out of the conflagration was placed in a niche of honour and a cast brass grasshopper the last of its numerous family was raised to the top of the steeple on which bad eminence it had to stand all weathers until relieved by another conflagration in eighteen thirty eight it has been allowed to find a retreat on the eastern front of the present exchange building times have altered since the days of old gresham the site of whose exchange costs less than four thousand pounds while the present building comes to a hundred and fifty thousand pounds exclusive of the cost of the ground in his time grave and sober citizens had mustachios and imperials and wild young fellows bent upon mischief and dissipation repaired to the taverns of the city in our days everybody is smooth-shaved and there is a chapel in every corner formerly the merchants relied on their own understanding and the honesty of their high-born debtors at present they have no confidence either in the former or the latter and out of the fullness of their godly despair they have engraved in front of their exchange building the motto of the city domine dirige nos direct us o lord and reveal unto us the time and the hour at which consoles and shares should be bought and sold the exchange as we have said is a splendid building but professional architects will shrug their shoulders when they look at it in the detail why all those corners on the eastern side and why those small narrow shops it is wrong to condemn anybody or anything on mere prima facie evidence the architect who designed the exchange had similar though greater difficulties to contend with than paxton in the construction of the exhibition buildings in hyde park paxton's great antagonist was colonel sidthorpe an honourable and gallant member of the house of commons who would not consent to sacrifice the trees which adorned the side of the building make what fuss you like about your modern ideas of industry said the chivalric don quixote but you shall not touch the trees they are worth all your industry and all your foreign knick-knacks and free trade and nonsense and indeed anything that ever came from manchester and what said paxton why he said let the old trees stand and we will roof them over and he built his glass house one hundred feet higher in the middle and thus made the transept and there was room for everything and everybody men and merchandise stray children and lost petticoats bad coffee clever pickpockets from england france and germany and sometimes for the rain too when the weather was very bad and we here sought shelter but colonel sibthorpe never crossed the threshold mr tite the architect who made the plans for the new exchange had to contend with a legion of small conservative sibthorpes with a large number of shopkeepers who held places in the old exchange and who insisted on having their shops in the new one they could not be dispossessed and in some manner or other it was necessary to sacrifice the beauty of the building to the claims of the vested interests 
a great many people cannot understand why there is no covered hall for the accommodation of the merchants on change and why they must carry on their business either in the open court or in the arcade which surrounds it the london climate is certainly not made for open-air amusements or occupations and an englishman though with a threefold encasement of flannel stands in great awe of draughts and rheumatism nevertheless the english merchant is condemned in the fogs of winter and the rains of autumn to brave the climate in an open yard and to stake his health and his fortune on the chances of the season and the turn of the market the reason is that englishmen are as much afraid of close rooms as of rheumatism and colds and the gresham committee which superintended the construction of the new exchange decided in favour of unlimited ventilation certain branches of business which in many respects are much more extensive than the speculations in stocks and shares have for a long time past been carried on in certain saloons in the exchange building itself there is a broad staircase with crowds of busy people ascending and descending and there is a door with large gold letters lloyd's coffee house let us ascend that staircase and see what sort of a coffee house this is we pass through a large hall from which doors open to several rooms at each door stands a porter in scarlet livery in the hall itself are several marble statues and a large marble tablet which the merchants of london erected to the times out of gratitude for the successful labours of that journal in unmasking a gigantic scheme of imposition and fraud which threatened ruin to the whole trade of london in the centre of the hall there is a large blackboard on which are written the names and destinations of all the ships carrying mails which will sail from english ports on that and the following day in the corner to the right there is a door with the inscription captain's room no one is allowed to enter this room but the commanders of merchant vessels or those who have business to transact with them next to it is the commercial room the meeting place of all the foreign merchants who come to london we prefer entering a saloon on the other side of the hall the doors of which are continually opening and shutting it is crowded with the underwriters that is to say with capitalists who do business in the assurance of vessels and their freights the telegraphic message of vessels arrived sailed stranded or lost are first brought into this room whoever enters by this door walks in the first instance to a large folio volume which lies on a desk of its own it is lloyd's journal containing short entries of the latest events in english ports and the seaports in every other part of the world it tells the underwriters whether the vessels which they have insured have sailed whether they have been spoken with or have reached the port of their destination are they overdue run aground wrecked lost in this room there are always millions at stake so firmly established is the reputation of this institution that there is hardly ever a bark sailing from the ports of the baltic or the french spanish or indian seas which is not insured at lloyd's its branch establishments are in all the commercial ports of the world but its head office is in cornhill and in the rooms of the exchange before we again descend the stairs let us for one moment enter the reading-room perfect silence tables chairs desks readers here and there men of all countries and of all nations all round the walls high desks with files of newspapers whose shape and colour indicate that they have not been printed in europe they are indeed papers from the other side of the ocean china barbary brazilian australian cape and honolulu papers a collection unrivalled in extent though less orderly than the collections of the trieste lloyds and the hamburg versen halle it is here that the stranger from the german continent first receives an adequate idea of the enormous extent of commercial journalism how far different is this reading-room from anything we see at home how extensive must be the communications of a nation to which such journals are a necessity how small does german commerce look in comparison with this when we were at school we were told that commerce was a means of communication between the various parts of the world 
that merchants are the messengers of progressive civilization and that to be a good merchant a man ought to be well read in geography history politics and a great many other sciences and then we saw our neighbor the grocer and tallow chandler weighing and making up sugar in paper parcels all the year round he knew nothing whatever of geography history or politics but for all that he was a wealthy man and a great person in the town and everybody said he was the pattern of a good merchant we could not understand this at a later period when we lived in a german metropolis we saw other great merchants bankers and manufacturers they did not make up paper parcels as the grocer and tallow chandler did they were dressed with a certain elegance they read newspapers and were fond of discussing the events of the day but many of them had not the least idea of the politics which they discussed and on which they founded their speculations they had forgotten whatever they had learnt of geography commercial topography and history and none the less they passed as capital men of business and accomplished merchants our romantic ideas of the requirements the influence and the radiations of the commerce of the world received again a rude shock but now suddenly as accident leads us into lloyd's reading-room the old impressions come back again thus after all the lessons of our school days were not untrue these then are the messengers of commerce which promote the exchange of civilization between the continents and islands of the world neither science nor religions are powerful enough to found these organs they owe their existence solely to commerce possibly they may be means to an end but it is also an undoubted fact that they exert a vast influence on the peaceful progress of civilization of the fifty million pounds of tea which are sold in the east of london a handful has found its way to the west to guildford street it lies in the bottom of the venerable silver family teapot and this teapot stands on the table of the parlour to which the reader has been introduced on former occasions the mistress of the house is passing in review her two lines of cups and saucers headed by the milk jug and sugar basin mrs bella reads punch and smiles not at the jokes but because she is happy that english liberty admits of such jokes the two younger daughters of the house occupy one chair between them where they read david copperfield and two very small grandchildren of sir john perform a polka in the further corner of the room sir john himself as usual is reading the times and just now he wags his head very impressively because he has been reading gladstone's letter about the affairs of naples sir john though perfectly convinced of dr keif's honesty and good faith has never at any time given full credit to his statements while that gentleman presumed to hint that the administration of criminal justice in italy is not altogether so unexceptionable as that in the old bailey but now since mr gladstone corroborates dr keif's statement in that respect mr gladstone who is a native of england a very respectable man and a conservative to his nethermost coating of flannel now indeed sir john is of the opinion that the neapolitans have after all good cause for complaint we have returned from our excursion into the city and re-enter the comfortable parlour shake hands all round and sit down by the tea-table sir john has smuggled the times under his chair lest the doctor should at once have a weapon to attack him with he asks where we have been and when we tell him he leans his head back purses up his mouth shuts his eyes and says well this well of sir john's accompanied by that peculiar movement of the head means if translated into common language well what do you say to london mere nothing isn't it a business in mincing lane a mere trifle merely a piece of leipzig or frankfurt never mind patience you'll see what london is you'll open your eyes by and by only think what enormous sums are turned over at lloyd's every year 
sir john is altogether victorious to-day we cannot meet him on this ground in vain does dr keif attempt to demonstrate that there is no reason why germany should not become as wealthy and mighty as england if she had only a little more union a little less government an idea or so more of a fleet fewer custom-houses a little more money and less soldiery sir john admits every one of dr keif's propositions but his thirty million pounds of coffee and his fifty million pounds of tea and his twenty million pounds of tobacco are great facts and stubborn facts against which nothing can be said germany may be better off a couple of hundred years hence of course it may there is no reason why it should not but it is very badly off now and that is a fact too and sir john launches forth into a long and elaborate lecture on insurance companies premiums percentages capital bonuses and dividends intermixed with certain allusions to the impractical and improvident habits of the germans and the uselessness generally of all the german professors the last word pronounced with a certain emphasis arouses dr keif from the sleep into which sir john's statistical and economical exposition had lulled him long life to all our german professors says dr keif rubbing his eyes fifty million pounds of tea in mincing lane and not a drop in my cup where's the greatness of england sir john good night chapter nine Part One, Chapter Ten of Saunterings in and About London by Max Schlesinger. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Ten, Hyde Park. Pilgrimage to the Far West, Oxford Street, Hyde Park in the season, Rotten Row, the Duke and the Queen, the front of the Crystal Palace. Doctor Keif enters, makes a speech on British loyalty, and exit the iron shutters of apsley house the british general and the rioters hitherto our excursions have been confined to the east but now we propose leaving russell and bedford squares and the british museum to the right and covent garden and all its theatres to the left to direct our pilgrimage through oxford street to the west oxford street holds the medium between the city streets and the west end streets its public is mixed goods wagons and private carriages omnibuses and men and women on horseback men of business fashionable loungers and curious strangers are mixed up shops of all sorts from the most elegant draper's shops down to the lowest oyster stall may be found in it and there are moreover legions of costermongers and shoals of advertising vans oxford street is long and broad enough to take in the population of a small town it changes its character several times according to the greater or less elegance of the quarter through which it runs after we have walked a good half hour in a straight line and in the present instance we have walked very fast looking neither to the right nor to the left we reach a part where the row of houses on the left side terminates and hyde park commences here there is a high arch of white marble which everybody admires and a small stone which no one notices because it stands near the pump from which the cabmen fetch water for their horses an inscription on this stone tells us that here is the site of the famous tyburn turnpike the arch a curtailed imitation of the triumphal arch of constantine cost george the fourth sixty thousand pounds and stood in front of buckingham palace a few months ago it was removed to hyde park where it now stands in all its marble glory does it perform the functions of a gate no because there is no wall is it a triumphal arch perhaps so to commemorate the bad taste of its founder at all events it promotes the interests of unity for on the opposite side of hyde park there has been these many years past a similar gate which opens a way through nothing and there is a triumphal arch in the face of it which trumpets forth the good taste of punch 
whose paternal exhortations could not prevent the duke of wellington from being placed on that perilous height the english are in many respects like our own good honest peasants so long as the latter keep to their ploughs they are most amiable and respectable but if you find them in town and induce them to put on fashionable clothes you may rely on it that thus affected they will give you plenty of kicks let an englishman make a park and his production will be admirable but if you wish for an entrance into a park you had better not apply to him fortunately hyde park is much larger than its two splendid portals there is plenty of room to lose them from your sight and there are a great many agreeable scenes which will banish them from your memory passing through the marble arch to those regions where the exhibition building stands we cross a meadow large enough to induce us to believe that we are far away from london in the west the ground rises in gentle hills with picturesque groups of trees on their summits and in the valleys here and there an old tufted oak with its gnarled branches boldly stretched out the grass is fresh and green though all the passengers walk on it it is green up to the very trunks of the trees whose shade is generally injurious to vegetation it is green throughout the winter and through the summer months though there is not a drop of rain for many weeks for the mild and moist atmosphere nourishes it and favours the growth of ivy which clusters round any tree too old to resist its approaches thus does hyde park extend far to the west and the south until it finds its limits in bricks and mortar a slight blue mist hangs on the distant trees and through the mist down in the south there are church towers looming in the far distance like the battlements of turreted castles in the midst of romantic forests the trees recede a small lake comes in view it is an artificial extension of the serpentine which has the honour of seeing the elegance of london riding and driving on its banks early in the morning the lake is plebeian the children of the neighbourhood swim their boats on it apprentices on their way to work make desperate casts for some half-starved gudgeon the ducks come forward in dirty morning wrappers nursery maids with babies innumerable take walks by order and at a very early hour a great many plebeians have the impertinence to bathe in the little lake but to-day the park and the river are in true aristocratic splendour here and there there is indeed some stray nursery-maid walking on the grass and some little tub of a boat with a ragged sail floating on the lake there is also a group of anglers demonstrating to one another with great patience that the fish won't bite to-day but all along the banks of the river far down to the end of the park and up to the majestic shades of kensington gardens there is an interminable throng of horses and carriages those who have seen the praetor of vienna in the first weeks of may will be rather disappointed with the aspect of the drive in hyde park where the upper classes of london congregate in the evening between five and seven o'clock partly to take the air and partly because it is considered fashionable to see now and then in order to be seen extravagant turnouts and liveries such as the viennese produce with great ostentation are not to be found in london the english aristocracy like to make an impression by the simplicity and solidity of their appearance and the metropolis is the last of all places where they would wish to excite attention by a dashing and extravagant exterior they have not the least desire either to dazzle or to awe the tradespeople or to make them envious they are too sure of their position to be tempted to advertise it whoever wants this assurance cannot pretend to belong to the aristocracy by far more interesting and indeed unrivalled is rotten row the long broad road for horsemen where on fine summer evenings all the youth beauty celebrity and wealth of london may be seen on horseback hundreds of equestrians ladies and gentlemen gallop to and fro how fresh and rosy these english girls are how firmly they sit what splendid forms and expressive features 
free fresh bold and natural the blue veil flutters and so does the riding habit a word to the horse and movement of the bridle and they gallop on nodding to friends to the right and left the happiness of youth expressed in face and form and no idea no thought for the thousand sorrows of this earth a man of a harmless and merry mind may pass a happy summer's evening in looking at this the most splendid of all female cavalcades but he who has become conscious of those all-pervading sufferings of humanity which felt through thousands of years denied through thousands of years and asserted only within the last few years by the millions of our earth he who has pressed this thorny knowledge of the world to his heart let him avoid this spot of happiness breathing splendour lest the thorns wound him more severely still then comes an old man with his horse walking at a slow pace his low hat pushed back that the white hair on his temples may have the benefit of the breeze his head bent forward the bridle dangling in a hand weak with age the splendour of the eyes half dimmed his cheeks sunken wrinkles round his mouth and on his forehead his aquiline nose bony and protruding who does not know him his horse walks gently on the sand every one takes off his hat the young horsewomen get out of his way and the duke smiles to the right and to the left few persons can boast of so happy a youth as this old man's age he turns round the corner the long broad row becomes still more crowded large groups of ten or twenty move up and down fast riding is quite out of the question when all of a sudden a couple come forward at a quick pace there is room for them and their horses in the midst of rotten row however full it may be for every one is eager to make way for them it is the queen and her husband without martial pomp and splendour without a single naked sword within sight the crowd closes in behind her the young women appear excited the old men smile with great glee at seeing their queen in such good health dandies in marvellous trousers incredible waistcoats and stunning ties put up their glasses the anglers on the lake crowd to one side in order to see the queen the nursery maids the babies and the boys with their hoops come up to the railings the grass plots where just now large groups of people sat chatting are left vacant and the shades of the evening are over the park the sun is going down behind the trees its parting rays rest on the crystal palace with a purple and golden glare whose reflection falls on rotten row and its horsemen in a very short time this spot will be empty but all hail to thee colossus of glass thou most moral production of these latter days iron-ribbed many-eyed with thy many-coloured flags which would make believe that all the nations are united by the bonds of brotherhood and that peace universal peace shall henceforth reign among the sons of men the flags flutter gaily through the cool of the evening there the prussian colours are all but entwined with those of austria here the papal states touch upon sardinia and down there o oh, sancta simplicitas the russian eagle stretches his wings and flutters as if impelled by a desire to fraternize with the stars and stripes of north america our enthusiasm is cooled down by a loud laugh and a shrill voice which hails us from a distance it is dr keif who indulges and not for the first time either in the questionable amusement of mimicking the mode and manner of speech of a distinguished member of the great sclavonian family by saint nicholas says the doctor why you chop fallen look out look you at flags silly to find colours your own black red gold blockheads croat his brother likewise and czech himself speaks quite good german ours when likes and emperor permits magyar have shall german blows and italian likewise piff paff shot through heart by command german is now everything good german all welchland poland and serbonia likewise as they would at frankfurt have it capital times these 
but my dear doctor you are in capital spirits to-night some intrigue eh indeed you look quite smart green coat waistcoat and cravat and dirty boots why you are dressed after the image of a russian cavalier did you happen to see the queen and has that sight made you very loyal a truce to all logic cried the doctor and don't make any bad jokes about the queen if you love me i respect her on my soul i do but since you will talk of the queen i will tell you of the first day of may the day her majesty opened this place you must have read when it once became known that the lady victoria in her own little person intended to open that great exhibition that a rush was made on the season tickets expensive though they were the wicked on the continent smiled at this pedantic antiquated and unseasonable loyalty of the british people these were the very words that the miscreants printed in their papers i trust they won't do so again and i protest against such language i am free to confess there is much childish harmlessness and practical calculation in this same loyalty but if it were innate in the english as some ninnies have had the simplicity to believe if it were a gift of nature such as fine eyes or a humped back or a free native country then i say it would be void of all moral meaning but it is not the result of thoughtless stupidity for the anglo-saxon race is not by any means a race of idiots and the history of england shows that this british loyalty is not the creature of habit and education nor is it perpetuated by climatic causes as cretinism is in styria english loyalty is the expression of conscious respect for the principles of monarchy when worthily represented queen victoria has neither the energy of catherine of russia nor has she the genius of maria theresa but in her principles of government she has always been just to the voice of the majority she is a constitutional queen such as the queen of england should be let no man tell me that she must be so so that she cannot be otherwise even if she would she cannot indeed send her ministers and the members of the opposition to botany bay nor can she stifle the radical press or overthrow the constitution as others did in other places but a queen who may select her ministers dissolve the parliament and create peers has a deal of power to do evil english royalty is not altogether such a farce as the germans generally believe that queen victoria uses her power for good is her merit and because she does so hers is the most fortunate head of all the heads whom fate has burdened with a golden crown she is worshipped adored and idolized by millions who think it the greatest happiness to look at her face i wish you had been there on that memorable first of may i wish you had seen this park and the people and well-dressed people too thronging rotten row to see the queen go by the park was literally black with them you saw nothing but heads to the very tree-tops they risked their lives for the queen for all the world as if they were the most accomplished of courtiers the whole of the public were mad excepting myself and her majesty my dear doctor what a splendid opportunity for you to make a revolutionary speech to so large an assembly yes indeed said the doctor a capital opening for a martyr to the cause how quickly the populace would have torn me to pieces but in sober seriousness i am not the man i used to be on this island you doff the revolutionary garment as snakes do their enamelled skin when fresh from germany i was red and shaggy as esau of old for on the other side of the channel affairs were really too lamentable and disgraceful but after my first four weeks among these smooth shaved and really constitutionally governed barbarians i too became smooth and mannerly as jacob the patriarch another year will make me a constitutional monarchist and a score of years or so will convert me into the absolutist of montalembert's stamp isn't it disgusting 
this impertinently carefully observed constitution of the english tears my republican toga into shreds as day follows day only think continued the doctor of addressing revolutionary observations to these contented englishmen it's the most insane idea that i ever heard of are revolutions to be stamped out of the soil can they thrive without sunlight and rain without provocation from the higher regions the mob of our stamp have never yet made a revolution kings make them of course they know not what they do there is no stopping the doctor when he once begins to speak in his conversations with his german friends he is eloquent on the merits of england but at sir john's tea-table he fights tooth and nail for his beloved germany quite a psychological phenomenon which may be observed in the majority of the better class of german residents in england we walk slowly forward and leave the park by the gate at hyde park corner the roads are now empty for wealth and fashion have gone home to their dinners and the hackney coaches and omnibuses are not permitted to enter the sacred precincts enormous crowds of these excluded plebeian vehicles are collected at the gate and move about wildly to the manifest danger of all who wish to cross the road and high above the tumultuous movement and the crowd stands the equestrian statue of the duke of wellington almost opposite to apsley house in which the great warrior lived at the time this chapter was penned by the author it has rarely been the lot of man so frequently to witness his own apotheosis as the duke of wellington and yet how gloomy looks apsley house on the fresh green borders of the park the windows shut up from year's end to year's end and protected by bullet-proof shutters of massive iron the very railings in front of the house boarded up to exclude the curiosity of the passers-by all owing to the riots which preceded the passing of the reform bill riots in which the castles of the tories were burnt down in the provinces while in the metropolis the populace threatened the life of the greatest captain of the age of course the reform bill would have been passed even without riots and incendiarism but it is not fair in englishmen utterly to forget the bloody scenes which even in late years have been enacting in their own country while anything like a riot on the continent induces them to protest that those people are not fit for liberty nor is it fair in a large party on the continent who are always referring to the moderation and good sense of englishmen utterly to forget the scenes of blood and destruction which ushered in the reform bill but what did a british government do in those days of passion and terror did they at once declare that the british people were unfit for liberal institutions merely because the violence of the catastrophe gave a temporary ascendancy to a couple of thousands of hot-headed madcaps did they proclaim the state of siege did they fetter the press did they invade and search the houses of the citizens were englishmen tried by courts martial were punishments inflicted for political opinions and thoughts did malice go hand in hand with the administration of justice nothing of the kind the incendiaries were arrested wherever they could be caught but no one on either side of the channel ever thought of saying that the british nation was not ripe for freedom and what was the duke of wellington's conduct when the mob assailed apsley house a continental general would have run away or he would have led an army against the rioters the duke barricaded his house to the best of his ability the old soldier stood up to defend his house and his person he the field marshal of all european countries the warden of the cinq ports the commander-in-chief of the british army he did not issue his orders for the drums to beat and his soldiers did not fire upon the misguided populace but when the storm was over he had bullet-proof shutters made to his windows and those shutters he kept closed that the people should never forget their brutal attack upon the old lion well done man of waterloo he has since risen in the estimation of the public but as i said before most englishmen in judging of the affairs of the continent give not one passing thought to the bullet-proof shutters of apsley house 
End of chapter 10part one chapter eleven of saunterings in and about london by max slashinger this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven the quarters of fashion the beauties of nature fashionable quarters london in seventeen fifty two st james palace past and present pell mell the land of clubs mrs grundy on the clubs st james's park buckingham palace waterloo place trafalgar square there is scarcely a nation so fond of green trees and green meadowland as the english they adore the splendid trees of their parks as the druids did their sacred oaks it is quite a pleasure to see that their conquests of nature and other successful efforts to train its agencies to the weaving of woolen yarns and the working of spinning jennies have not deprived them of a sense for those beauties of nature which cannot be reduced to capital and interest the english people are a gigantic refutation of that current untruth that over-cultivation estranges us from nature fire water earth and air are in england more than in any other part of the world employed in the service of capital in england they fatten their fields with manure which has travelled many thousands of miles and which has been collected from some barren rock on the ocean in england nature is compelled to produce water lilies from the tropics and fruit of various kinds of unnatural size in england they eat grapes from oporto plums from malta peaches from provence pineapples from bermuda bananas from santo domingo and nuts from the brazils whatever cannot be grown on english soil is imported from other parts of the world but nevertheless the english retain their affection for the trees and meadows forests and shrubs of their own country this law of nature which is partly influenced by dietetic considerations may be observed in any part of the metropolis the best houses are always near the squares and the parks the part of piccadilly which faces the park is elegant expensive and aristocratic the other portion of that street which extends deep into the vast ocean of houses assumes a business aspect and belongs to trade but even that portion of piccadilly which is now inhabited by the aristocracy was a most wretched place about one hundred years ago there were a great many taverns whose fame was none of the best and on review days the soldiers from the neighbouring barracks sat in front of the houses on wooden benches whilst their hair was being powdered and their pigtails tied up during this interesting operation they laughed and joked with the maid-servants who passed that way as a natural consequence of these proceedings the quarter was avoided by the respectable classes from piccadilly towards the north and along the whole breadth of hyde park is park lane with its charming houses built in the villa style and similar to those of brighton for they have irregular fantastic balconies rotundas and verandas in brighton these contrivances facilitate the view of the sea here they help to a view of the park palace-like in their interiors and filled with all those comforts which in english houses alone can be found in such beautiful harmony and yet so unassuming they do not by their exterior overawe the passers-by with the wealth of their inhabitants formerly this street was tyburn lane the very name reminds one of hanging and quartering at the present day park lane and all the streets around it are the headquarters of wealth and aristocracy plate-glass windows powdered footmen melancholy stillness heavy carriages waiting at small doors no shops omnibuses or carts in cold rainy winter nights perhaps here and there a woman and her child half naked and more than half starved crouching down in some dark corner such is the character of this part of the town where among old walls and green squares stand the most splendid houses of the aristocracy and which with few interruptions only extends to the regions of bond street st james's street connects piccadilly with pell mell we are still in the quarters of splendour and we are approaching the land of clubs and royalty 
in the beginning of the eighteenth century there were a great many theatres in and around st james in the chronicles of those old theatres there is a deal of matter for the student of the life and character of old london the managers were speculators the public were credulous there was a strong hankering after miracles and a decided predilection for noise on the whole people in those days were much the same as they are now but there was more coarseness more massiveness and less grace we go down st james street and reach the point where it joins pall mall there we stand in front of st james palace an old black and rambling building with no interest except what it derives from the past and even in the past it was considered as a mere appendage to whitehall and only after whitehall was burned down did st james palace become the real seat of royalty and it continued to be so until george the fourth took up his residence at buckingham palace at the present day the old palace is used for court ceremonies only the queen holds her levees and drawing-rooms in it in the three large saloons there are on such occasions crowds of people who have the entree in full dress and in great splendour thronging round the throne which is ornamented with a canopy of red velvet and a gold star and crown the walls are decorated with pictures of the battles of waterloo and vittoria in the background are the queen's apartments where she receives her ministers the antechambers are filled with yeomen of the guard and court officials of every description in the courtyard are the state carriages of the nobility and the streets around the park are thronged with crowds of anxious spectators these are the moments when that gloomy building is lighted up with the splendour of modern royalty at all other times night and day red grenadiers pace to and fro in front of the dark walls the courtyards are given up to the gambols of birds cats and children but every morning a military band of music plays in the colour court pall mall is one of the most splendid streets in london its splendour is chiefly owing to the club-houses there are in this street the oxford and cambridge club the army and navy club the carlton the reform the travellers and the athenaeum besides these there are in london a large number of club-houses of which it may generally be said that their chief end and aim is to procure a comfortable home by means of association in as cheap and perfect a manner as possible but the words as cheap and perfect as possible convey quite a different idea to the german to what they do to the englishman a short explanation may not perhaps be out of place at this point a younger son of an old house with an income of say from two to four hundred pounds cannot live and do as others do within the limits of that income he can neither take and furnish a house nor can he keep a retinue of servants or give dinners to his friends the club is his home and stands him in the place of an establishment at the club spacious and splendidly furnished saloons are at his disposal there is a library a reading-room baths and dressing-rooms at the club he finds all the last new works and periodicals a crowd of servants attend upon him and the cooking is irreproachable the expenses of the establishment are defrayed by the annual contributions and the entrance fees but of course neither the annual contributions nor the entrance fees pay for the dinners and suppers the wines and cigars of the members members do dine at the clubs indeed the providing of dinners is among the leading objects of these establishments and the dinners are good and cheap compared to the extortionate prices of the london hotels the club provides everything and gives it at cost price a member of a good club pays five shillings for a dinner which in an hotel would be charged at least four times that sum the habitués of the london clubs would be shocked if they were asked to pass their hours and half-hours in our german coffee and reading-rooms and on the other hand persons accustomed to the beehive life of vienna coffee-houses consider the london clubs as dull though handsome edifices lordly halls splendid carpets sofas armchairs strong soft and roomy in which a man might dream away his life writing and reading-rooms tranquil enough to suit a poet 
and yet grand imposing aristocratic doors covered with cloth to prevent the noise of their opening and shutting and their brass handles resplendent as the purest gold enormous fireplaces surrounded by slabs of the whitest marble the furniture of mahogany and palisander the staircases broad and imposing as in the palazzos of rome the kitchen chef d'oeuvre of modern architecture bath and dressing-rooms got up with all the requirements of modern luxury in short the whole house full of comfortable splendour and substantial wealth all this astonishes but does not dazzle one because here prevails that grand substantial taste in domestic arrangements and furniture in which the english surpass all other nations and which it is most difficult to imitate because it is most expensive the influence which club life exercises on the character of englishmen is still an open question among them the majority of the fairer portion of her majesty's subjects hate and detest the clubs most cordially mrs grundy is loud in her complaints that all that lounging gossiping and smoking deprives those brutes of men of the delight they would otherwise take in her intellectual society and that club dinners make men such epicures they actually turn up their noses at cold mutton and even when at home mr grundy is always dull and goes about sulking with mrs grundy to be sure all he wants is to pick a quarrel and go and spend his evening at that horrid club but there are some women who presume to differ from the view of this admirable type of old english matrons they are fond of clubs and hold a man all the more fitted for the fetters of matrimony after yawning away a couple of years in one of these british monasteries the clubmen say these ladies make capital husbands for the regulations of the club-houses admit of no domestic vices and these regulations are enforced with such severity that a woman's rule appears gentle ever afterwards the windows of almost all the club-houses in pall mall have the most charming views on st james's park it is the smallest of all the parks but it is a perfect jewel amidst the splendid buildings which surround it on all sides on its glassy lake fine shrubs and beeches and ash trees on the banks throw their trembling shadows tame waterfowl of every description swim on it or waddle on the green sward near and eat the crumbs which the children have brought for them the paths are skirted with flower beds with luxurious grass plots behind them and on sunny days these grass plots are crowded with happy children who prefer this park to all others for the water birds are such grateful guests and look so amiable and stupid and are so fond of biscuits and never bite any one and the sheep too are altogether different from all other sheep in the world they are so tame and fat and never think of running away when a good child pats their backs and gives them some bread to eat and there are green boats and for one penny they take you over to the other side and the water too is green much greener than the boat and there is no danger of horses and carriages and children may run and jump about without let or hindrance and there are such numbers of children too in short there is no saying how much pleasure the london children take in st james's park on the continent too there are parks they are larger and are taken more care of and by far more ornamental than the london parks but all strangers who come to london must find that their imperial and royal palace gardens at home with all their waterworks and chinese pagodas greek temples and artificial romanticisms do not make anything like that cheerful refreshing tranquillizing and yet exciting impression which the parks of england produce it is certainly not the climate which works this miracle nor is it a peculiarity of the soil for fine meadowland there is in plenty on the banks of the rhine and the danube the english alone know how to handle nature so that it remains nature they alone can here and there take off a tree and in another place add some shrubs without therefore forcing vegetation into the narrow sphere of arbitrary and artificial laws 
our great gardens at home want wide open grass plots where such are the shrubs and plantations encroach upon them none are allowed to leave the paths and walk over the grass and the public are confined to and crowded on the sand-covered paths whence they may look at the clumps of trees and the narrow empty clearances between them on such spots in england you find the most splendid cattle children are playing there and men and women come and go giving life movement and colouring to the landscape and since parks are but imitations of nature life movement and colour are absolutely necessary to them this life on the greensward in the very heart of the metropolis gives the parks a rural and idyllic aspect while on the other hand it suggests the saying that all england gives one the idea of a large park at the western end of st james's park is the queen's palace a stately building not a grand one though extensive enough to astonish those strangers who have read in the newspapers that her britannic majesty complains of want of house-room and here it ought to be remarked that during the present reign alone not less than a hundred and fifty thousand pounds have been voted by parliament for the extension and improvement of buckingham palace thanks to so large a sum of money the palace is now both comfortable and splendid with its facade overlooking the green park and st james's park with the armorial lion and unicorn which have lately been placed on the gates in so exquisitely ludicrous a manner that they turn their backs at one and the same time upon one another the palace and the queen to the south the palace commands a view of the ocean of houses yclept pimlico to the north it overlooks the shady groves and meadow-grounds of hyde park and on its northern side are splendid gardens nearly as large as st james's park this is buckingham palace situated in the midst of green trees and removed as far as possible from the smoky atmosphere of the metropolis and yet they say that the site is not so healthy as might be wished and the royal family pass only a few months in the year in this their official residence they prefer windsor the valleys of balmoral and osborne the most charming of marine villas in the isle of wight we return to pall mall and passing through marlborough house at one time the residence of king leopold of belgium we enter st james's square and passing the famous house at the corner of king street from the steps of which george the fourth on the night of the twentieth june eighteen eighteen proclaimed the news of the victorious battle of waterloo we proceed in an eastern direction and emerging from pall mall enter an open place the end of regent street whence broad stone stairs lead down into st james's park this is waterloo place surrounded by columned mansions on each side of the broad stone stairs are rows of stately palace-like houses one of them serves as an asylum to the prussian embassy and another is interesting to the continental visitor because it is lord palmerston's town house in front of the stairs is the duke of york's column of which very little can be said except that it is ninety-four feet high and some years ago the jumping down from the top and being smashed on the broad stones at its base was a fashionable mode of committing suicide it's a pity that none of the poor wretches ever thought of overthrowing and jumping down with the statue of the duke of york for it stands ridiculously high and the impression it makes on that bad eminence is by no means agreeable we cross waterloo place and passing her majesty's theatre and the haymarket on our left we hail the equestrian statue of george the third again the houses recede and again a gigantic column with a dwarfish man on its top pierces the skies then another george the fourth of the name on an iron horse and there are two fountains and there is also the national gallery and st martin's church and the lion looking down from northumberland house upon the street noise and the streams of life and traffic which here cross and recross in all directions we are at the foot of the nelson column in trafalgar square which native enthusiasm and foreign scoffers say is like the place de la concorde at paris and here we stop for the present 
politeness induces us to say as little as possible of trafalgar square besides it is high time to introduce our readers to a friend of dr Kaifes, to whom we propose devoting the next chapter end of chapter eleven part one chapter twelve of saunterings in and about london by max slesinger this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twelve gentlemen and foreigners one of dr Kaifes' adventures manners and customs of old england a new acquaintance english flegeljahre the ordinances of fashion our friend's autobiography the gentleman's occupations and eccentricities foreigners john bull on foreigners generally strife and peace among the thousand and one adventures which dr keif had in the very first week of the season there was one which as fate willed it became entitled to a page in the chronicles of our house footnote it is of no use concealing the fact that our house is that of a respectable london citizen we will therefore confess that sir john is neither a knight nor a baronet but that we without the intervention and assistance of her gracious majesty considering his eminent services on behalf of our readers knighted him by means of a silver teaspoon and footnote one night at the opera he met a gentleman whom many years ago he had seen among the ruins of heidelberg castle dr keif was of course overjoyed to see his old friend and for many days he sang that friend's praises in the most extravagant terms he told the ladies of the house that the gentleman he had met was a don juan whose very appearance conquered legions of blue devils while the glance of his eye was enough to attract and subdue any female heart oh indeed said i then he's a dandy never mind whispered dr keif with an air of profound mystery he'll be worth his weight in gold as an ally he isn't even an englishman i tell you that is to say not a modern englishman but a youthful scion of merry old england not a trace of orthodoxy is to be found in him neither in church nor in kitchen matters neither in criticism nor in politics and to sir john the learned doctor said sir i have found the man who first gave me an idea of the greatness of england who persuaded me to study johnson's dictionary and to whom i am indirectly indebted for your acquaintance respect and friendship of course we were all very desirous to see this remarkable man and here we ought to remark that in an english family the introduction of a stranger is not so usual and commonplace an event as in germany and france previous to and after your first visit the family meet in council your good and bad qualities are weighed in the scale of domestic criticism for every member of the family sees in you eventually a bridegroom brother-in-law son-in-law uncle or master at all events you are considered as a suitor for the privileges of a friend of the family for the slight and passing acquaintances of continental life are unknown in these circles the very servants in such houses are hereditary and hold their places for life the nurse is hired for three generations the coachman's grandfather trained the mare whose great-granddaughter is now the property of the son of the house the question whether the doors of the sanctuary are to be opened concerns all the members of the family and gives rise to lengthy discussions and animated debates while the parlour votes you a gentleman low voices of warning are heard from the depths of the kitchen for the cook says sure no one knows what church you go to on a sunday and the other day your coat was buttoned up to the chin for all the world as if you had cause to conceal your linen or the want of it even miss lollipop though but just in her teens and fresh from the nursery takes part in the debate and raises her shrill voice in condemnation oh i can't bear him mamma says she and i won't remain in the room when he comes how can he dare to pinch my cheek as if i were a child and you o oh unsuspecting stranger have no idea of the sensation which your knock produces throughout the house 
and when on going away sir john shakes hands with you and sees you to the door asking you to call again you are perhaps continental as you are cautious enough to consider all this as a mark of cheap and common politeness you are mistaken sir john lays great stress on his religious observance of the ordinances of old english family life and he quotes with much emphasis the following paragraph of that most explicit of all unpublished law books and in case the stranger male or female doth by a comely form and demure carriage gain thy british heart then shalt thou when he or she departeth give his or her hand a hearty shake to signify and prove thereby that he or she shall always be welcome at thy table at thy fireside and in the spare bedroom which is in thy premises but if thou dost not like him or her then his or her hand shall not be so shaken robert baxter esq or simply mr baxter as we by this time are accustomed to call him had thanks to his friend and eulogist no difficulties whatever to contend with he marched in with flying colours he came saw and conquered the hearty shake of the hand was resolved upon before he had emptied his first cup of tea at our fireside by this time he is the most intimate friend of the family he comes and goes away at his liking takes the children out in his gig and has in short made such progress in the space of a very few weeks that in direct violation of another paragraph of the family ordinances he lays hands even on the sacred poker and actually pokes the fire with it a privilege which according to law should not be conceded even to a friend before the expiration of the seventh year of amicable intercourse let no one fancy that these remarks are an introduction to a novelistic plot to dispel all suspicions on this head i proceed at once to unmask dr keif's abominable perfidy one which the ladies of the house vow they will forgive but which they cannot forget only fancy their disappointment keif's don juan his amiable hero his capital fellow for thus it pleased the doctor to call him mr baxter in fact is a grey-haired old man dr keif was cunning enough to excuse the incorrectness of his description by pleading short-sightedness it never had struck him indeed it had not and after all said our learned friend though not exactly young mr baxter is youthful his whiskers for instance are brown and his large clear eyes how free and open do they look at all and everything has he not an aristocratic hand is not his chin round his forehead white and his toilette irreproachable in short the more i think of it the more firmly am i persuaded that mr baxter is quite a don juan if compared with your absurd london greenhorns whose lengthy faces make all the french shop-girls in regent street gape true said i in my opinion mr baxter's grey hair is his best recommendation for none but children and old men are truly amiable in england no creature on earth more excels in charming merriness and bold natural freshness than your little free-born trouserless briton but the moment the boy sports the very ghost of a stray hair on his upper lip the moment he lays in a stock of razors and stiff shirt collars that very moment does your english boy undergo a most shocking metamorphosis and one which even doyle would despair to depict the flagelyara the period of sowing wild oats with other nations a mere transition period scarcely longer than a northern spring is in the case of an englishman protracted through ten years and more with the very brightest character it lasts up to six-and-twenty but it also frequently happens that the modern englishman like unto tully's roman remains an adolescence up to forty there is something altogether indescribable in this english flagelyar character fancy a cross between an unctuous missionary and a fast undergraduate duly coated gravited brushed up and dressed out for the dining-room and you will have a tolerably approximating idea of the flagel youth 
who eager to be very respectable and romantic at one and the same time succeeds in appearing either insufferably tedious or unconstitutionally comical is it their hypochondriacal climate so do the continentals ask every year when the english exodus arrives on their shores or is it church and state is it a fault of education or a want of digestion which causes these wealthy tall islanders with their red faces and costly coats to stand forth so queer and out of the common order of human creatures they are neat to perfection and got up regardless of expense in all their details but take the fellow as a whole and you find him mighty unsavoury you will find the reason neither in the fog nor in constitutional liberty no act of parliament forbids a man to cultivate the graces and the climate enacts flannel only but by no means the zopf it is not want of education but a superabundance of it it is the education of a rigidly puritanical governess whose name we never pronounce without a feeling of secret awe the governess is more fervently adored than the established church people fear her more than they did the spanish inquisition as fate sat enthroned in mysterious majesty above the gods of greece so does this cruel mistress lord it over magna carta habeas corpus and all the other glories of old england her name is gentility liberty of the press and popular agitation avail not against her the commons of england have conquered the strongholds of toryism mr cobden and his cotton lords have trampled protection under foot and light is being let even into the gloomy caverns of chancery but what agitator dares to league the cunningly separated classes of english society against only one of the one thousand three hundred positive and negative enactments of gentility whereby the favoured people of the isles are distinguished from the pagans of the continent from the immoral uneducated barbarians from those soap renouncing foreigners who liberates the free-born briton from the fear of losing caste a genuine british phrase this which follows him as his shadow whithersoever he may direct his steps which haunts him even in rural retirement and which in a town containing near three millions of inhabitants admits not even of one single circle of free and general sociability at a political meeting perhaps there may exist something like an approximation of the upper and lower classes and peers and draymen cheesemongers and guardsmen may on such occasions breathe the same air and fill it with their cheers and groans but i will rather believe that st peter's of rome and st paul's of london can come together than that the cousin of a right honourable will knowingly and with tolerance prepense eat his dinner at the same table with the keeper of a cheese shop we the foreigners are blind to the graces of the english flagel youth his manners which we liken to those of a dancing bear are in the eyes of the natives respectable what we contemn as a mincing chilliness of address is exalted as the decent reserve of the true briton of course there are exceptions especially within these latter days now and then we meet with daring innovators who doubt the exclusive decency of english manners there are bold sceptics proclaiming in the east and in the west that a man with a coloured necktie ought to be able to appear in the pit of the italian opera without thereby obliging all proper-minded females in the five rows of boxes to faint away and be carried out forthwith others pretend that at table you may take the fork with your right hand without by so doing affixing an indelible stigma to your name and that there is a possibility of pardon even for the man who eats mustard with his mutton the very boldest assert that you may take a pea with your knife and eat the pea too and yet be a gentleman for all that these are charming signs of the times they awaken hopes which another generation will perhaps justify but generally speaking there is no denying it 
that the free social spirit of merry old england is most frequently to be found among the elderly men gray hair with red cheeks is pleasing to look at and doubly pleasing are those colours when they ornament the head of a gentleman for in such a case they announce the presence of all sorts of manly amiabilities the word gentleman has been shockingly profaned in england according to sir john's cynical definition any man is a gentleman who pays his tailor's bill the correctness of that definition would appear to be generally allowed for the name is most liberally bestowed on dandies and blockheads wealthy tradesmen and sporting men but in these pages i speak of the gentleman in the truest and noblest sense of the term he is a joint production of nature art and accident and there are many conditions to the perfection of this beau ideal imprimis he must not be compelled to eat his roast beef by the sweat of his brow for he who has to work for his existence in england cannot of course be said to be independent he must have made the grand tour for to the english the continent is in a manner a social high school and academy how miraculously is the innate and indestructible kernel of english character developed in such a man as he ripens in years he breaks through that icy covering which in his earlier years surrounded him and he shakes off the chains of etiquette or bears them with a grace which proves that to him they are not a restraint but an ornament a few years later he eclipses the flower of the male part of the society in germany and france his jovial humour is restrained by an exquisite tact his politeness acquires substance from a free and hearty manner there is in him so grave and natural a manliness that to oblige him and to be obliged by him is equally agreeable it would seem that he becomes younger as he advances in years such a man was robert baxter esq the history of his development is short and simple enough shortly after his introduction into our circle he related it one evening after dinner of course for what does the code of family morals enact and prescribe thou shalt invite a gentleman to a good and solid dinner the which consisteth of fish and roast meat and pudding and wine but thou shalt not invite him to the eating of cakes and sugar-plums and much less shalt thou tempt him to a soiree dansante where he would have much labour and no sustenance and at a table thou shalt not as the wicked do make the said gentleman talk of politics business science and divers other heavy matters lest peradventure his attention should be diverted from the enjoyment of the various dishes which thou shalt set before him obedient to this law sir john gave a grand dinner to all his family to celebrate mr baxter's acquaintance it was after that dinner that our friend reclining in an easy chair gave us the following sketch of his former life story god bless you i have none to tell sir my life has been that of a gentleman comfortable and monotonous throughout i was brought up by an uncle of course he was rich most uncles are he spoilt me and left me his property i went to harrow and oxford where i learnt that no one ever learns anything in those seats of learning except fighting hunting and the art and mystery of writing latin verses and after all to think of the lots of very clever men we have in spite of those places truly it is miraculous old england thank goodness can't be ruined but it wants ventilation ventilation in foreign climes is a necessity for the free-born englishman that was my idea when i crossed the channel to calais on that occasion i had a curious adventure not a duel no, no nothing of the kind i pitched into a frenchman and knocked him down the wretch had called me un étranger i did not understand his mode of speech but a friend who was with me said the word meant a foreigner a foreigner you scoundrel cried i how dare you say a free-born briton is a foreigner and i knocked him down he got up and challenged me to fight a duel with him but the police interfered and i was arrested 
the lieutenant of the police who had to examine me told me with a kindness which was altogether undeserved on my part that the word foreigner was quite harmless that it had a relative meaning and that it might even be complimentary i could not stand that i had a dim perception of my being wrong and of having made an egregious fool of myself but still i could not get over the contemptuous meaning which we connect with the term and pig-headed as i was i replied in english sir i'd thank you for not addressing such compliments to me you may call me a non-frenchman of course you may for i am an englishman and glory in the fact but i would not be a foreigner no not for the world rather than submit to such an indignity i'd leave your country at once he laughed and bowed me out and that very day i returned to dover on my second continental tour i went through belgium to germany and when after a few years residence in that country i came back to england i was not alone i was accompanied by a foreigner a lady who bore my name she was not strong and could not bear the climate she yearned for her country but concealed her wish to return when at length i brought her back to the sunnier clime of southern germany it was too late that sad event happened many years ago but though she left me i was not solitary heaven be thanked i have a son a dear boy who is now at college at heidelberg of course your son is half a foreigner said miss lollipop with a slight toss of her head nothing of the kind said mr baxter with a smile he is a cockney by birth for he was born within the sound of bow bells but added our friend i wish him to become so much of a foreigner as to enjoy the brighter sides of english life without a superstitious admiration of the darker ones a pause of general embarrassment followed the conclusion of this short and fragmentary autobiography the children looked at mr baxter curiously inquiringly for a couple of stories and anecdotes seemed still hovering on his lips but he sat silent and lost in thought probably his thoughts were with his son the heidelberg student perhaps he fancied he accompanied that son in his wanderings through some valley in the alps or to the ruins of some ancient abbey rich with curious carvings and relics of the olden time for mr baxter rides the antiquarian hobby as he does his other hobbies of which many are as laborious as useless for it ought to be remarked that a real gentleman hates absolute idleness some purpose or object fantastic though it be he must have he defies dangers and courts fatigues the old freaks which english gentlemen have and which they are guilty of to the signal astonishment and amusement of continental feuilleton writers and gothamites are mere excrescences of that restless desire of activity which is one of the most splendid qualities of the anglo-saxon race many thousands of englishmen each of whom can afford to make his life one long spell of rest devote their time and energies to an honourable servitude in the nation's service and slave for a single word of thanks from posterity quite as much as the continental bureaucrats do for orders and pensions if they want the talents or the ambition necessary for such a career they will devote themselves to farming or support some one of the numerous charitable institutions of the metropolis or their own county not only with money for that were no sacrifice but also by giving it their time personal attention and influence the active charity of the women is quite as great as that of the men and this explains the reason why although in england the gulf between wealth and poverty is wider than in every other country nevertheless up to the present day there are no symptoms of that patient bitterness of hatred among the lower classes that harbinger of an approaching doom which has come to other nations with the gloomy evangel of the future on its pale lips as a third class we have the amateurs and patronizers of arts and sciences the passionate and most persevering observers of nature who for many months will watch a swallow's nest 
or fill their diaries with observations on the signs and marks of instinct in cockroaches and snails the travellers in every clime who take their coffee with the shah of persia converse with the sultan on the superior excellence of english railroads rhyme on and in presence of the cypress trees of scutari smoke the pipe of peace with the comanches and the last of the mohicans and who now and then watch and register the hangman's tricks of an accomplished despot in order to recount them to our countrymen who never believe such shocking stories unless published under the authority of a gentleman of known respectability and conservative principles those who are altogether unable to employ their leisure hours that is to say their lives usefully devote themselves to some sport with a touching fanaticism and ride their hobbies with the heroism of world betterers such a man sails in a nutshell of a yacht to the polar regions or travels about in spain to effect the conversion of jews and gypsies or he ascends mont blanc and writes a letter to the times to commemorate his fatigue and folly mr baxter however had never been at mont blanc and what is more is not likely he ever will make the ascent he is too old and too clever on the evening in question he gave convincing proof of his shrewd good nature and tact for while we were all silent and embarrassed he leant back with the most comfortable air in the world and with a look of innocent slyness at our long-drawn faces our embarrassment and silence were caused by a word of which mr baxter had made a liberal use in his autobiography and which he pronounced with a provoking emphasis it is a word on which whole chapters and books might be written the word foreigner the ancient greeks spoke of all other nations on the face of the earth as barbarians and for a period i believe they were quite right it is said whether truly or falsely i will not here investigate but it is said that every englishman thanks god in his morning prayers that he has not been created a foreigner he is a foreigner but a very nice man a very gentlemanly foreigner indeed what a pity he is a foreigner offensive compliments of this sort fall very frequently from british lips the tone of pity contempt and condescension with which those disagreeable words are pronounced is applied not only with respect to the foreigner but also to the produce of his country bad cherries or plums are at once declared to be foreign there is no doubt they come from france belgium or holland when our cook opens an egg which offends her olfactory nerves and when she flings it indignantly into the dust-hole she accompanies it with the sneering hiss of foreign that wretched egg was laid by a dutch hen of course it was and probably the passage from holland was very long and stormy but alas all dutch hens have come into evil repute it is at once understood that them nasty furrin hanimals always lays bad eggs sir a bold attempt to vindicate the rights and the honour of foreigners was on one sunday evening made in guildford street at dinner-time when the glorious roast beef of old england graced sir john's hospitable board this glorious bulwark of your nation said dr keif is of foreign extraction sir john dropped his knife with the shock these words gave him i don't understand you sir said he rather sternly is not your loin of beef cut from judish ox that was fattened on the holstein marshes go to smithfield and ask the sellers where they got that homeric beef to which the british owe their strength humour and political superiority sir john was mute with astonishment and vexation he could not deny the truth of the learned doctor's sally yet if he admitted it what ay what was to become of the roast beef of old england come said dr keif following up his advantage and raising his glass here's a health to father rhine what do you say sir added he turning to mr baxter is there anything equal to the delight of a walking expedition down the rhine or up the r or moselle mr baxter took the hint 
charming said he even sir john must confess that we have some reason for our love of continental life and that travelling englishmen after all know what is good when they stick to the banks of the rhine the danube or the neckar certainly said sir john to see those countries and the queer sort of people that live in them is certainly worth while but to the english heart there's no place like home they have not anything extra in those countries have they oh yes they have said mr baxter peremptorily to whom sir john replied it's an old proverb that there's nothing choice or precious in the world but money will procure it for you in england i beg your pardon replied mr baxter with great determination there are things rich and rare which could not be had in england no not for all the money in the bank sir john was extremely shocked sir said he you astonish me oblige me by proving your assertion what is it you allude to why of a folk's fest a people's festival really and truly a festival in the open air when all ranks and classes join and mix without any thought or possibility of a mob where the wine calls forth songs and laughter but where not a single fist is raised to threaten or strike and mr baxter continued in rather too flattering colours giving a sketch of the merry german life and contrasting it with life in england he expatiated on the general cultivation of the lower classes on the toleration of german social life in short he lost his way in producing so brilliant an apotheosis of german affairs that he did not or would not pay attention to sir john who shook his head in an ominous manner at first dr keif rubbed his hands triumphantly for on mr baxter's free-born british lips each word had the charm of authority but as our friend went on the doctor could not but confess to himself that mr baxter's victory might possibly lead to that gentleman's utter ruin in the worthy baronet's good opinion there was a long and awful pause at length sir john rose and with a smile by no means a natural one he walked up to mr baxter held out his hand dropped it and said sir it's my opinion you are a respectable man and i believe you mean what you say but moderation is good in all matters you may be just to foreign countries so am i but you idolize the continent and despise your own country that i beg your pardon but that is not the conduct of an english gentleman dr keif looked very pale and uncomfortable nonsense sir john said mr baxter good-humouredly let me say a word to you and then you may judge whether i love my country less than you do i have never meddled with politics but i am something of a tory for i take the world as it is and hold that everything which is is if not pour le mieux according to voltaire's candide at least not without good reason but no one ought to claim all honour and glory for him and his the people of this beautiful island have the inestimable treasures of liberty power and honour england is an impregnable fortress a charming garden fenced in by the ocean and by rocks her tranquil safety is cheap at any price no venomous reptiles creep on her soil the wolves have been exterminated for centuries past but in return the sweets of existence are open only to hard labour and high birth a consequence of this is a spirit of caste a tendency to seclusion a stubborn and rugged independence look at the continent what would those poor nations come to plagued and hunted down as they are if deprived of the comforting amenities of a kindly sociability what they have no unity in their state no protection abroad no sacredness of law no safety at home and yet you would dispute with them the paltry consolation of having better actors than you have if their towns with their eternal state of siege had our fogs and clouds of smoke our penitential sundays and breathless weekdays whoever could resist the temptation of committing suicide why such a state of things were a hell upon earth and can you believe that providence would allow such a state of things to exist but to return to england 
this country has the greatest parliament the most powerful orators the most humane police the freest newspapers the most untouchable liberty and with all this you lay claim to a monopoly of good potatoes and manners you would have all the gifts and perfections of earth but if this our england could in addition to her solid political heritage have the charms of continental leisure hours why then this same england were a paradise on earth literally a paradise where no one could ever think of dying sir john was pacified and happy and said he was he went about the room singing god save the queen and would not leave off shaking hands with mr baxter End of chapter 12part two chapter one of saunterings in and about london by max slesinger this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter one down the thames river scene at london bridge colliers from newcastle the custom house the pool the dangers of the thames an englishman afloat reappearance of dr keith and mr baxter boating scenes the thames tunnel private docks how englishmen build ships for foreigners greenwich old soldiers in england and germany hotels and pot-houses greenwich park again we have reached the foot of london bridge the first of those mighty arched and pillared bulwarks which oppose the onward progress of ocean ships into the heart of the country the river at this point is nothing but a large settlement of steamers and boats of every description on our first tour up the river we saw many groups of small steamers and fishing boats with sails of a dusky red but the masts of the boats were lowered and the steamers were of a lilliputian kind undergrown low funnelled small engined and paddle wheeled they were passenger boats plying between the bridges the class of vessels we see here have a more important appearance you see at once that these are no water penny omnibuses coasting in between the city and putney bridge here are broad black hulls double funnels and capacious ones high masts and boats hauled up at the sides all tell us that these are hardy customers that can stand a stiff breeze in the channel and elsewhere some of them swing lazily on their moorings they have just come in from a voyage and are taking their ease at home others blow vast clouds of steam and black smoke flags are being hoisted on them hundreds of people cross and recross on the planks which communicate with the wharf or with other vessels they are just starting whither i for one know nothing about it a sailor could tell you all about them he reads the character of a ship in the cut of its jib but we continentals who are scarcely at home in our country are perfectly lost in this babel of foreign vessels and seamen even for one short trip to greenwich we are starting for greenwich you know we had better ask some porter or policeman to direct us to the boat we want lest by some mistake we might chance to go to hamburg boulogne or antwerp such things have happened here we are on a small steamer next to a black scotch coaster crowded to suffocation and just casting off the boy at the hatch is waiting for the captain's signal and the captain walking his paddle-box moves his hand the boy calls out the engineer makes a corresponding movement and the steam enters the large cylinders the machinery is in motion and the vessel has left the shore don't be in a hurry miss you can't leap that distance you've missed the boat as a thousand respectable girls do daily amidst these vast comings and goings of london there will be another greenwich steamer in five minutes so the misfortune after all is not very great what an astounding spectacle the thames presents at this very point below london bridge in autumn when the great merchantmen heavily laden coming in from all parts of the world cast their bales and casks on the shore from whence a thousand channels of trade convey them to and distribute them over the whole of the earth in autumn i say this part of the river presents a spectacle of a mighty astounding activity with which no other river can vie the vessels are crowded together by fifties and hundreds on either side 
colossal steamers running between the coast towns of france germany and scotland have here dropped their anchors waiting until the days of their return for passengers and merchandise their little boats dance on the waves their funnels are cold and smokeless their furnaces extinct sailors walk to and fro on the decks looking wistfully at the varying panorama of london life in a semicircle round those steamers are the black ships of the north they are black all over the decks the bows the sides the riggings and the crew have all the same dusky hue these vessels carry the dark diamond of england they are colliers from newcastle the industrial and political greatness of england springs from the depth of those coal mines deprive the british islands of their coal give them gold silver diamonds instead fill their minds with all the coins that the kings of this earth ever minted since the creation of the world no matter not these not all the untold treasures of australia felix could supply that living spark which slumbers in the coal without their inexhaustible coal mines the english nation would still be what they were a thousand years ago an island people poor weak and neglected like the norwegians it is so easy to find fault with god and nature instead of our dear selves do me the favour to look at this earth of ours of all zones climes and countries how few how very few there are without some unacknowledged treasure which if properly appreciated and turned to account would make a nation's fortune are the british nature's favourites is their climate more genial their soil more fertile than those of the countries we and others live in no but the difference lies in the use which the english have made of gifts and opportunities common to all their soil produces the finest crops in europe a grain of british wheat might be picked out of a thousand grains of continental wheat out of their coal mines they have raised the greatest industrial empire that the world ever knew of the stormy channel and the ocean which beat against their rocky coasts they have made bridges on which their spirit of enterprise careers and domineers over all the world water earth air and fire from these elements sprang the greatness of england they are common to all but those who know how to convert them into power prosperity and comfort are justly preeminent as the most practical nation our boat has just passed the custom house it is a splendid building it has been burnt down six times and six times rebuilt on the same site radical free traders dislike the building where it stands they would gladly convert it into a hospital a poorhouse or a commercial academy it will take a long time to realize these liberal intentions for at this present day duties to the amount of twelve million pounds are paid in the port of london alone nevertheless the english swear by free trade the vessels which come to london must all appear at the forum of this custom-house unless they prefer leaving their cargo in the docks or the bonded warehouses what crowds of sailing ships and steamers from all the harbours of the world what goings and comings what loadings and unloadings what a bewildering movement this custom-house presents it is actually painful to the eye and now thank goodness we have left all this turmoil behind us the further we go down the river the more closely packed are the vessels on either side for above two miles the broad thames is woefully narrow and the steamers which run up and down must just pick their way through as best they can accidents will happen and the man at the wheel must keep a sharp lookout those who never sailed on the thames have no idea of the number of black-funnelled monsters eclept steamers which continually whisk past one another there is one just now steering right down upon us within another second our sides must be stove in well done she has turned aside and rushes past but scarcely is the danger over when another monster of the deep comes paddling on and a large schooner is wedging its way between us and the said monster of the deep and on our right there is an awkward dutchman swinging round on her anchor and on our left there is a lubber of a collier with her gunwales just sticking out of the water 
and there goodness gracious there it is a very nutshell of a boat and two women in it passing close under our bows i really don't know why we did not upset them and why the others did not run into us that nutshell of a boat had a narrow escape among the steamers and those women were fully aware of it and there is no end of accidents and yet those people will row across the river it is a perfect blessing that the english know better than anybody else how to steer a boat under difficulties look at that man at the wheel immovable with his head bent forward his eyes directed to the ship's course his hands ready to turn the wheel that fellow knows what steering on the thames is to all appearance it is not near so difficult as rope dancing but i say it's worse than rope dancing it requires the most consummate address and then there's the responsibility the sailors of all nations stand in great awe of the london thames they navigate their vessels to the east indies they weather the storms of the cape and think nothing of its blowing big guns but none of them would undertake to steer a vessel from blackwell to london bridge it's too crowded for us they say and the little nutshells of steamers are enough to make an honest sailor giddy and the river is so narrow if you fancy you are clear of all difficulties and can go on there's sure to be some impertinent boat in your way turn to the right why there's not room for a starving herring to float and the old steersman descends from his high place and resigns his functions to the thames pilot if he is a conceited blockhead let him try that's all but if the vessel comes to harm the insurance is lost for the underwriters at lloyd's will not be responsible for any damage done in the pool unless the wheel is in the hands of a regular pilot and they are right for all the difficulties and dangers there are few accidents let us then trusting to the skill of that particular steersman who guides our own destinies and those of our boat look at the scenery around a forest of masts looms through the perennial fog the banks of the river are lined with warehouses some old and dilapidated while others are new solid and strong a stray flag fluttering in the evening breeze a sailor hanging on the spars and chewing tobacco a monkey of a boy skylarking on the topmost cross trees of an indiaman these are some of the sights of the lower thames let us now look at the party on board our own vessel for after all we ought to know the people who are in the same boat with us and who in case of an accident would share our watery grave the boat is full a first-class ticket to gravesend costs nine pence and the society is of a mixed description of course but it is one of the peculiarities of england that a mixed society does not by any means present so striking an appearance as in germany or france it is not easy to look into people and as for their exterior their walk manners dress and conduct there is even among the poor classes a strong flavour of the gentleman the french blouse or the german kittel have no existence in this country the black silk hat is the only headdress which englishmen tolerate a man in a black dress coat hat and white cravat hurrying through london streets early in the morning is not as a raw german would fancy a professor going to his lecture room or an attache on the track of some diplomatic mystery no in the pocket of that man if you were to pick it you would find a soap-box drop and razor he is a barber or as the case may be a man milliner or waiter or tailor or shoemaker many an omnibus driver sits on the box in a white cravat in paris they say with a black dress coat and affability you find your way into the most fashionable drawing-rooms men in black dress coats descend now and then into london sewers and that too without being in the least affable the women of england too do not betray their social position by their dress coloured silks black velvets silk or straw bonnets with botanical ornaments are worn by a lady's maid as well as by the lady possibly the maid's dress may be less costly the lady too may sweep her flounces with a distinguished air there may be some difference or other but who can see all and know all by just looking at people see for instance that lovely face under a grey bonnet there to the left of the cabin stairs 
she has just risen from her seat what a slender graceful figure pray don't look at her feet what ease what decency in her every movement and how grandly yet how confidently does she take the arm of her companion by jove he has got a black dress coat and a white tie a handsome couple he is well shaven has fine thin lips with that peculiar lurking smile of superiority which the most good-natured englishmen can scarcely divest themselves of his auburn hair is splendidly got up his dress is of superfine cloth his linen is unexceptionable he has a gold chain dangling on his waistcoat and dazzling all beholders that man for one is a gentleman oh, he is nothing of the kind says dr keif he does not pay his tailor's bill he is a journeyman tailor and the coat i wear is the work of his hands it is a capital coat and i will thank him for making it saying which the doctor made his way to the young couple and forthwith shook hands with them they are as good as betrothed said the doctor on his return going for a day's pleasure to greenwich honest decent people those that's what i like in english prudery that it cares for trifles only take it all in all and you will find that the state of affairs is more satisfactory here than it is in germany that girl's father and mother honest and decent people i tell you have no objection to her gadding about for whole days and half the nights too under the protection of her sweetheart they walk in the park sit under the trees talk of love marriage household affairs morrison's pills and other interesting subjects and while they talk they eat cold beef and hot mustard and the result is an honest marriage without dishonourable antecedents in germany such excursions would be suspicious in the extreme where's the prudery i should like to know well well said the doctor shaking his head it's the nature of the people and of the tie said mr baxter a white tie and a black dress coat kill all rakishness and scampishness even in the most talented individuals choke a man with a white tie squeeze him tight in a black coat and he must needs be prudent calculating and respectable he can't help it it's for that very reason i have exacted from my son at heidelberg a vow that he will eschew white ties and black coats at least until he is married here we are at the tower there is nothing awful in its appearance from the riverside especially since it was repaired and whitewashed after the great fire the outer wall is black and two red sentinels creep to and fro along it on the bench just opposite to us sits an aged quakeress with three infantine quakers who have all along fancied they were going to westminster they see their mistake now that the seeing of it can do them no good whatever and they behave as quakers are wont to do under such circumstances they evince moral horror subdued grief and unctuous comfort which they apply to one another a fat gentleman who sports a linen shirt front of the dimensions of a moderate sail the english are fond of displaying large tracts of linen on their ships and bodies does his best to cheer the stricken family in drab in the forecastle there is a group of workmen reading the weekly dispatch which convinces them that disraeli is the worst man alive some german musicians are congregated round the funnel and a good deal of newspaper reading is going on on the after-deck while a newsboy calls out the last number of punch small children in charming dresses are being fed by their mamas the men sit or stand about gaping or chatting and some stare with a very respectable horror at a group of french ladies and gentlemen who alone make much more noise than all the other people on board and all the ladies have their parasols up to attract the sun i dare say but it won't do the sun o oh, fairer and frailer portion of humanity will shine when we are out of london but not till then why should he what is an excursion on the thames without the mystic fog of romanticism without the garish light of day without the depth of perspective the objects on shore and on the water grow so to say out of the colourless mist presenting fantastic outlines suddenly mightily and with a magic grandeur 
on our left we fancied we saw hundreds and hundreds of masts rising up behind the houses from the very midst of dry land we thought it was an optical delusion but as we advanced the masts and the outline of the rigging came out strong substantial and well defined against the lurid sky and just here there is an indiaman deeply laden turning out of the river and proceeding inland floating on locks what we saw were the basins of the various docks which hidden behind storehouses of fabulous size and number extend deep into the heart of the country the river broad as it is cannot afford space for the hundreds and hundreds of vessels which lie snugly in those docks our boat too turns to the left bank and stops near an apoplectic grey tower which reminds us strongly of the donjon keeps of the city of linz in upper austria a similar tower rises from the opposite bank these towers are the gates of the famous thames tunnel we leave the boat to look at this triumph of british science and perseverance the tower covers the shaft into which you must descend if you would enter the broad pathway under the water and sinking this shaft to the depth of eighty feet was the first step in an undertaking which since its completion has commanded the admiration of the architects and engineers of all nations the broad comfortable stairs and the pathway beneath the river devoid of ornament and lighted with gas do not indeed present any striking features to the unscientific visitor our railway tunnels are a good deal longer and what mortal unless he be a practical engineer has a conception of the difficulties of this particular undertaking still those difficulties were enormous the breadth of the river is above two thousand feet at high water the weight pressing on the arches is about double the low water weight among the strata which the workmen had to pierce there was a layer of floating sand and in spite of all precautions the water broke in not less than five times and several lives were sacrificed on one occasion mr brunel the architect had a narrow escape through a breach of several thousand cubic feet the water entered the tunnel which had then advanced to the middle the masonry and the machinery were destroyed it took many weeks before the water was pumped out and the disastrous hole stopped up with sandbags the workmen refused to go down again the contractors had to double their wages the works had to be carried on by day and by night without cessation and the strictest watch had to be kept on the river itself its tides and its movements at length after an enormous outlay of capital and ingenuity when even the most sceptical part of the public understood that the construction of a tunnel under the thames was not an impossibility it was found that the funds advanced by the shareholders were exhausted the parliament however granted a loan the whole of england took an interest in the execution of this great undertaking fresh machinery was invented fresh workmen were engaged the second shaft was sunk on the wapping side of the river and the english may say we carry out whatever we undertake to do with us great undertakings do not languish for want of public interest and assistance a crane standing for many years on a half-built tower as is the case with the tower of the cologne cathedral in germany no thank god such cranes have no locus standi in england maybe we are an awkward square-built people but after all we are a people and that's what not every nation can say of itself life in the thames tunnel is a very strange sort of life as we descend stray bits and snatches of music greet our ears arrived at the bottom of the shaft there is the double pathway opening before us and looking altogether dry comfortable and civilized for there are plenty of gas lights and the passages which communicate between the two roadways are tenanted by a numerous race of small shopkeepers offering views of the tunnel and other penny wares for sale these poor people never see the sun except on sundays the strangers in london are their best and indeed i may almost say they are their only customers as we proceed the music becomes more clear and distinct and here it is 
a miniature exhibition of english industrial skill it is an italian organ played by a perfect doll of a lilliputian steam engine that engine grinds the organ from morning till night it gives us various pieces without any compunction or political scruples the marseillaise german waltzes the hungarian rakowski march rule britannia yankee doodle etc does this marvellous engine grind out of the organ those london organs are the most tolerant of musical instruments that i know of they appeal to all nations and purses and what is more marvellous still they are not stopped by the police as they would be in vienna or berlin even though the cosmopolitan organ grinder might descend tens of thousands of feet below the bed of the spray or the danube in the present instance the organ and the engine are mere decoy birds you stop and are invited to look at the panorama at the expense of only one penny you see queen victoria at that interesting moment in which she vows to love honour and obey prince albert you also see a spanish convent which no panorama can be without and the emperor napoleon in the act of being beaten at waterloo the chief scene of every london panorama exactly as if the great napoleon had passed all the years of his life in being beaten at waterloo the next view shows you m kossuth on horseback on an hungarian battlefield which looks for all the world like an english park and Camorne, of which the impregnability is demonstrated by its being venice fashion immersed in water with canals for streets and gondolas for cabs of such like spectacles the tunnel has plenty but we cannot stop for them we hasten to the shaft ascend the stairs and feel quite refreshed by the free air of heaven there will be a greenwich steamer in five minutes says mr baxter encouragingly what was the expense of that affair under the water asked dr keif while we stood waiting for the boat one penny each i don't ask what we paid i mean the tunnel what did it cost oh, something like four hundred and fifty five thousand pounds the shareholders gave a hundred and eighty thousand pounds and the rest was advanced by the nation it would take another two hundred thousand pounds to make the tunnel fit for carriage traffic say six hundred and fifty thousand pounds a mere trifle as sir john would say remarked dr keif with a sarcastic smile six hundred and fifty thousand pounds make without agio six millions five hundred thousand florins in austrian money give mr struve that sum and he'll liberate the whole of germany and a large piece of france into the bargain what in the name of all that is liberal can be the use of that tunnel i should like to know isn't a good honest bridge ten times cheaper and handsomer you're a practical people you are but crotchety my dear sir crotchety that's the word most amiable of all german philosophers said mr baxter are you too among the philistines hundreds of foreigners have said exactly what you say and none of them seem to understand what practical purpose the originators of this tunnel had in view they wanted to prove to the barbarous nations of the continent that britons may walk under water without getting wet and without umbrellas and also that there are some things which are not dreamt of in the philosophy of a german doctor why that alone would be worth the money but now let me tell you that this tunnel cost very little more than one half of what waterloo bridge cost besides how can you bridge the river so low down as this why you would stop all the vessels and spoil the london harbour for you cannot raise a bridge high enough for large sailing vessels to pass under well we've tried another plan since the vessels cannot pass under the bridge we make them go over it we've tried it and we've done it there's the tunnel it is not the architect's fault if it does not pay westward the course of empire takes its way in the world generally and in london especially and the east suffers accordingly hence it is not worth while to add a carriage road to the tunnel the more's the pity but here's the steamer there's scarcely standing room on the deck 
besides the steamers there are greenwich omnibuses and there is an extra railroad running its trains every quarter of an hour from london to greenwich and yet look at the crowd which surrounds us on all sides london too has its tides and its high and low water mark its thousands and hundreds of thousands rush into the country and back again at regular periods from one twelve hours to another the majority of london merchants live in the country and yet they are able to pass their days in the city various means and modes of conveyance and these quick ready and cheap enable them to accomplish that feat as we go down the river the banks recede and the vessels lie in smaller groups in their place we see the very insignificant looking yards of the london shipbuilders which extend almost to woolwich the seat of the government dockyard woolwich is the second depot of the country portsmouth is the first the english shipbuilders are cosmopolitans like the organ grinders little do they care for their customers position religion or nation they build ships for every man who offers his money and for every country too for denmark spain austria russia and even for france we have launched many a steamer which by this time lies in some russian port in the black sea says mr baxter it's well for you if those steamers remain where they are but what if russia were to send your own ships against you you shall perish by the work of your own hands doctor you are vastly amusing some years ago i believe it was in eighteen forty i saw a ship launched at this very spot a brig and a fine vessel she was for the russian fleet the russian ambassador was on the platform and so was the consul and a great many titled and untitled persons an old friend my chum at harrow had taken me to see the fun honest fellow that a commander in her majesty's service and since dead of apoplexy we stood by and saw the vessel glide into the water and i made the very same remark you made just now of course i meant it as a joke but you ought to have seen how my poor friend the captain laughed at it he held his sides and his honest red face turned blue and purple it was a mercy that he did not then and there die of apoplexy ha <laughs> ha cried he at last do you think they can order a fleet as they would a cargo of cheese let the czar send his roubles and our fellows will build the ships i warrant you and good ships too and without any dockyard jobs no altering the poop no taking out boilers no cutting in halves eh? but what's a vessel nothing whatever sir it is of no use without the sailors he can't order them just order me to play the dancing master eh? that vessel costs a good deal of money and our fellows heaven bless them are very fond of russian money they like to build ships for russia just because we mean to hoist the blue peter against their eagle fear apprehensions eh? why sir i bless that vessel from the bottom of my heart that is to say i wish she may go to pieces on her first trip to kronstadt or that i may fall in with her with the law against her and a fair chance of some friendly conversation dear me if i should ever live to see that fine russian fleet burnt off athens for a fine fleet it is sir and we'll burn it too and build the czar another for his money of course and a fine one and if that new fleet shows its nose in british waters why damn me that's all what fun to see these vessels launched for the russian service that's what they all think except the ambassador and the consul and that's the reason they cheer away with such hearty good will just look at that old tar on the other side he thinks of boarding her one of these fine days eh we'll turn in the waist eh oh well turned english ethics said dr keif with a deep sigh as he stood with folded hands looking up to heaven do you think mr baxter that germany too will have the good fortune to get vessels from the english dockyards in consideration of certain money well and truly paid and on the strength of similar cosmopolitan principles oh, why not though for the present we do all we can to prevent the building altogether that's the strong side of our diplomacy 
but take my word for it if you order the vessels and pay for them you shall have them and they shall be burnt down to the water's edge on the very first occasion you have a good stock of sailors on your baltic and eastern coasts and with respect to you we had better keep a sharp lookout thanks for the compliment replied the doctor i'll report your words to the first lord of our admiralty whenever that high functionary as yet unborn shall have come to years of discretion dr keif said these words with a bitter smile and stooping down to pick up a piece of biscuit which a small boy had dropped he overturned a still smaller girl who was standing by his side and with the cigar which he held in his hand he burnt the hand of a lady near him to the intense disgust of that respectable female who vented her feelings in a piercing scream the doctor frightened and confused made a leap backwards and alighted with wonderful precision on mr baxter's left foot the very foot which it is suspected our aged friend has felt some slight twinges of gout and to add to the learned philosopher's discomfiture a gust of wind blew his hat off his head and lodged it safely on a large newspaper which a fat old gentleman was reading the biscuit meanwhile had been eaten by an italian greyhound the small boy screamed and the small girl screamed and the fat old gentleman expressed his indignation some people are so awkward the lady rubbed her hand and even mr baxter's temper was slightly ruffled you see gentlemen said that amiable man the consequences of a mere mention of the german fleet on board an english vessel that inevitable personage who haunts all steamers the man with the little book who takes the passage money from those who are without tickets has at length found us out his appearance puts a stop to all acrimonious remarks here is greenwich and here is the facade and cupola of the sailors hospital with a semicircle of wooded hills in the background we have left the fog behind us in london and the evening sun looks out from the clouds as if he would say i am alive and in health for all that the londoners believe me to be ailing or in articulo mortis our boat rushes past the dreadnought we touch the shore the engines are stopped we are at our journey's end we stand on the beautiful terrace in front of the hospital the house in which queen elizabeth loved to dwell and here at this very spot her courtiers used to take their walks their gold-embroidered cloaks are gone and in their stead you see long blue brass-buttoned coats on the mutilated or decrepit bodies of old sailors a blue coat a white neckcloth shoes white stockings and a large three-cornered hat with gold lace that is the uniform of the invalids who pass the evening of their lives in this delightful place greenwich hospital presents the most beautiful architectural group of modern england take the most gifted architect of the world bandage his eyes put him on the terrace on which we stand and then show him this splendid building and he will at once tell you that this is and must be a royal palace how could he ever suspect that all this splendour of columns and cupolas is destined to shelter a couple of thousands of poor decrepit sailors but that it does shelter them is honourable to the founders and to the english nation go to germany inquire in the largest and most powerful states what they have done for their disabled soldiers there is an hotel of invalides at vienna for austria too has her mutilated living monuments of the napoleonic wars and the wars against hungary but compare that austrian invalide house with this asylum for british sailors a low unwholesome sight courtyards alike inaccessible to sunlight and air cloistered corridors bare uncomfortable chambers vast chilly saloons and a population of old soldiers stented even in the common necessaries of life it is a great piece of good luck for such a pensioner to obtain the post of watchman in one of the emperor's parks where for a few more florins per annum he has the privilege of waging war against dogs and ragged little boys go to prussia that military kingdom look about in that splendid city of berlin 
and do not for mercy's sake refuse your penny to those old men in shabby uniforms with medals dangling from their buttonholes who hold out their caps with one hand while they grind old rickety organs with the other if indeed they have two hands left these are the veterans who made prussia great and powerful in return for their services they have the inestimable privilege of begging pence from travelling englishmen in those days of corsican tribulations england too sent her forces to the battlefields of the continent england fought not only with subsidies but with her armies and her fleets thus much is clearly shown not only by history not only by the monuments which have been erected in honour of the duke of wellington but still more by the two great hospitals of greenwich and chelsea those two hospitals devoted to the disabled heroes of the navy and army give incontestable proof of the grateful kindliness of feeling with which the english nation honours its old soldiers england treats her cripples as a mother would her sick and ailing children the architectural splendours of greenwich hospital are by no means destined to hide poverty and misery within the gates are open you may walk through the refectories the kitchens the sitting and sleeping rooms wait until the old gentlemen sit down to their dinner eat a slice of their meat smoke a pipe of their tobacco take a pinch from one of their snuff-boxes admire the irreproachable whiteness of their cravats take a seat at their side on the green benches which stand on the smooth lawn from whence they view the thames its sails masts and flags the cherished scenes of their early career talk to them they like to fight their battles over again in conversation and will tell you whether they have to complain of the ingratitude of their country and which is best no matter how disgusted our german enthusiasts would be at the mere idea to be paid so and so much per limb or to starve on the general dietary of an austrian invaliden house or rot in the streets of berlin on an annual allowance which would hardly suffice to find a greenwich pensioner in tobacco and snuff all around the hospital and indeed in its immediate vicinity there are strange scenes of life such as are not infrequently met with in england a few yards lower down the stream stands in aristocratic exclusiveness the trafalgar hotel which i beg to recommend to every one who wishes to pay for a dinner twice the amount which would suffice to feed an irish family for a whole week if you like to take your dinner with people who hail the sensation of hunger as the harbinger of enjoyment you had better enter this hotel and remain there for a few hours the wines of the trafalgar like the lethe of old wash away the cares of the past for it is here that according to an ancient custom her gracious majesty's ministers meet after the parliamentary session they drink sherry and champagne and thank their stars that there are no more awkward questions to answer as a contrast to this luxuriant hotel we see on the other side of the hospital partly along the shore partly near the park and in the interior of sundry lanes and alleys a vast number of pot-houses tea-gardens and places of a worse description where every vice finds a ready welcome boys and girls standing at the doors invite the passing stranger good accommodation very good accommodation sir we know what that means and go our way but that young fellow in the sailor's jacket with the girl hanging on his arm they are caught they enter the house forward to the green leafy hilly park on the large grass plots whole families are stretched out in picturesque groups from the grandfather down to the grandsons and granddaughters and along with them there are friends country cousins maid-servants and lap-dogs with a proud and supercilious air for they know sagacious little animals that their owners are continually paying dog-tax for them this is monday the englishman's sunday there they are chatting laughing and even getting up and dancing eating their cold dinners with a good appetite and a thorough enjoyment of sunshine air and river breeze and they are all cheerful decent and happy as simple-minded men and women are wont to be on a holiday and on the forest green and the deer half tame come out of the thicket and ask for their share of the feast 
and we go our way up the hill lest we disturb the children and the deer from the top of the hill we looked down upon one of the most charming landscapes that can be imagined in the vicinity of a large capital that ocean of houses in the distance shifting and partly hidden in the mist the docks with their forests of masts the thames itself winding its way to the sea green hilly country on our side with the white steam of a distant train curling up from the deep cuttings and at our feet greenwich with its columns cupolas and neat villas peeping out from among shrubberies and orchards we share the hill on which we stand with the famous greenwich observatory probably the building has a better appearance than it had at the time when flamstead with generous self-denial established the first sextant on this spot but even in our days the exterior of the building is by no means imposing here then we stand on the first meridian of england the country's pride has up to the present time retained it here while the french established their meridian at paris but the communistic spirit of science undermines the existence of either and the greenwich meridian will not i am sure resist the spirit of the age it will sooner or later resign its pretensions in favour of the chosen of all nations the road from the observatory to the back gate of the park leads through an avenue of old chestnut trees they are in a flourishing condition and the chestnuts are quite as good as those of italy and southern france among these trees stands the official residence of the ranger of greenwich park a nobleman or gentleman whose duty it is in consideration of six or eight hundred pounds per annum to pass a few summer months in this delightful retreat and to supply her majesty's table with a haunch of venison once every twelve month the post is a sinecure one of those places which every one inveighs against and which every one would be glad to possess we have crossed the park and are at blackheath a sunny place which derives its gloomy name from the gipsies who used to be encamped upon it in the days of old lang syne neat villas covered with evergreens surround this black heath and a hundred roads and paths invite us to stroll on and on through garden land and park-like domains we resist the temptation the sun has gone down we return to the thames and take a steamer to blackwell on the opposite coast the breeze the park and the walk have made us hungry and thus it happens that very much against our will we find ourselves seated at a table with three solemn-looking gentlemen in black dress coats and white cravats are busily loading with a number of large and small dishes each of these dishes thus english custom willed it is surmounted by a cover of polished silver or at least a metallic composition which looks like silver and each contains some sort of fish love grows hotel has these many years past been famous for its fish dinners and the fame is well deserved nowhere except perhaps at antwerp does a gourmand find so vast a field for the study of this particular department of his favourite science but more charming than the most delicious eels mackerel salmon soles and whitebait is the view from the dining-room it is night we take the cars as they say in america and rattle on over the houses canals and streets to the city it took us just fifteen minutes to go all the distance End of chapter one part two chapter two of saunterings in and about london by max slesinger this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two the theory of locomotion when doctors disagree etc climatic varieties of london locomotion its modes and difficulties rules and regulations for pedestrians carriages cab law and lawlessness cabmen and watermen notes of an omnibus passenger drivers and conductors stage coaches metropolitan railways what a dreadful fog there is to-day nothing of the kind madam cloudy and wet perhaps and a little misty but a fog no madam that haze is not a fog 
fogs are yellow and black in a fog the carriages and foot passengers run against one another it hurts your eyes and takes away your breath it keeps one indoors but this is not what a londoner would call a fog is it not indeed doctor well then i must prepare myself for a worse condition than i am now in low and out of health as i feel of course says the doctor feeling the fair stranger's pulse have i not told your husband again and again are you again harping at the old theme i am and i mean to persist until you follow my advice madam replied the doctor with great unction you ought not to live in this part of the town the air kills you you must go and live in brompton that's what every london physician will tell you this part of the town is too bleak and cold for you we leave the old doctor de descant on the vast climatic difference between regent's park and brompton while we inform the geographers among our german readers of the whereabouts of the latter place brompton then was at one time a small village in the southwest between hyde park and the thames it has however these many years lost its separate existence and been swallowed up by the metropolis just as many larger places around london have been swallowed up before and since and brompton at the present time is as much a part of london as holborn and islington the idea of the immense area which is covered by this gigantic town may be approximately realized from the fact that many learned physicians discuss the climatic differences of various parts of the town exactly as if they were comparing the climates of italy and germany expressions such as i live in the north or i have taken a house in the west are commonplace and appropriate this idea of colossal extension ought to be well considered and fully realized by those who wish to understand london life in all its various phases but in spite of all divisions into north south and east and west the london of our days is nevertheless one single compact town he who inhabits it must be prepared to go many miles to see a friend or to follow up his business whatever that business may be a londoner loses one half of his life in locomotion he would lose more if his ordinary and extraordinary town travels were not regulated according to some tried and practical theory the necessity of expeditious and cheap locomotion in the streets of london has called forth a variety of methods of travelling the cheapest simplest oldest and most natural of them is walking in the narrow and crowded streets of the city where conveyances make but little progress this method is certainly the safest and withal the most expeditious strangers in london are not fond of walking they are bewildered by the crowd and frightened at the crossings they complain of the brutal conduct of the english who elbow their way along the pavement without considering that people who hurry on on some important business or other cannot possibly stop to discuss each kick or push they give or receive a londoner jostles you in the street without ever dreaming of asking your pardon he will run against you and make you revolve on your own axis without so much as looking round to see how you feel after the shock he will put his foot upon a lady's foot or dress exactly as if such foot or dress were integral parts of the pavement which ought to be trodden upon but if he runs you down if he breaks your ribs or knocks out your front teeth he will show some slight compunction and as he hurries off the londoner has actually been known to turn back and beg your pardon of course all this is very unpleasant to the stranger and the more delicate among the english themselves do not like it none but men of business care to walk through the city at business hours but if either from choice or necessity you find your way into those crowded quarters you had better walk with your eyes wide open don't stop on the pavement move on as fast as you can and do as the others do that is to say struggle on as best you may and push forward without any false modesty the passengers in london streets are hardened they give and receive kicks and pushes with equal equanimity much less excusable is the kicking and pushing of the english public at their theatres museums railway stations and other places of public resort 
nothing but an introduction to every individual man and woman in the three kingdoms will save you from being on such occasions pushed back by them you have not been introduced to them you are a stranger to them and there is no reason why they should consult your convenience the fact is the english are bears in all places except in their own houses and only those who make their acquaintance in their dens know how amiable kind and mannerly they really are you cannot lounge about in the streets of london those who would walk should go at once to the parks or parade some square the loungers you see in regent street and its purlieu are foreigners chiefly french as their hirsute appearance clearly shows an englishman likes that sort of thing on the boulevards of paris or st mark's place at venice but in his own country he wants the scenery the climate the excitement and the opportunities a thousand various interests draw him back to his family circle though accustomed to the continent and its manners and customs the moment the traveller returns to england he takes to english customs and english prejudices and in the fullness of his british pride he is very careful lest his appearance and conduct show traces of his residence in foreign countries the germans do exactly the contrary he who would economize his time and strength had better keep his carriage if he can afford it there are plenty on sale and of the best of their kind but the expense of keeping a carriage and horses is by far greater than in any other capital the wages of the coachman and the hire of the stabling etc are so enormous and besides there is the chancellor of the exchequer holding out his hat for all the world like one of those greedy irish beggars asking you to pay duty for the carriage and the horses for the coachman and his livery for the servant who stands behind the carriage and that servant's livery for the powder he has on his head for the cane he holds in his hand for the high box seat the hammer cloth and the armorial bearings which are embroidered on it provided always it is your pleasure to indulge in these aristocratic luxuries those are the taxes on luxuries of which there are plenty in this country and so there ought to be no duty is paid for tradesmen's carts and vans if the owner's name and address is plainly written on them and the tradesmen who turn everything to advantage write their names very plainly on their carts and vans and send them out into the streets to advertise their firms these tradesmen's carts are the most numerous and conspicuous among the countless vehicles which pass to and fro in london streets there is scarcely a shop which has not its cart or van of course the grocers have vans for they send their goods to any distance within ten miles and so do the bakers butchers fishmongers and greengrocers they can't help it for if they were to confine their operations to their immediate neighbourhood they would soon be crushed by competition a london tradesman who deals in articles of daily consumption had better not try to walk the very lad who sells odds and ends of meat for the convenience of metropolitan cats and dogs has a meat cart and a clever pony and on the cart there is a splendid legend in gold letters dogs and cats meet the retailer of such wretched stuff would starve in a smaller town in london he has to keep his horse and cart and makes a capital living as they tell me and on sunday when dogs and cats have to live on the stores that were taken in on saturday the lad takes his fancy gal for a drive into the country with the legend of dog and cat's meat flaming brightly behind the next great branch of the metropolitan conveyance system is that of the carriages which ply for hire with or without a number the latter in all their leading features are similar to the carriages of all the continental capitals they are taken by the hour by the day week month or year chief among the former are the london cabs live and learn ought to be the motto of the student of london cabology no mortal could ever boast of having mastered the subject there is no want of police regulations and of patriots to enforce them but still the cabmen form a class of british subjects who for all they are labelled booked and registered move within a sphere of their own beyond the pale of the law 
the commissioners of police have drawn up most elaborate regulations concerning cabs they have clearly defined what a cab ought to be but the london cabs are exactly what they ought not to be the faults of these four-wheeled instruments of torture can never sufficiently be complained of not only do they shorten the honest old english mile but they bear a strong family likeness to the berlin droschkes if the horse is wanted it is sure to be eating if the cabby is wanted he is equally sure to be drinking if you would put the window down you cannot move it if it is down and you would put it up you find that the glass is broken the straw-covered bottom of the cab has many crevices which let in wind and dust the seats feel as if they were stuffed with broken stones the check-string is always broken the door won't shut or if shut it won't open in short we make no mention of the horse to discover the faults of a london cab is easy to point out its good qualities is what i for one have never been able to achieve whenever a stranger is bold enough to hail a cab not one but half a dozen come at once obedient to his call and the eagerness the drivers display is truly touching they secure their whips descend from their high places and surround the stranger with many a wink and many a chuckle to learn what he wants and uh, to make game of him supposing the stranger speaks the english language fluently enough to make himself understood of course he will name the place to which he wishes to go and ask what they will take him for he may rely on it that of any conclave of cabmen each one will demand at least double the amount of his legal fare he demurs to the proposal whereupon the six cabmen mount their boxes forthwith return to their stand in the middle of the road and indulge in jocular comments on foreigners and frenchmen in general blessed is that foreigner if his studies of the english language have been confined to byron thackeray and macaulay for in that case he remains in happy ignorance of all the good things that are said at his expense the retreat however was merely a feint a few skirmishers advance again and waylay the stranger again and again do they inquire what he will give they turn up the whites of their eyes shrug their shoulders make offers confidently and decline propositions scornfully and go on haggling and demonstrating until one of them comes to terms and drives off with the victim but is there no legal scale affairs of course there is but with the enormous extent of london it was impossible to establish a general fare for each course according to the cab regulations of the german french and italian towns a certain sum say one shilling for each drive would have wronged either the passenger or the driver to get rid of the dilemma the fare was fixed at eight pence per mile but who can tell how many miles he has gone in a cab a stranger of course cannot be expected to possess an intimate knowledge of places and distances an old londoner only may venture to engage in a topographic and geometrical disputation with a cabman for gentlemen of this class are not generally flattering in their expressions or conciliating in their arguments and the cheapest way of terminating the dispute is to pay and have done with the man as a matter of principle the cabman is never satisfied with his legal fare even those who know the town and all its ways must at times appeal to the intervention of a policeman or give their address to the driver not indeed for the purpose of fighting a duel with him but that he may if he choose apply to the magistrate for protection but it is a remarkable fact that the cabmen of london are by no means eager to adopt the latter expedient the handsome cabs which of late years have been exported to paris and vienna are generally in a better condition than the four-wheeled vehicles but their drivers are to the full as exacting and impertinent as their humbler brethren of the whip to do them justice if they are exorbitant in their demands they at least are satisfactory in their performance they go at a dashing pace whenever they have an open space before them and they are most skilful in winding and edging their light vehicles through the most formidable knots of wagons and carriages the handsome man is more genteel and gifted than the vulgar race of cabmen he is altogether smarter in more than one sense and more dashing daring and reckless 
when cabby returns to his stand he drops the reins chats with his comrades recounts his adventures and fights his battles o'er again or he lights his pipe and disappears for a while in the mysterious recesses of a pot-house his horse and carriage are meanwhile left to the care of an unaccountable being who on such occasions pops out from some hiding-place wall niche or cellar this creature appears generally in the shape of a dirty rickety toothless grey-haired man he is a servus servorum the slave of the cabman commonly described as a waterman for it was he who originally supplied the water for the washing of the vehicles in the course of time however his functions have extended and the waterman is now all in all to the cab stand he cleans the cabs minds the horses attends to the orders of passengers opens and shuts the doors and fetches and carries to the cab stand generally tobacco pipes beer gin billy doux and other articles of common consumption and luxury in consideration for such services he is entitled to the gratuity of one penny on account of each fare and he manages to get another penny from the fare as a reward for the alacrity and politeness with which he opens the door but further particulars of this mysterious old man we are unable to give no one knows where he lives no one not even mr mayhew has as yet been able to ascertain where and at what hours he takes his meals at two o'clock in the morning he may be seen busy with his pails and at five or six o'clock you may still observe him at his post leaning against the area railings of some familiar public-house but the early career of the man his deeds and misdeeds joys and sufferings before he settled down as waterman to a cab-stand these matters are a secret of the guild and one which is most rigorously preserved poor toothless old man the penny we give thee will surely find its way to the gin-shop but can we be obdurate enough to refuse giving it since a couple of those coins will procure for thee an hour's oblivion we turn to the omnibuses the principal and most popular means of locomotion in london and here we beg to inform our german friends that those classes of english society whose members are never on any account seen at the italian opera and who consume beer in preference to wine and brandy in preference to beer affect a sort of pity not unmixed with contempt for those who go the full length of saying omnibus the english generally affect abbreviations and the word bus is rapidly working its way into general acceptation exactly as in the case of the word cab which is after all but an abbreviation of cabriolet among the middle classes of london the omnibus stands immediately after air tea and flannel in the list of the necessaries of life a londoner generally manages to get on without the sun water he drinks only in case of serious illness and even then it is qualified with the ghost of a drop of spirits certain other articles of common use and consumption on the continent such as passports vintage feasts expulsion by means of the police cafes cheap social amusements are entirely unknown to the citizens of london but the omnibus is a necessity the londoner cannot get on without it and the stranger too unless he be very rich has a legitimate interest in the omnibus whose value he is soon taught to appreciate the outward appearance of the london omnibus as compared to similar vehicles on the continent is very prepossessing whether it be painted red as the saints days in the almanac or blue as a bavarian soldier or green as the trees in summer it is always neat and clean the horses are strong and elegant the driver is an adept in his art the conductor is active quick as thought and untiring as a perpetuum mobili but all this cannot i know convey an idea of life in an omnibus we had better hail one and enter it and as our road lies to the west we look out for a bayswater we are at the white chapel toll-gate a good distance to the east of the bank from this point a great many omnibuses run to the west and among the number is the particular class of bayswater omnibuses one of which we have entered 
it is almost empty the only passengers being two women who have secured the worst seats in the furthermost corners probably because they are afraid of the draught from the door the omnibus is standing idly at the door of a public-house its usual starting place the driver and conductor have been bawling and jumping about especially the latter and they are now intent upon refreshing themselves the horses look a little the worse for the many journeys they have made since the morning never mind this omnibus will do as well as any other and we prepare to secure places on the outside but before we ascend let us look at the ark which is to bear us through the deluge of the london streets it is an oblong square box painted green with windows at the sides and a large window in the door at the back the word bayswater is painted in large golden letters on the green side panels signifying that the vehicle will not go beyond that bourne and also furnishing a name for the whole species a great many omnibuses are in this manner named after their chief stations there are richmond's chelsea's putney's and hammersmith's others again luxuriate in names of a more fantastic description and the most conspicuous among them are the waterloos nelson's wellington's taglioni's atlases etc one set of omnibuses is named after the times others such as the crawfords are named after their owners the generic name of the omnibus shines as we have said in large golden letters on the side panels but this is not by any means the only inscription which illustrates the omnibus it is covered all over with the names of the streets it touches in its course thus has the london omnibus the appearance of a monumental vehicle one which exists for the sake of its inscriptions it astonishes and puzzles the stranger in his first week of london life he gazes at the omnibus in a helpless state of bewilderment the initiated understand the character of an omnibus at first sight but the stranger shrugs his shoulders with a sigh for among this conglomeration of inscriptions he is at a loss to find the name and place he wants but to the comfort of my countrymen be it said that the study of omnibus law is not by any means so difficult as the study of cab law practice will soon make them perfect still we would warn them not to be too confident many a german geographer with all the routes from the ohio to the Oxine engraven in his memory has taken his place in an omnibus and gone miles to the direction of stratford while he poor man fondly imagined he was going to kensington even the greatest caution cannot prevent a ludicrous mistake now and then and the stranger who would be safe had better consult a policeman or inform the conductor of the exact locality to which he desires to go in the worst case however nothing is lost but a couple of hours and pence while we have been indulging in these reflections the number of passengers has increased there is a woman with a little boy and that boy will not sit decently but insists on kneeling on the seat that he may look out of the window an old gentleman has taken his seat near the door he is a prim old man with a black coat and white cravat there is also a young girl a very neat one too with a small bundle possibly she intends calling on some friends on the other side of town she proposes to pass the night there and has taken her measures accordingly a short visit certainly is not worth the trouble of a long omnibus journey thus there are already six inside passengers for the little boy who is not a child in arms is a passenger and his fare must be paid as such the box seat too has been taken by two young men one of them smokes and the other exactly as if he had been at home reads the police reports in to-day's times stop another passenger a man with an opera hat a blue and white spotted cravat with a corresponding display of very clean shirt collar coat of dark green cloth trousers and waistcoat of no particular colour his boots are well polished his chin is cleanly shaved his whiskers are of respectable and modest dimensions there is a proud consciousness in the man's face an easy familiar carelessness in his movements as he ascends he takes his seat on the box and looks to the right and left with a strange mixture of hauteur 
and condescension as much as to say you may keep your hats on gentlemen he produces a pair of stout yellow gloves he seizes the reins and the whip by jove it's the driver of the omnibus immediately after him there emerges from the depths of the public-house another individual whose bearing is less proud he is thin shabbily dressed and his hands are without gloves it is the conductor he counts the inside passengers looks in every direction to find an additional fare and takes his position on the backboard all right the driver moves the reins the horses raise their heads and the omnibus proceeds on its journey the street is broad there is plenty of room for half a dozen vehicles and there are not many foot passengers to engage the conductor's attention he is at liberty to play some fantastic tricks to vary the monotony of his existence he jumps down from his board and up again he runs by the side of the omnibus to rest his legs for even running is a recreation compared to standing on that board he makes a descent upon the pavement lays hands on the maid of all work that is just going home from the butcher's and invites her to take a seat in the bus he spies an elderly lady waiting at the street corner he knows at once that she is waiting for an omnibus but that she cannot muster resolution to hail one he addresses and secures her another unprotected female is caught soon after then a boy and after him another woman our majestic coachman is meanwhile quite as active as his colleague he is never silent and shouts his bank bank charing cross at every individual passenger on the pavement any spare moments he may snatch from his occupation are devoted to his horses he touches them with the end of his whip and exhorts them to courage and perseverance by means of that peculiar sound which holds the middle between a hiss and a groan and which none but the drivers of london omnibuses can produce in this manner we have come near the crowded streets of the city the seat at our back is now occupied by two irish labourers smoking clay pipes and disputing in the richest of brogues which is better romanism without whisky or protestantism with the desirable addition of that favourite stimulant there is room for two more passengers inside and for three outside our progress through the city is slow there are vehicles before us behind us and on either side we are pulling up and turning aside at every step at the mansion house we stop for a second or two just to breathe the horses and take in passengers this is the heart of the city and therefore a general station for those who wish to get into or out of an omnibus these vehicles proceed at a slow pace and take up passengers but they are compelled to proceed by the policeman on duty who has strict instructions to prevent those stoppages which would invariably result from a congregation of omnibuses in this crowded locality our particular omnibus gives the policeman no trouble for it is full inside and out and this important fact having been notified to the driver the reins are drawn tight the whip is laid on the horses backs and we rush into the middle of crowded cheapside three tons that is to say sixty hundredweight is the weight of a london omnibus when full and with these sixty hundredweights at their backs the two horses will run about a dozen english miles without the use of the whip cheered only now and then by the driver's hiss and with all that they are smooth and round and in good condition they are not near so heavy as those heavy horses of norman build which go their weary pace with the paris omnibuses nor are they such wretched cat-like creatures as the majority of the horses which serve a similar purpose in germany their harness is clean on the continent it might pass for elegant although fiery when in motion they never lay aside the gentleness of temper which is peculiar to the english horses a child might guide them they obey even the slightest movement of the reins nay more an old omnibus horse understands the signals and shouts of the conductor it trots off the moment he gives that stunning blow on the roof of the omnibus which in the jargon of london conductors means go on if you please and the word stop will arrest it in the sharpest trot 
but for the training and the natural sagacity of those animals it would be impossible for so many omnibuses to proceed through the crowded city streets at the pace they do without an extensive smashing of carriages and a great sacrifice of human life resulting therefrom we communicated our impressions on this subject to the omnibus driver and were much pleased to find our opinion corroborated by the authority of that dignitary the city said he is a training school for a carriage horses and for any gent as would learn to drive as for the man who isn't thoroughly up to it i'd like to see him take the ribbons that's all especially with a long heavy bus behind and two osses as is goin like blazes in front i see many a country fella in my times as funky as can be and sweating cause why he feels hisself in a fix and an oss too as has never been in the city before gets giddy in his head and all shaky like and weak in his legs but it's all habit that's what it is with men and osses well our man and our osses are accustomed to the confusion of the turmoil which surrounds us with the exception of a few short stoppages which are unavoidable in these crowded streets we proceed almost at a giddy pace round st paul's down the steep of ludgate hill and up through fleet street and temple bar we are in the strand and here we are less crowded and proceed at a still more rapid pace with twelve inside and nine outside passengers making the respectable total of one and twenty men and women more than this number it is illegal to cram into an omnibus that vehicle is among the few places in england where you come into immediate contact with englishmen without the formality of a previous introduction parliament which has to provide not only for great britain ireland and the town of berwick upon tweed but also for a considerable portion of africa america asia and the whole of australia whose duty it is to keep a sharp eye on the germanic confederation the french empire the papal see the oriental question and a great many similar nuisances and which over and above all these important avocations has to adjourn for the easter recess and the epsom races though thus overwhelmed with business still the english parliament has found time to pass some salutary laws for the proper regulation and management of omnibuses to prevent the overcrowding of these useful vehicles and to ensure regularity politeness and honesty on the part of the drivers and conductors the laws with respect to omnibuses are few in number but they work well and suffice to secure the passengers in those vehicles against insult and imposition as however accidents will happen so it may now and then come to pass that a stranger or a genteel and ignorant female is cheated and induced to pay the sum of threepence over and above the legal fare but in these cases it will generally be found that the passenger might have prevented the imposition if he or she had condescended to inquire of some passenger as to the exact amount of the fare such questions are always readily answered and every one is eager to give the stranger the information he requires on the continent it is generally asserted that the english are haughty and shy that they will not answer if a question is put to them and that especially to foreigners they affect silence incivility and even rudeness there is no truth whatever in such assertions any one whose good or ill fortune it is to make frequent omnibus journeys will find that the notion of english rudeness like many other continental notions is but a vulgar error it is true that no fuss or ceremony is made about the stowing away of legs that an unintentional kick is not generally followed by a request for ten thousand pardons but in my opinion there is a good deal of natural politeness in this neglect of hollow conventional forms which after all may be adopted by the greatest brute in creation why should there be a begging of pardon when every one is convinced that the kick was accidental unintentional and that no offence was meant why should i express my gratitude to the hand that is held out to me in getting in the action is kind but natural and does not in my opinion call for verbose recognition 
those who discover rudeness in the absence of polite phrases cannot of course but think that the english are brutes but simple and ingenuous characters are soon at their ease in english society there were no stoppages in the strand but at northumberland house in trafalgar square we stopped for a minute or two at the mansion house to take in and let out passengers moving forward again we go up part of pall mall and the whole length of regent street to the upper circus this point is more than half way in the journey from whitechapel to bayswater and that distance about five english miles is after all only a threepenny fare within the last quarter of an hour we have changed our complement of passengers and the sky too has altered its aspect large drops of rain are falling the driver produces his oilskin cape a stout leather covering is put over his knees and over those of the box seat passengers whose upper halves are protected by an umbrella all the outside passengers too produce their umbrellas for few londoners venture to go out without that necessary protection against the variableness of the climate luckily however the shower is over before we have come to hyde park gate at the western end of oxford street the sun breaks through the clouds as we turn down that splendid street which runs parallel with the side of the park stately elegant buildings on our right kensington gardens green meadows and shady trees on our left here we leave the omnibus for we cannot resist the temptation of taking a stroll in these charming gardens we have made a journey of eight miles we have seen life on and in an omnibus in all its varieties at least as far as it is possible in a single journey and we pay for the accommodation the very moderate charge of sixpence the london omnibuses though much abused are vastly superior to similar vehicles in other continental capitals but still greater as compared to the continental post or schnellwagen is the superiority of those public vehicles which run in longer or shorter stages across the country it is a pity these stage coaches are being driven off the road by the superior speed of the railway they are going out rapidly and yet how glorious it was to ride on the top of one of them their decline destroys all the poesy of travelling amidst the leafy hedgerows on the splendid english roads which are more similar to our park roads than to our landstrassen what a wholesome social adventurous pleasure it was to sit on the outside of a stage-coach with about twelve travelling companions male and female and drawn by four splendid horses to skim as it were over the smiling garden-like country no englishman of the olden time was too rich or too aristocratic for this mode of travelling and the occasional driving of such a stage and the playing the part of coachman to the public at large was among the noble passions of the sporting aristocrats of the time since then the steam-engine has conquered the length and breadth of the country and he who would enjoy stage-coach travelling must go in quest of it to the outlying parts of england for instance to the isle of wight where the old coach may still be seen in all its glory long may it be so until in that island too it is compelled to yield to the improvements of the age we have already in another place given an account of the thames steamers but in treating of the chief methods of locomotion in london we ought not to forget the railroads they are among the peculiarities and sights of london for no other town in the world is so large that the communications between its various parts are carried on by means of rails and locomotive engines here where the majority of the termini are if not in the centre according to mr pearson's salutary project at least within the town the railways which communicate with the interior of the country and the various seaports have several stations in the interior of the town and passengers are conveyed from one town station to another there are moreover railways especially intended for london and the suburbs among these are the lines to greenwich and blackwall which communicate with that extraordinary railroad which forming an enormous semicircle 
facilitates the communication between the eastern and the whole of the northern parts of london this peripheric line is essentially a london railway it does not on any one point travel beyond the boundaries of that monster town it is laid out between garden walls and backyards between roofs and chimneys it is bridged over canals and crowded streets or laid on viaducts for many miles through the poorer quarters almost touching the houses and passing hard by the windows of the upper stories in other places according to the peculiarities of the ground the line is carried on through tunnels under the houses cellars sewers and aqueducts it is a miraculous railway and one which has been constructed at an enormous outlay of ingenuity and money but it enables the londoners to go to the northern suburbs for sixpence in a first-class carriage too and in less than twenty minutes there is no cessation of the traffic of this line the trains are moving from early morn till late at night every quarter of an hour a train is dispatched from either terminus and these trains stop at all the intermediate stations the journey being so short and time speed and cheapness the chief objects in view the railway company have paid little attention to the comfort of the passengers and here i ought to add that with the exception of greater speed which after all is the main object all the english railways are inferior to those of the continent in london and in short journeys the want of comfortable carriages and convenient waiting-rooms is not a very painful infliction but woe to the wretch whom fate condemns to go from london to edinburgh in a second-class carriage at the express speed of fifty miles per hour it is true it takes him but twelve hours to go that enormous distance but in those twelve hours he will have ample time and occasion to ponder on the vast difference of second-class accommodation in england and in germany End of chapter two part two chapter three of saunterings in and about london by max slesinger this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three the quarters of royalty and government whitehall past and present downing street paris and london english and french statesmen the difference the admirers of france english respect for the aristocracy four large streets lead from trafalgar square to the east west north and south this square village and garden ground in the days of edward the confessor is in our own days one of the central points of london life trafalgar square which drank the blood and witnessed the agonies of hugh peters scrope jones harrison and many others who were killed in expiation of the execution of charles i where many hundreds were decapitated stigmatized and mutilated to satisfy the vengeance of the stuarts and their adherents forms in eighteen fifty two the peaceable ever-moving central point where the roads from the west meet the roads from the east down there where the equestrian statue of charles i stands the street leads to whitehall westminster the houses of parliament and the thames we will walk in that direction it leads us to places that are among the grandest and most interesting of which london or any other city on the face of the earth can boast we are here as lee hunt says within the atmosphere of english royalty each step in this part of the town awakens the strangest recollections and reminds one of wolsey the gifted the proud the terrible of henry the coarse and cruel elizabeth the cunning and quarrelsome james the pedant and the clown charles the misguided and melancholic cromwell the harsh and unbending the contemptible dissolute second charles and the doubly contemptible dissolute stuart who succeeded him and whose government robbed whitehall of its glory the very air is full of reminiscences of the tudors and the stuarts of their splendour and feasting of their intrigues and vulgarities of their despotic rule and bloody punishment as we walk through the streets we cannot divest ourselves of the thought 
what a strange and quaint sight it would be if those princes and their ministers and courtiers could for an hour return to the sunny light of day what gravity and merriness madness and thoughtlessness guilt misery and ingratitude visible and invisible singly and grouped here are the monuments of the history of english royalty from the downfall of wolsey to the downfall of james the second that epoch is grand important and instructive and a fit study for the kings and nations of our own days whitehall such as it is in eighteen fifty two bears little resemblance to the whitehall of sixteen fifty two wolsey lived in york palace he was most vain fond of splendour conceit and tyranny but for all that he was the most remarkable man among the prelates of england his palace was the richest booty which his downfall procured for his master who at once settled down in it here he married anna boleyn here he died here did all the great men meet who flattered that crowned tiger until he consigned them to the hands of the executioner and impaled their heads on london bridge among them were cavendish thomas cromwell and wolsey erasmus also and hans holbein whose low degree alone saved them from sharing the fate of the king's friends and wives among those were the dukes of norfolk and suffolk the earl of surrey sir thomas wyatt the poet catherine of aragon anna boleyn jane seymour catherine howard anne of cleves and catherine parr the least unfortunate among these unfortunate women and the children that were to wear crowns edward mary and elizabeth these were they that passed in and out of york palace in the days of henry the eighth the spirits of the murdered have probably cast a gloomy shadow on those golden walls for after henry's decease his successors avoided whitehall and elizabeth was the first to establish her court there a change comes over the figures of the past cecil and burley the two bacons drake and raleigh spencer and shakespeare sidney and lee leicester and essex stand before us and after them james i and his darling steenie and charles i cromwell and the executioner charles i was very active in the improvement of whitehall inigo jones the great architect of those days was employed on it and rubens painted the ornaments of the ceiling for which he received three thousand pounds and the honour of knighthood it is mere calumny to say that cromwell in puritanic brutality destroyed the works of art which he found in whitehall on the contrary he made great exertions to save them we owe it to him that the famous cartoons by raphael may this day be seen at hampton court but of course the great protector put a stop to the dissolute and merry life which formerly ruled in the palace there was no end of praying and preaching in whitehall the barebones parliament assembled here after the dissolution of the long parliament it was here that cromwell refused the crown and here he died while a dreadful thunderstorm convulsed the heavens his friends said that nature sympathized with the great man and his enemies would have it that it was the devil going off to hell with old noll his brother richard cromwell too passed his short season of power at whitehall he was followed by monk who kept the place for charles the second but the merry olden times were gone for ever they returned not with the dissolute gloomy-faced prince although more money was wasted on the duchess of portsmouth not to mention his majesty's other ladies than ever had been spent on an english queen evelyn in his memoirs thus describes one of the closing scenes of royal dissipation i can never forget the inexpressible luxury and profaneness gaming and all dissoluteness and as it were total forgetfulness of god it being sunday evening which this day and night i was witness of the king sitting and toying with his concubines portsmouth cleveland and mazarin etc a french boy singing love songs in that glorious gallery whilst about twenty of the great courtiers and other dissolute persons were at basset round a large table a bank of at least two thousand in gold before them upon which two gentlemen who were with me made reflections with astonishment 
six days after was all in the dust evelyn memoirs volume one page five forty nine james the second lived here for a few years until the mass cost him a crown his wife fled from the palace on the sixth december sixteen eighty eight the king followed eleven days later and on the fourteenth february sixteen eighty nine the prince of orange entered the old palace it was burnt in sixteen ninety eight let not my readers quarrel with this review of the past certain localities are nothing without an occasional glance at the chronicles of olden times but with those aids to imagination the very stones become gifted with speech and proclaim the joys and sorrows the pageants and horrors which they witnessed in their days the remains of whitehall like the majority of the buildings which surround them have been converted into government offices scotland yard is the central office of the london police and on the other side of the road is the admiralty a little lower down there are two of those splendid horse guards mounted on black chargers doing duty at the offices of the ministry of war and guarding the spot where elizabeth in unchaste virginity and at an advanced and wrinkled age exacted the homage of her courtiers as queen of beauty we turn the corner of the old banquet house and enter a blind alley it is narrow and deserted this is downing street the famous where the colonial and foreign offices guide the destinies of the greater part of the globe it is a curious street small and dingy beyond the smallness and dinginess of similar streets at leipzig frankfurt or prague and desolate vacant deserted a fit laboratory for political alchemists at its further end is a small mysterious door the entrance to the foreign office in the keeping of a red-coated grenadier with i doubt not a couple of newspaper reporters hidden in his cartridge box and intent upon ascertaining the names of those that enter the office but the notes which the foreign office addresses to the foreign courts do not find their way into the english newspapers so that even the times has to copy them from the german and french journals and this is owing to the circumstance that those who enter or leave the office keep the notes in their pockets and that the reporters though clever cannot see through the morocco of portfolios and the wadding of coats they manage these matters better in france a french journalist takes up his quarters in the reticule of somebody's lady or if that cannot be conveniently done he places himself under the protection of the said lady's maid such things are of rare occurrence in england owing to the immoral prejudice of the islanders respecting the code of morals in matters of politics and matrimony what an amount of idolization have not the german authors of the last ten years wasted on paris how great their enthusiasm even now in praise of the men and women of that capital but if you ask what the excellent qualities of paris really and truly are they will discourse at great length on the charms of the boulevards the gracefulness of the women the deep blue of the paris sky and the merry careless exciting disposition of the parisians generally now all this is well and good say i to my paris friend and if i understand you you set down the parisians as the a one of humanity because their women are clever and because those clever women have very small feet because the boulevards are capital places to lounge in because mabille is merrier than vauxhall but as for the blue colour of the sky allow me dearest friend to remind you of naples spain paris and china where as they say the skies are much bluer all those circumstances make a town very agreeable but i have yet to learn that they are a fair gauge of the moral worth of its inhabitants my paris friend is silent but after a good long pause he comes forward with some very general phrases saying that there is an unutterable something which embellishes life in paris and that there you live in a world of ideas there is a good deal of truth in this general admission life in paris is charming more charming than in london and other large towns but its charms emanate in many instances from the darker sides of the parisian character 
and it is absurd to say that the people are entitled to our respect for no other reason but because we lead a life of pleasure and gaiety in their city why does london produce so much less agreeable an impression than paris not only on the passing stranger but also on those who reside here a considerable length of time we leave that question for another day we are now in downing street and however gloomy the appearance of that street may be perfidious and egotistical as the downing street policy may appear to the continentals which by the by proves its popularity here we can at least say in its favour that it has within the last twenty years been less open to corruption by means of money and female politicians than was the case on the other side of the channel in the country of la gloire of blue skies and unutterable somethings of course the reunions are less interesting there is not so wide a margin for intrigue the ambition of rotutres is kept within the limits of decency the fair sex with all its followers and appendages is confined to a narrow sphere of action and these are the reasons why just as in other matters english politics have a more sober business-like respectable and tedious appearance than politics in france it is really miraculous that in a country which is governed by a queen and one who inherited the crown at an early age there has never been made mention of court and other intrigues which influence the conduct of public affairs say it is merely by accident say that such accident is partly owing to the coldness of the blood which runs in the veins of english women or if you please think of the olden times when the women of whitehall made history in as shameless a manner as any women in the tuileries or versailles no matter it has been reserved for the nineteenth century to create a woman's court which excludes all love intrigues such a thing is impossible in france and if possible the french would not believe it nor would they put up with it a government without female interference quarrels and corruption monstrous at least to the french who rather than live under such a government would choose to live in an austere catonian republic the respect for public decency which in england is sometimes carried to a ridiculous length is nevertheless of great use for the morality of the government corruption indeed is an important item in english electioneering tactics money and drink are lavished on the voters but this corruption however shameless is confined to the lower classes honourable members who are very pathetic on the neglected education of the people think very little of treating all the inhabitants of their borough to a preposterous quantity of drink in order to ensure their re-election but the corrupters themselves are not so corruptible as the men who for the last ten years for it is not necessary to go back to an earlier date held the reins of the government in france the poor are now and then bought in england more frequently they are intimidated but in france the very french confess it all are venal from the highest to the lowest i am not an admirer of corruption in england but i like it better than i do corruption in france if rottenness there must be it had better be partial and one-sided than a general corruption of the body politic certainly the small english boroughs with their electioneering tactics and venality are disgusting but still there is some difference between the treating and bribing the peasants and small shopkeepers and that nauseous corruption of all classes of society which is so prevalent in france more particularly since the reign of louis philippe in england the polling places have from times immemorial been days of feasting drinking and fighting for the lower classes the want of political cultivation ignorance of the important questions at issue the indifference and in many instances the brutality of the lower classes make it a matter of small moment to them whether the barrel of beer from which they drink at an election is the gift of charity or the devil's retaining fee no hustings without speechifying no polling place without swilling 
the witnesses who have been examined by the election committees have generally confessed that the candidate according to the old established custom behaved like a gentleman that he treated the electors to ale and gin shook hands with them gave them money and hired brass bands for their special gratification a melancholy proof this of the neglected condition in politics and morals of the lower classes in england but far more maddening is the spectacle of corruption which france has exhibited these many years past it is not the rude and uncultivated mass which sins from ignorance of its own abandoned condition corruption there extends its sway over the educated the learned the wealthy the refined it is the despotism of a cynicism of venality such as the world never saw since the days of the roman emperors the french aristocracy the army the bourgeoisie the church and the press are all in the market eloquent morality solicits corruption with the most impudent eagerness and drives the hardest bargains in france corruption has become the fashion it is the law the essence of politics and it has almost become a necessity for the attainment of even honest purposes the poison pervades all the organs of the body politic and ever since the commencement of the first revolution the french nation has been convulsed and caused convulsions among the neighbouring nations but never at any one time no not among all her charges was there a single period however short in which personal liberty obtained that respect which it commands in england and although this fact is on record and though it cannot be contradicted yet there are german admirers of france the majority of them know nothing of france except the boulevards of paris who believe that the french are the chosen people of liberty the prophets of the nations and martyrs for their political salvation true the history of france is instructive to those who take a warning from it true the french are a chosen people indeed they have chosen to sound the trumpet of war into the ears of the nations but there never was any fortress save one which was conquered by the sounding of trumpets jericho in the land and the age of miracles singleness of purpose and honest perseverance these alone can in our days ensure the victory of great principles but the sons of france have always been strangers to those two qualities and the glory which these can give they have never coveted they care not for substantial liberty for it not only gives rights but it imposes duties also freedom is a treasure which requires the most anxious care he who neglects it loses it france obtained it three times and thrice she lost it and now the french say again ça ne durera pas but it is to be hoped that the phrase will be flung back again whenever they shall take it into their heads once more to sound the trumpet of alarm to the countries of europe england with all her political and social blemishes has at least come to this that any danger to the personal liberty of her citizens may almost be considered as an absurd impossibility while the french are as yet so ignorant of the rudiments of national liberty that they still wish for a strong government that is to say one which centralizes all the resources and absorbs all the powers of the state the various parties are all agreed on this point they differ only with respect to the person who is to preside over this strong government the legitimists vow that that person must be a bourbon the bonapartists claim the right as they have established the fact in favour of a scion of the great emperor and the republicans are eloquent in praise of an elective government but every one of these partisans reserves to himself a large prospective share of the loaves and fishes which as all the world knows are entirely at the disposal of a strong government the ambition of free self-government which characterizes the english is altogether unknown to the french hence they can die for liberty but they cannot live for it in drawing a parallel between the darker sides of english and french politics i ought not to forget mentioning one important point in despite of her free press 
the partial degradation of her masses in despite of her civic self-government england is the most aristocratic country in the world whatever modern reformers may strive for or assert they cannot deny nor can they root out the traditional veneration of the middle and lower classes for everything and everybody connected with the nobility an englishman even though he were a chartist looks at a scion of the nobility with a very different eye than at his neighbour by the grace of god citizens of london or of sheffield or manchester a lord's presence makes him respectful even though the said lord had taken too much port wine a lady's toilette has a mysterious charm for english women however bad that lady's taste may be on the continent too the aristocracy are looked up to and imitated and quoted but not by any means to such an extent as in england the continental nations want that ingenuousness of veneration that amiable candour which frankly confesses that it loves a lord add to this that the adoration of a noble pedigree does not here as on the continent move in the sphere of trifles only which after all is in a manner excusable for the wealthy aristocrat is a privileged person from his cradle he is a landed proprietor and he is not distracted with struggles for sustenance favour place and fortune of course he has leisure to cultivate his taste and form his manners and to imitate him in those respects would be a merit even in a root and branch democrat but the englishman does not stop there his desire to imitate the nobility his craving for titles make him what is commonly called a snob he has a greater respect for a cabinet of noblemen than for a cabinet of commoners he cannot imagine a charitable institution unless it be under the presidency of the duke of duman and the earl of tanitary he judges the character of a marquis very differently from that of any other man it requires a very long residence in england and an intimate acquaintance with english society generally to understand and appreciate this weakness in all its bearings but this weakness is the source of very remarkable monstrosities in the political and social life of england their most salient points and corners indeed have given way to the progressive tendencies of the age that progress though slow is manifest and its very slowness is a guarantee against the danger of a relapse End of chapter three